Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode, episode 22 or some other number depending on how you count the various kind of special recent episodes that we did on rationality rules and um, the interview with Skydive Phil. Um, today we're going to be taking a look at the long-awaited apologetics industrial complex. So the episode is broadly about the kind of um, culture behind apologetics, the sociology of it, and also the kind of financial institutions that prop it up and generate, um, you know, books and jobs for people to kind of work in this stuff full time um, on the religious side. So James is a little bit ill today, but do you want to share any kind of initial thoughts on this one as we usually do at the start? Yeah, so I'm glad that we finally got around to doing this one. I think we've been talking about it for at least a year. Um, <laughs> So it's it's good to actually get around here. And um, there's almost certainly far more that we won't get to. But um, yeah, I, I think that we've got a lot of interesting stuff to cover. Um, and so also, if it looks like that I'm recording this from the middle of a blizzard, that's because I'm, yeah, as Nathan said, I'm a bit under the weather. I don't think it's corona, um, but I will keep monitoring. But whatever it is, I'm yeah, not feeling very well. So my uh, brain's a bit slower than normal. So I, I may have to duck it earlier, but we will persevere for the time being. In terms of the content, um, I think I was, I mean, we'll sort of see as we go through. Somehow, even though I knew a lot, I knew about a lot of this stuff um, before, you know, looking up things and, and preparing the notes, I was still sort of surprised by the, the, the scale of like some of these industries. Um, and yeah, I, I think that that will be one of the themes that it's just, it's a really big industry or like connected set of industries. Um, yeah. And some of the culture surrounding it is a bit weird as well, which I think we'll also talk about. Yeah. I think those are my two general observations. Um, I, I definitely agree that the scale in terms of the money involved, uh, yeah. ju the, the, just the idea of like having institutions and buildings and things like that is kind of bizarre considering i mean i know there's there is money involved on the other side as well and maybe we'll talk about some of this at, at some point but i mean considering that you know for us we just have like you know stream yard and we we kind of hang out and criticize and that's sort of the other side of the debate as far as i'm concerned even though you know there's a few other people who who are able to make a living out of it who have institutions and things um it's it's a little bit crazy to me that it that just that it's like that you know like how how did it get like that and then as i look at the historical story um that's sort of interesting as well because even though it doesn't obviously christianity could still be true and all this stuff could uh, all, all the kind of historical events that have led to it being the way that it is um be the way that they are they're all very human you know like the, in terms of the kind of business motive motivations motivating people to create certain organizations or to um produce certain kinds of of books or to kind of sell a problem in a certain way to a sort of audience so they'll they'll buy things in a particular um way as well so i i found it interesting looking into some of these things too so if that's it then for the, for the intro for today's one. Um, the first thing to look at then, and I can zoom in on this if you can't quite see it. Um, Actually, it occurs to me that we haven't really explained what the episode is about. Um, okay. So maybe we should just sort of clarify that. I think, Nathan, you were the one to coin the phrase apologetics industrial complex, but I think both of us have expressed um, interest uh, well, you know, over a long period of time and talking about uh, just all the aspects there are to the apologetics industry. So this includes things like publishing, apologetics, um, ministries, um, the uh, Christian universities that have apologetics components, um, uh, Christian like homeschooling education, uh, uh, Christians in academia, and the the um, ap apologetics or philosophy of uh, religion journals. So all all of this sort of stuff, right? That sort of funds and gives impetus to to apologetics um, and um, yeah, so I think what we wanted to do is look in this episode at just like what there is to that, uh, talk a bit about it, and what in like what institutions there are, um, some of the practices, look at yeah the resources available because I think it, I mean, it's it's just sort of interesting to me, but I think it's also relevant to consider from the point of view of, um, yeah, like where are these Engaging ideas coming the from. Yeah, it, it's not like it, it it doesn't engage with. 
it, it's kind of like um you know the sense of ad hominem that craig uses um sometimes or it it's kind of like a, a ge- you know genetic fallacy or whatever to to talk about these things it's like yeah well the the premises of the kalam stand regardless but i i think it is actually relevant that this kind of context it is relevant because you know if, if the dialect is going to be framed in a particular way and then it's going to be yeah well but you haven't engaged with this book or you know like you haven't engaged with with these premises and then it's like yeah but i mean look at the amount of money and time that you guys have got to just continually keep generating those things that does kind of become a relevant consideration like um that there's only so much time or money that can be invested on one side of the debate to actually engage in it for example and it, uh, and i think understanding the motivations behind where the other side's coming from as well can kind of undermine some of the framing of the of the debate and the discussion that the the kind of spin that they'll want to they'll want to put on it um because maybe that's not the best way of actually seeking truth and they're framing it that way as a you know as a result of this kind of culture that they're coming out of or yeah yes well it's also the case that uh, at least some apologists um portray themselves or the position of christianity as sort of like the the cultural underdogs um and like whether that's true in certain contexts like hollywood or something um i think it's well as we'll sort of discuss i, I think it's demonstrably sort of not not the case with with respect to like the the apologetics industrial complex um that you know people who have an interest in uh providing an intellectual or at least a pseudo intellectual defense of uh of a certain form of christianity have uh overwhelmingly more resources and better organization than anyone who has an interest in opposing that or critiquing that. And I think that that's important to bear in mind as well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we can, we can probably get started then. I just thought we, yeah, the yeah. Extra context might help. So the, this is the first, the first, um, sort of platform is going to be this, this blog post, which is called follow the money. Um, it's actually the, the blog that it's from, has been taken down so i've had to kind of pull this from a snapshot of what it was like in on the 28th of november 2020 which i guess is the last time that it was up publicly um but so so this is a guest blog by michael alter author of the resurrection a critical inquiry a 912 page tome offering one of the most important contributions to challenging historical apologetics for the resurrection. I haven't actually read this book myself, um, but there we go. So I, I can just read bits and let me know if you want me to um, pause at any point to comment on anything as we go through. Um, the phrase follow the money or follow the money trail, uh, the latter was a catchphrase popularized by the 1976 drama documentary motion picture all the president's man, I mean, important information, is a credo that has been popularized in movies, politics, investigative reporting, and political debates. The sage advice to follow the money is also true in the arena of religion. Yes, it is about money. The objective of this article slash blog is to discuss the importance of those silver shekels as related to Christian even evangelism, and more specific, apologetics. Opponents of Christian apologists, whether they be theists, agnostics, or theists of other faiths, uh, face definite challenges. And as previously stated, the odds are often stacked against these skeptics, regardless of the theistic aisle they find themselves. So topic one, apologetic grad pro programs. Let's assume that you're a committed, committed Christian and you want to seek a graduate degree in apologetics. Where would you go to earn that degree? What type of degree would you earn? How much would it cost to, to earn an appropriate degree? What can you do with your earned degree? Uh, one partial source of information that discussed some of these issues was located at thebestschools.org. The organization states, the aim of bestschools.org is to help you gain knowledge, skills, and credentials you need to achieve personal happiness and career success. As a leading education resource, we cover online and on-campus colleges and universities that include undergraduate, graduate, doctoral, and postdoc programs. In addition, we cover K through 12. I, I always hear Americans say this, and I have no idea what it even means, and select alternative education programs. The Best Schools Org 
uh, has researched the top apologetic graduate degrees in the United States and ranked them according to the quality of faculty, level of accreditation, diversity of degrees offered, cost and overall accessibility. Um, so below, you can find the best 10 apologetic grad programs as identified by this organization. The relevant information has been placed in an easy to read table. However, interested readers are encouraged to examine the source in its entirety. So here's um, the 10 best Christian apologetic grad programs. Number one, Biola University. This is where Craig is at in California. $485 per credit hour. The 36 credit hour MA in apologetics can be achieved through a distance learning track, but even it has an on-campus requirement via two week long intensive modules. Uh, on the other hand, the nine to 10 hour distance learning certificate in apologetics can be transferred into the MA in apologetics program for up to six units of credits. Um, Southern Evangelical Seminary, $333 per credit hour. SES is a true apologetic school with all its degrees having an apologetic emphasis. All its degrees have an apologetic emphasis, including the BA, MA, MDiv, um, I don't even know, Theem, <laughs> Demon, even its PhD is apologetics intensive. So technically, it is in philosophy of religion. So for, for these sort of private Christian colleges, which we'll look at a bit more later, it's pretty common for them to say that all of their courses or studies have like an, uh, that they integrate a Christian worldview or that they'll often say, I think a phrase that they like is an evangelical uh, Christian worldview or a biblical Christian worldview into their, uh, into their coursework and program. It, it's difficult, you know, to know exactly what that means, like at a, a concrete level, presumably it manifests you know, differently in different types of courses. But I I just think that's really interesting that, that there's this sort of intensity of uh, focus on having this integration integration of um, apologetics and like theology into, uh, you know, all of these other areas that uh, norm, what regular universities also cover. Matthew's told me it's kindergarten through 12th grade. So you learn something new every day. There we go. <laughs> um Houston, Houston, we have a problem. Houston Baptist University, $500 per credit hour, 36 credit hour Master of Arts in Apologetics program, MAA. The program is available in residence or online with no residency require requirements. Um, Liberty University, 436 to 476 per credit hour. PhD can candidates at Liberty University may pursue a rare dual emphasis degree in theology and apologetics. LU also offers online class uh, and distance classes. Southeastern Baptist, uh, 190 to 257 per credit hour. 514 if non-SBC. SEBTS offers apologetics tracks in its MDiv programs. Um, so you kind of you know, get the view. Some of these seem to be a little bit cheaper than others by approximately half. Um, you know, and, and lots of these have these sort of, yeah, oh, that's what um, the um, Master of Theology is. And, uh, you know, they all have these kind of funky kind of MDiv and Master of Divinity, that one is, that you may not have seen before. Wow, look at this one, 2,650 per class, about 885 per credit hour at Westminster Theological Seminary. Um, Columbia Evangelical Seminary, $95 per credit hour. So that one, that one's a lot cheaper than <laughs> that one. Uh, a self-directed mentor and curriculum similar to European programs, as such, it has no teaching campus. So significantly, this list only identified the 10 best programs in the opinion of the bestschools.org. There are, in fact, numerous seminaries and universities that offer apologetic degree programs. Question, how many seminaries, college or universities offer degree programs in atheism or that reject the foundation of the Christian faith? None that I was able to locate. And even if a program could be found, what could one do with that earned degree? For Christians earning a graduate degree in apologetics, job possibilities do exist. A brief list could in include teaching philosophy or apologetics at the college level, the, the good old pyramid scheme, uh, serve in a campus ministry, develop an apologetics ministry and do missions work. Of course, this is not to deny the reality that many students take these, 
take these courses because they are sincere believers and desire to fulfill 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give it, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Cutting to the money trail, how many detractors would be willing to devote one year of their life and spend $95 to $500 per credit hour for a 36 credit hour MA in counter apologetics degree program, even if it did exist? And remember, we are not even talking about a multi-year PhD program. On the other hand, financial aid, scholarships, loans, underwriting by local churches, etc. are often available to seminary students. One additional point must be raised about the topic of money. Seminaries and universities are spending millions of dollars to support these graduate programs. Funds are required to support and maintain the instructional staff, administrative staff, secretaries, custodians, the library, and maintenance of the buildings. Is there anything you want to say about uh, that section? Then? Yeah, so I think that it's odd that often people think that money buys results, at least to some extent in terms of results, in pretty much every field. Like you, you, you get something for your, your money and money uh, plays a role in incentives and so forth. Um, but people are often pretty reticent to, um, it seems to me, and uh, even from... Well, yeah, it seems to me that certain people are reticent to admit this in the case of like philosophy or apologetics or counter apologetics. Um, and I think the point is here that when we think about uh, things like um, the arguments for the existence of God, so, you know, Cameron's video of 100 and however many it was in the end, 150 something arguments for the existence of God, like the, the reason there are so many is because that there's this huge industrial complex that exists. Uh, part one of its major purposes is just to produce more arguments and to popularize those arguments for the existence of God. Right? Like, so these institutions that we've just mentioned are one, well, I'd say a major subset of those, but not, not the only ones. Um, so th there's an industry of making these arguments and, and of propagating them and then of, you know, uh, training up the new generation of, uh, of PhDs who will publish in these journals that the Christians, uh, the evangelicals, have set up for themselves. Like it's a whole, it's a whole ecosystem, and I think that that's one of the purposes that I want to sort of um, highlight here. Um, and the thing is, as was sort of commented on, that there just really isn't anything comparable for, um, well, in the West, really for any other worldview. Um, uh, that the, well, we, we're, we're mostly focusing here on. Um, uh, Protestant, uh, like evangelical Protestantism, uh, obviously Catholicism has its own very large complex as well, which um, I think we're going to say less about. But in terms of like atheism or naturalism, like th these sort of things don't don't really exist. Um, and I don't think it's true to say that mainstream universities fill that role um, because like they don't teach counter apologetics courses or like naturalism worldview courses for like for, for the most part or, or anything of that sort. Um, and the other thing I was going to say sort of related to that is that Craig has said before, I don't quite remember the exact context of this, but he was sort of saying like, well, it's not, it's not my job to like try to try to develop the, the best case for um, naturalism for, I don't remember if it was like ethics or the origin of the, like the creation or it was like one of those things. Right. Um, he was saying, well, well, that's like for, for naturalists or for atheists to, to develop that, which I think is a, a bit of a cop out. Right. But the, irrespective of that, the point is that, when you have two sides to a debate and one side has dramatically big greater resources than the other, that should be relevant to your assessment of like the epistemic, like of the, uh, of the content that's produced by those sides. It's like, if you have a court case in an adversarial system and one side has uh, a top notch legal team uh, that costs tens of millions of dollars and the other guy has like uh, one dude that's been appointed to him by Soul the state, Goodman. like, <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's reasonable to think, well, that this is maybe not an, an entirely fair contest, right? That's obviously not the only factor and it doesn't override like the evidence that's brought to bear, but like it's relevant. And I just don't see this really discussed very much. It's like somehow the fact of this enormous um, ecosystem that exists, which is often kind of like, uh, like self-perpetuating and, and um, self, self-fulfilling as we'll sort of see, like, uh, they have their own colleges and their own journals and their own publishing and so forth. But the, the, the fact that this exists precisely to pump out arguments. And then at the same time, you have Christians like like Cameron will sort of say these things like, oh, the more I read about this, the more I'm amazed about how many good arguments there are for the existence of God. It's like, well, well, yeah, there's a massive industry that's devoted to just producing these things and popularizing them. Like, surely that that should that should factor into how we how we think about these things. And it's just I, I just don't understand why people don't think that this is like at all relevant. Anyway, that, that's sort of what I wanted to yeah. highlight there. And I think sort of keep that as we go through. 
And I, I think something that will come up repeatedly as well that um, is worth bearing in mind as we talk about this is just considering the kind of um, ethos or the values that kind of underpin the 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 structure of these kind of universities or so so you know there's kind of like we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more but statements of faith and and kind of forms that students are required to fill in well, as they apply we'll get to, a lot to those of yeah. <laughs> so so you know like if you want to apply to some of these programs you have to for example date like when your conversion experience was right at biola and, and things like that and we'll, we'll look at we'll look at some of these things in a bit more depth um but then also just think about if, if you're creating an educational program or if, if you're kind of, if you're supposed to be inquiring into, you know, what's true about a, a certain state of affairs, there's a certain kind of set of, of values that you want to set up around that educational system. Whereas I, I think a lot of those values are kind of missing from some of these educational programs, which are explicitly set up to kind of like be combative to persuade the very you know the very ideologically driven rather than kind of inquiry driven and i mean that that's going to come out as we as we look more into these but i just think it, it's a bad thing like imagine imagine doing um i don't know like a a biology degree or something and just just being given such an ideological bent on the various things that you were taught you know like just just being taught all these arguments to defend and entrench you in this position, you know, don't do research programs that are potentially going to innovate or um, dislodge certain ideas that have kind of been around because you you know you've got to kind of preserve the. It, it's just not the right attitude, I think, for an educational institution to have. And then I, just, you know, I know of other universities. Uh, I mean, they're, they're pr I presumably are a small number of other religious institutions in, in Western countries, but. Um... I just don't know of other institutions, uh, sorry, um, like higher education institutions that are devoted to, like explicitly devoted to defending a like a particular ideology. Um, well, the evolutionary, uh, <laughs> the cabal yeah, I mean, of evolutionary. So, yeah, so so they'd, they'd like to make that, well, at least some of the young earthers like to make that comparison. I, I think that there's complete bunk. And I think that they demonstrate that when, uh, I say they, some of them appeal in their own debates to many academics in mainstream uh, evolutionary biology criticizing conventional evolutionary theory not saying not like denying common descent all yeah. the sorts of things that they would want but criticizing it in many respects right and there's a very lively debate about that so i think it's extremely and plus even things that are like even young earth creation stuff like does get published it's like in crappy journals but it's not like it's it's suppressed it's just i mean the point is that it's i i just don't i don't see the comparison and again i i don't yeah. want to front load too much of this because I, I wanted to sort of come out over the course of the discussion but yeah this is a yeah, sort I of think, I think a lot of yeah. scientists are, are motivated by the idea of sort of disrupting or dislodging kind yes, of what yes, has exactly. been consensus or common you know like putting their own stamp on the on on the history of thought by you know figuring out or innovating in their own way you know so I mean, science um, and academia has its own biases, but I, I just don't buy that it's the same level of like it's an institution explicitly established to defend a specific ideology, um, especially when you start talking about like statements of faith and all of these other things, which we'll, we'll get into. I, I, I'm not seeing the comparison there. So topic two, then uh, undergraduate apologetic programs and class offerings. And I, I, so, so something as well that I've not found and I don't know if there's any data for is actually how successful these apologetic programs are in sort of preserving the faith of those who take them. So I, d I don't know actually if these do more harm than good in the sense that, you know, a lot of people potentially deconvert after taking these sorts of classes because, I mean, it's it's kind of a common trope in, in deconversion that people kind of go to seminary of some sort, study these things, and then it raises doubts for them and they leave. But I don't have any data to say whether, you know, like, whether that I'm just seeing a lot of that because of the circles that I'm in or whether that's actually representative of people who participate in these programs. Um, but it does seem a bit sorry to me, at, at least for, from having engaged with people who have taken these sorts of degrees and that they don't have that much expertise, say, over someone who's just kind of read some of these apologetic books in their free time. It, it seems to me a tragedy that someone would kind of waste an undergraduate degree doing something like this. But anyway... Topic two is undergraduate apologetic programs and class offerings. In contrast to a graduate program, hundreds of seminaries, Bible colleges, and universities offer a profuse number of apologetic programs and class offerings. 
An extensive list of several hundred evangelical seminaries and theological colleges can be seen on Wikipedia. Um, not only are these classes made available in many institutions, they are also required for completion of a degree. Here too, these institutions are spending millions of dollars to support and maintain the institutional staff, admin staff, secretaries, custodians, the library, and maintenance of the buildings. How many seminaries, college, or universities offer apologetics are offer apologetic programs or class offerings that investigate the foundation of Christian faith from a different perspective, let's say a neutral one. I am aware of at least two rabbis who teach classes that delve into this topic. Presumably others exist. Uh, Rabbi Michael J. Cook, PhD, serves as professor of intertestamental and early Christian literatures and holds the Sol and Arlene Bronstein Chair in Judeo-Christian Studies at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati. Uh, current and future courses include New Testament and the Jews, critical issues today arising from Gospels and Paul's epistles, Jewish and Christian perspectives on the historical Jesus in ancient medieval and modern history, citation of Jewish scripture in Christian apologetics and missionizing. Did you want to say something, James? Hmm? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just... I, uh, I'm just because I can't yeah. see you, so I was going off of noises. Um, there is also Rabbi Amy Jill Levine at Vanderbilt University. She is the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Professor of New Testament Studies at Vanderbilt University Divinity School, Department of Religious Studies and Graduate Department of Religion. She teaches the following course, the New Testament in its Jewish context. As stated above, Possibly several schools of higher education may offer uh, may offer classes that investigate the foundation of Christian faith from a different perspective. It would be interesting to know what institutions actually offer such classes. Okay, so topic three, Department of Apologetics. How many seminaries, college or universities have a dedicated department of apologetics? To be specific, how many institutions of higher learning have a department with the word apologetics in its title? Perhaps in the hundreds, a few institutions identified by uh, cursory research on the internet include Biola University, Birmingham Theological Seminary, Houston Baptist University, Liberty University, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southwestern Baptist Theological Se Seminary, Trinity Graduate School, Kerala, India, and Trinity International. In many institutions, a department of apologetics, although not specifically named, is embedded in the department of theology, philosophy, and or systematic theology. Something I want to know about this actually while we're on it, because I can't remember if I did include this somewhere, is um, also prestigious universities and the kind of, you know, the, there's this kind of insecurity in a lot of these apologetics programs where it's like, to procure legitimacy as an apologist through kind of collecting degrees and that and this culture leads to a lot of people pretending to have degrees that they actually don't as well as we'll talk about later um with a lot of these like hero figure apologists that get created and then they feel compelled to lie about their education but um something in the uk for example is that obviously oxford and cambridge being like the um the sort of most prestigious uk universities as it were uh, so some of these apologetic programs try to kind of bootstrap themselves off of Oxford. So you've got um, you've got like the, there's this apologetic school that I think I don't know if it is anymore as the upshot of the scandal about Ravi Zacharias, but was funded by Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, where they do like a, you know, a year's program in apologetics. And they're sort of loosely affiliated with Oxford University um so then people who do this and it isn't like an ox it isn't an oxford university degree but it's somehow in it's in oxford and it's affiliated so people do that and then they're like you know like i got i got this oxford degree in uh you know in like religion and apologetics or something and then it sounds like it has the prestige and that there's this kind of you know and it's like oh you know c.s lewis was at oxford and all the all these great religious thinkers there's this kind of aura about it you know like ticking all the boxes for people in terms of branding and and prestige to do with these things i think there's i think there's a similar sort of thing that happens in america as well in terms of these degrees trying to kind of um get the kudos off the back of of these kind of prestigious institutions that they can affiliate with somehow as well um, but you know that like it's not an official university program but if, if they can get the name in of the of the town where the famous university is then they've kind of um succeeded there okay um 
So what about the opposition? A search on the internet found an interesting article published by the New York Times. It was penned by Laurie Goodstein in 2016. University of Miami establishes chair for study of atheism. In late April, the University of Miami received a donation of 2.2 million from Louis J. Apignani, a wealthy atheist, to endow what it says is the nation's first academic chair for the study of atheism, humanism, and secular ethics. However, the title may be misleading. In the opinion of Hemant Mehta, uh, the final name may be a mouthful, but the shorter version of it is that students at the University of Miami will be able to study atheism just as they can study Islam and Judaism and Catholicism everywhere else. Another institution discussed in the Times article pointed out that about five years ago, Pitzer College, a liberal art school in Southern California with about a thousand students, became the first to begin a program and, ma and major in secular studies. Nonetheless, a review of the course offerings in the catalogue did not indicate that any of the course offerings would, in effect, challenge Christian theology. Anything you want to say about that, James? Uh, yeah, I think we can leave it till later because I've got more to say on the private Christian colleges. Okay. We can just move through this. Uh, apologetic organizations. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so there's a bit more on the page. Another area where Christian organizations spend millions of dollars is apologetic organizations. The Evangelical Council for Financial, Financial Accountability is an organization that enhances trust in Christ-centered churches and ministries by establishing and applying seven standards of responsible stewardship, trademark, to accredited organizations. It has over 2,100 members. An analysis of the organization's database under the category of ministry type apologetics listed approximately 70 members. Below in table two is a list of several well-known organizations, including their total revenue and assets. So we've got uh, Ankerberg, Ankerberg Theological Research Institute, total revenue uh, about three and a half million a year, uh, total assets about one and a half million. C.S. Lewis Institute, uh, one and a half million a year in revenue. Campus Crusade for Christ, 609 million US dollars per year. And assets, 328 million. Uh, Ratio Christi, uh, about one and a half million um, and almost a million in assets. Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, 47 million in revenue a year, 34 million in assets. What, what happened to them, by the way? Did they rebrand or? I think they rebranded, yeah, yeah, but I've forgotten what they've rebranded as. Maybe someone in the chat will be able to say. Reasonable Faith, one million a year in revenue and about one million in assets. Um, that's Craig's swimming pool. No, okay. <laughs> Veritas College International, uh, 201,000 a year, 64,000 in assets. Yeah, so, please... oh, sorry, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, mean, I think, yeah, that's probably what we're going to say there. So I, I looked up a few from those as well. Maybe we'll get to those later. This is sort of an intro, uh, I guess, to some of the other things that we're going to discuss. But um, I think, so the reasonable faith one is interesting. Um, so, that, so they have about $1 million in donations every year. Um, at least for the last several years that this one here is from 2016 the figures that i found for the right. i think 2020 and are pretty similar so it seems like that's relatively consistent um now i don't know exactly what they do with that one million dollars i assume it's used partly to um uh fund craig's like public speaking um presumably they use it to make those videos on youtube um and other sorts of things like that there's various outreach that they do but um I, again so the point here would be like well, well so that's just craig's like uh organization right and and he has a million dollars of revenue every year um what revenue do do the people who um speak again like who argue against craig have well there's a few academics like oppie um who doesn't have any kind of organization behind him he's just an academic right uh who has a position at a university <laughs> i mean i guess there's a few people on um on youtube like uh, rationality rules for example who, sometimes a response to craig um I put the banner at the bottom as a joke <laughs> well i mean it's not, it's not a Charlie joke right but um he um what was i gonna say oh yeah i mean i don't know exactly how much he makes but i'm pretty sure it's a lot less than a million dollars um and you know and then there's poor old me who like you know i, I don't really <laughs> have any significant resource available but like i've written the only book that i'm aware of unless one's been published very recently that's that is a book length response to craig's entire apologetic right now again the point here is not that it's wrong to like collect donations or that the money itself determines the validity of the argument but obviously we've spent like many many streams talking about the arguments itself i think it's fine to talk about this side of it as well and the point is that absolutely it's relevant like how much resources um 
someone has behind them, like the amount of time that they can spend doing things and producing videos and other like books and other resources. And uh, the, the fact that this is just not really considered, uh, it seems to me, in, in, in the discourse. Um, I've made this point for other religions as well, by the way. I think atheism actually has better in the West than um, some like uh, Eastern religions, which have relatively little um, cultural, in sorry, institutions or like cultural um uh, like capital in the West in terms of uh, an apologetic presence. Um, and so they're just sort of not taken seriously. Well, why aren't they taken seriously? Well, maybe they just don't have enough money <laughs> to uh, to write the books and to have the people at the universities and to like give the talks uh, with people who are charismatic and like speak English really well and and make the culture really relevant references and all this sort of stuff, right? Like, so I, to, to me, this is really important because it, it, you don't want your... Um, you, you don't want to say that I've looked at the best arguments and they favor one worldview when like one side has a massive advantage in producing those arguments than the other. Like that's, that's, that's got to be relevant to your considerations. And this isn't just like, this applies in politics and people don't have a problem understanding that like if one, if one side, like you've got to follow the money in politics, if one side has way more funding, then that's going to help them in the political campaign. But somehow in the apologetic campaign, like that's not relevant and yeah. people just don't want to talk about this or they just get really defensive about it. I, I, I don't get it. Like, yeah, Reasonable Faith Ministries has a million dollars every year to push their message. How much money do people who oppose him have, like, collectively? Not nearly that much, right? <laughs> That's going to be relevant. Like, that buys you things. I, I just, yeah, anyway. Yeah. So many of these organizations, such as uh, CRU and Ratio Christi, form college chapters at universities around the nation, in addition to countless student churches and religious clubs. While there are a handful of secular and atheist clubs on college campuses, such as the Secular Student Alliance, the number of Christian clubs on college campuses easily eclipses those for either secularism, atheism, or other religious faiths. Another avenue to investigate uh, the resources of apologetic organizations and their rivals to access is citizen or <laughs> citizenaudit.org. Three examples of organizations on their site can be seen in Table 3. Um, so Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry Incorporated by Matt Slick has a total revenue of 275000 per year and assets of 60000 Stand to Reason has uh, just over $1.5 million and um, about half a million in assets. Alpha and Omega Ministries by James White, uh, about 300000 a year and about 150000 in assets. In contrast, uh, yeah. the second... Oh, okay, I didn't yeah, see this before. <laughs> So this is what I mean, like, Internet Infidels is one of the bigger ones, right? They've been around for a while. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we... And they have a total revenue of 32000 a year and assets of 53000 so, so there would be a, a couple of other groups that I would put here. Maybe they're mentioned. So one would be the... Oh, bugger. What, what are they called? The... Um, Atheist uh, Community of Austin is one I'm thinking of. That's, yeah, that's yeah. one, but that's not what I... So um, Michael Shermer, what, the, the... Skeptics. Skeptic, the yeah, Enquirer. Yeah, but there's a particular... Center for Inquiry, uh, that's one of them, Center for Inquiry, yeah. So that's one group. Um, but they don't deal much with, like, atheism specifically. It's more like rationalism, which obviously there's overlaps there, but that would be an interesting one to compare. Uh, I'm um, not sure if that's mentioned here. But the point is, so there are a couple of groups. Most of them, though, don't deal very specifically with, like, counter-apologetics, only a little bit perhaps there. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean... You, for... That is mentioned in one of the books, and I don't know if they mentioned the numbers, though, of that Michael Shermer makes. But, yeah, it, it, there is a comparison made in one of the books. Yeah, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. So, yeah, it, you know, Secular Web, which is perhaps the largest internet database for secular atheist and counter-apologetic scholarship, uh, can only claim the following resources. Oh, my mic. So, topic five, uh, publishers. Another important area of following the money trail are publishers and publishing houses. Uh, the number of Christian publishers and publishing houses total in the hundreds. The longest list of biblical publishers can be found at the SBL Handbook of Style for Biblical Studies and Related Disciplines. Uh, though that also includes secular presses, one can consult Writer's Market 2018 by Robert Lee Brewer. Uh, though for easiest access, Wikipedia category Christian publishing companies provides an alphabetical list of Christian publishers and publishing houses. Sorry, I ju just looked up uh, American Atheist as someone suggested yeah. in the chat. So it looks like their revenue is about a million, like fluctuating. Right. So um, obviously that's more than the uh, internet uh, infidels, but still like that's basically like William, <laughs> reasonable faith alone is about the same size in terms of revenue, roughly speaking as, as uh, American Atheists, which is like the premier organization of atheism in the US. So there's just a, a long list of, of publishing houses. That's just A, B, and C. 
Uh, perhaps the most detailed source is Christian Reichert, the Christian Writers Market Guide 2017. Uh, in contrast, detractors have a substantially limited opportunity to publish a text with a traditional publisher. Prometheus is perhaps the most well-known publisher. If a detractor decides to self-publish, there are significant problems with that, uh, problems that will be confronted. Journals as a general will rule general rule will not review books that are self-published and libraries will not pick them up the rationale is that these books did not go through a rigorous review process thus questioning their academic quality reasons vary but probably the most significant factor in a publisher deciding to publish a book is the potential scope of the market to be direct there are millions of potential christian consumers and thousands of church libraries with funds to put these books on the shelves in contrast the potential market for a detractor is substantially reduced the key is that a detractor must target a niche market and one that has not already been oversaturated. The reality is that publishers are in the game to make a profit. So one of the other books that I'll be looking at talks about how this market has been cultivated historically um, for Christian books. But I mean, as someone who has published a book, James, maybe you're in a position to kind of comment on this. I guess the market has probably changed in terms of book publishing globally, right, since... Uh, you know, since this blog post was written, because maybe people's kind of the types of media that people consume has kind of changed away from books. But I don't know, mate, do you want, do you want to say something about that? Again, I think this, we can talk about this a little more later when we talk a bit more about Christian publishing. I think that the challenge, and this, I mean, I have only a small amount of experience here, that the challenge is finding a publisher who's interested, right? So there are some so if you're an academic, you can get published through academic, um, uh, what well, you can potentially get published through academic publishing, like, for example, the Blackwell Companion to Apologetics. Um, now, Christian universities are good at creating academics in apologetics. So that's one advantage, right? Whereas you, you can't really do that in counter apologetics. But um, aside from that, there are many like Christian publishers who are interested in publishing uh you know, books defending the faith or popularizing existing arguments uh, from the uh, atheist or like naturalist side. There are a few small publishers. So my book was published through Hypatia Press, which is one of the, or is it Occam Press, which, yeah, is a subset of, of Hypatia Press, um, which is a, a small publishing house in the UK. And I think there are a few like this that maybe is mentioned in this article or they were mentioned somewhere, or maybe it was in our other document, which we'll talk about. But um, I mean, it's just to my knowledge, there aren't, there aren't very many of them. Um, so it's just sort of harder to interest a publisher. Um, in this sort of stuff. I mean, that was definitely a factor when I originally pitched my book. It's like, well, who's going to read this? Like, there just aren't that many people who are interested in. Um, well, as as we'll see, there at least was a fairly large audience for like in in, in that initial wave of new atheism. I think that that's at least partially dried up these days. But those books weren't very philosophical. Um, they were like athe like you know, God delusion and letter to a Christian nation. They were, if anything, I think a bit more political. Um, and in terms of like uh, making philosophical uh, arguments and, and a discussion of, of Christian um, apologetics, the, the audience is just a lot smaller. Um, yeah, and, and so that was part of my experience as well. I mean, yeah, there are some places who publish that sort of thing, but it's it's a lot more niche. And th there's a lot of, obviously, there's, there's a ton of different books out there. I think uh, our friend Andrew Loke, for example, at the minute, I think a book he's working on is you know, to do with one of the arguments from natural theology, maybe maybe it's design arguments, I'm not quite sure. But the point is that this is part of a series by, I think, Palgrave, it's either Palgrave or Bloomsbury, or are they the same company now? I don't know. Um, which is called, like, reviving uh, arguments from natural theology or something along those lines. And the, the point being that, you know, there there is these in, there's this interest for some reason amongst academic publishers and money being invested in doing things, you know, like reviving the same arguments that there's already a million books published on, which then, you know, enables people to kind of write about these things and have have the resources and time to write about them and get that out there. Whereas I don't think that the same sort of thing exists for the atheist side either. Um, you know, reviving reviving the same old critique of the design arguments in response to reviving the argument or something like that. Um, it's, you know, if, if anyone's going to respond to it, it's going to be like, you know, me and James, or maybe, I mean, I mean, like, maybe like Joe Schmidt or someone like that will respond as well, which, you know, I, I think we're confident enough to respond. But the point is that the, there isn't like that, that financial backing, like, uh, unless you guys kind of 
support us somehow, which which is great. But I said, you know, like we're not getting like a salary from a company or something like that to be able to do it. I think it's not uncommon culturally, at least in parts of the US, for people to receive uh, support from either their church or like members of their church for pursuing apologetics education. Um, you know, I mean, again, that's fine and if the you UK want to do that. Well. that. Well, yeah, I, I know there's less about that. But again, the point is not that a lot of people can't do this, but like no one does that for, <laughs> for doing a, a uh, an atheism, uh, like, you know, studying atheism or uh, philosophy of religion from a secular like perspective. Um, that just isn't the thing, right? So uh, again, all, all this matters when it comes to the end of the day is like, well, how many people are publishing? on a certain area. I think if we look at the sur the Phil Pepe survey, we'll see that philosophy of religion is dominated by Christians, at least in the Anglosphere. Um, and, um, you know, I think partly that's at least going to be a significant selection effect there that, well, you have these people who will have the resources and the time and the motivation to do this and uh, uh, like on the one side, and it just doesn't exist to the same degree on the other side. So because one, one thing I was thinking about with, re with respect to the UK was um, I was thinking... Well, given how few people there are that go to um, church in the UK, how are they actually, um, you know, funding themselves? And then when I look into it, in terms of the properties that they they own, you know, the, the Church of England owns billions worth of properties, but then they have an investment fund, which has billions in it as well. So that generate, and then I, I, I was looking into it and that generates more than enough interest to pay a full-time salary to all of their ministers and like fulfill all their needs because it's like literally billions. So every year they just have all this revenue and they also own um, company companies like that. They, they owned like a loan company or something. And th this was a scandal a few years back where the, I, I think it was Wonga or something and they didn't forgive the debt of like poor people who couldn't pay off their loans. And so people were criticizing like the Archbishop of Canterbury for that. Um, but it's, well, it's just, I very much doubt the Archbishop of Canterbury has a clue what's <laughs> going on in that, but yeah, I take, yeah, I see, I see the optics aren't good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, apparently this is the, Oh, it's the cosmological argument revisited, right? Uh, Springer is the, Oh, right. Yeah revisited though being the operational <laughs> word okay so journals the number of theological journals hard copy and online devoted to supporting christian theology and apologetics number in the thousands wikipedia's opening sentence under the title list of theology journals reads theology journals are academic periodical publications in the field of theology world cat uh, returns about 4,000 items for the search subject theology periodicals and more than 2,200 for Bible periodicals. Although detractors can submit articles for publication, the number of journals open to submission is substantially reduced as compared to the apologetic author. The mission statement may limit journals' submissions, guidelines, or acceptance of submissions. Significantly, journals have a vested financial interest in accepting and publishing articles that their readership would desire to read and not to offend its advertisers. And the, the same also goes for um, funding bodies for philosophy of religion projects, as we'll sort of talk about later as well. Concluding remarks. Yeah, so uh, I just, okay. again, we'll, we'll cut. The truth is, <laughs> um, sorry, that threw me. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, in, in terms of the philosophy of religion journals. Uh, so I don't know about theology journals so much. That's a little bit different. But um, so some of the Christian, like, evangelical philosophy of religion journals do publish like critical articles because i've seen some in them um i think they're a minority of articles which sort of uh, stands to reason but i just wanted to add that point in um but i mean you know any journal has ed editorial bias and this goes for like the sciences uh, as well but uh, again like i don't know of a theology journals i think one is mentioned here but it's gone gone it went defunct a few years ago so just concluding remarks, uh, numbers don't lie. Yes, the sage advice, follow the money, is true in the arena of religion. Detractors slash opponents of Christian apologetics face definite financial challenges. And yes, the odds are stacked against this group, regardless of what side uh, of the theistic aisle they find themselves, whether atheist or non-Christian theist. However, as Fox Mulder on X-Files proclaims, the truth is out there, therefore keep writing. I think there were some consider the reasons. Um... <laughs> James so the McGrath. Guys... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, wasn't this guy criticized for being Jewish and writing this? Or am I thinking of something else? I'm not sure. Um, maybe maybe it was a different piece. In the comments. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, that would must be something else I looked at. Oh no, here it. What, what, uh, I'm a bit disturbed. Oh yeah, there it is. It was this one. Is a Jewish rabbi with a clear agenda to fight <laughs> Christian missionary efforts toward Jews, and this is not stated outright in his post. <laughs> yeah, he he. In fact, what would be better is if he wore a kind of like Jewish star <laughs> on his clothing in order to. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> in order to identify his interests. <laughs> So we saw this exact same, well, almost the same response in uh, the last BA video we did where Craig was responding to his, uh, you know, the Sky, was it Sky Phil? Is that right? Skydive Phil, yeah. Sky, yeah, I, the name doesn't make sense, but Skydive Phil. Um, and Because he uh, does that, skydiving and his name's Phil, I think. That's well, it. fair enough. Yeah, I haven't watched any of that. But anyway, the point is that um, Craig also complained that or oh, his critics are, uh, you know, like uh, trying to argue for a, like an ideological point and they have their own bias and, and uh, they're, they're not just sort of uh, impartially presenting like a, a, a um, inquiry into the truth. And I just don't understand this at all. Like the, the criticism is that you know, Christian evangelicals particularly have a very specific ideological axe to grind. They're very clear about that and they have all these institutions to, to support that and a lot of money behind it. And then, so, so somehow you can't criticize that if you have your own ideological axe to grind. Like, well, it seems to be blatant double standards there. I, I just, that that's, yeah, that's bizarre. It's like, it, I, I think you can be, tr it can, you can say, well, this critic has a kind of ideological bias in some sense. But the, the point of the critique is to talk about the kind of power and money, right, behind um, the, the project, behind the different projects in order exactly. to look at perhaps why they, why they differ. And so the the fact that there is an ideological bias isn't really that important to the critique. Um, there are aspects of the critique, I mean, that we'll go on to that that are to do with the ide ideological bias, but just how it, how then it means that there's a kind of difference in the nature and purpose of arguments, for example, or you know what the what the endeavor is, whether it's seeking truth or whether it's to mm. persuade. And so I guess if there was a criti criticism against Mr. Alter being a Jewish rabbi from that perspective, like, well, he doesn't actually engage with these things with the purpose of truth because he said, you know, I don't care about any of the reasons for what I believe. I just care about convincing people. Then that would be a criticism. But just the fact that he is Jewish, like he could, it could be, he could just be Jewish, right? A Jewish rabbi, but also he, you know, he thinks that all the reasons if, if looked into by someone who is, um, you know, unbiased, actually favor his position rather than them just being like these weaponized tools for convincing people. So, well, I mean, yes. yeah. And a lot of these Christian institutions, uh, again, reasonable faith, one I'm very familiar with and a lot of the universities as well, very explicit in that their purpose is not like dispassionate investigation, uh, but to convince people like to defend and convince people and develop resources for defending a particular approach to the Bible and Christianity and so forth. Now, I disagree with that epistemologically. Well, like, you know, to an extent, I think it's fine to defend one's own view. But if that becomes like a bedrock of your method, then I think that's a problem. Um, but, I mean, they're free to do that. But the point is then I don't think that they can criticize others for doing the same thing from a different point of view. That that just feels hypocritical to me. It's like, well, your criticism of our um, defense of our ideology is somehow by it. Well, it, it is like can be dismissed because you're coming from an ideological perspective like that. I just I don't understand that. Anyway. So the next thing uh, that I wanted to play is from this Philosophical Foundations oh, for Christian this. Worldview. This is Craig's uh, opening remarks on sort of why write this book. So, so this is this is a book that's supposed to kind of provide a systematic refutation of kind of like atheistic projects in philosophy, and also um, a Christian response to kind of a, a Christian understanding of like all the major topics in philosophy, including, you know, like philosophy of mind, various topics in metaphysics, epistemology, and so on. Um, and anything that is seen to kind of undermine the Christian project is, is refuted in this book. So it's like, it's, it's a pretty sizable volume. If you look at the bookshelves of a lot of apologists, you'll see, you know, a nice intact spine that hasn't been opened on many of the shelves of this. Um, <laughs> and so, but but Craig talks about the nature and purpose of arguments, basically, at the start. So so that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, I'll put the narration speed at like, I don't know, 1.4. Hopefully that's all right. J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig. We are deeply gratified for the widespread success of our first edition both as a textbook adopted in colleges, universities, and seminaries, and for individual use. We have been encouraged by the consistent feedback we have received, that it has strengthened Christians and helped them in their walks with God. 
But much has happened in the field of philosophy that is especially relevant to educating Christian disciples and thinkers, hence this revised and updated edition. To avoid lengthening the book needlessly, we have been very selective in what we have added. We believe the result is a new and expanded second edition of Philosophical Foundations for... I'll skip to that bit, I think. <laughs> Let's see. An Invitation to Christian Philosophy. 1. Why Philosophy Matters On a clear autumn day in 1980, 25 miles west of Chicago in Wheaton, Illinois, Charles Malick, a distinguished academic and statesman, rose to the podium to deliver the inaugural address at the dedication of the new Billy Graham Center on the campus of Wheaton College. His announced topic was the two tasks of evangelism. What he said must have shocked his audience. We face two tasks in our evangelism, he told them, saving the soul and saving the mind. That is, converting people not only spiritually, but intellectually as well. And the church, he warned, is lagging dangerously behind with respect to this second task. We should do well to ponder Malik's words. I must be frank with you. The greatest danger confronting American evangelical Christianity is the danger of anti-intellectualism. The mind in its greatest and deepest reaches is not cared for enough. But intellectual nurture cannot take place apart from profound immersion for a period of years in the history of thought and the spirit. People who are in a hurry to get out of the university and start earning money or serving the church or preaching the gospel have no idea of the infinite value of spending years of leisure conversing with the greatest minds and souls of the past, ripening and sharpening and enlarging their powers of thinking the result is that the arena of creative thinking is vacated and abdicated to the enemy. Who among evangelicals can stand up to the great secular scholars on their own terms of scholarship? Who among evangelical scholars is quoted as a normative source by the greatest secular authorities on history or philosophy or psychology or sociology or politics? Does the evangelical mode of thinking have the slightest chance of becoming the dominant mode in the great universities of Europe and America that stamp our entire civilization with their spirit and ideas? For the sake of greater effectiveness in witnessing to Jesus Christ, as well as for their own sakes, evangelicals cannot afford to keep on living on the periphery of responsible intellectual existence. These words hit like a hammer. The average Christian does not realize that there is an intellectual struggle going on in the universities and scholarly journals and professional societies. Enlightenment naturalism and postmodern anti-realism. So what the, the thing I, I want to emphasize in, in this is the, ki the kind of framing, right? The framing being that our, our goal is to become the dominant ideology and to kind of um, alter, to, to change the kind of secular program of investigation into the sciences and philosophy of religion and put a, put a, um, a Christian ideological bent on these things by kind of dominating the, the university somehow. But then it's also... The, the the framing is you know there's this battle going on everyone else is motivated by uh, what it, what he just said post did he say postmodern realism um and no he said and, enlightenment it, enlightenment naturalism and postmodern anti-realism oh anti-real i thought you said po well, that's why i thought it was it stuck in my no, head it was definitely it anti realism okay um yeah, at least it wasn't postmodern neo marxism so uh, yeah glad for that change <laughs> which again i'm just i mean i mean i think this critique could be levied against some uh some specific research programs i mean maybe maybe specifically those people who consider themselves to be like investigating enlightenment values or expanding upon them in their research programs or those who consider themselves to be um po you know researching postmodernism and expanding expanding that uh research program in philosophy but that i mean that's because that is a subset just as christianity is like a subset of philosophy so it's sort of appropriate that there'd be some people doing that but i'm not sure i i'm just not sure that this kind of accurately characterizes what is going on in the university at large um I think when he talks about, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I think when he's talking about, um, what was it again? Enlightenment naturalism. Or naturalism, yeah. That's... I mean, most Enlightenment figures weren't naturalists, so that feels a bit ahistoric to me, but whatever. I think he's just talking about the fact that in most Western universities, there's very little mention of or discussion of God um, right. or like the supernatural in, in pretty much any any field. Like methodological naturalism effectively reigns. I think that's what he's talking about. Craig has has been like critical of that of that before. Um and um yeah, then in terms of postmodernism, that again, that label's a bit problematic. But that sort of approach I think that he's gesturing at it is is I mean, it's fairly dominant, particularly in certain um sectors of like uh, literary studies and and um 
social sciences and so forth. Um, but I mean, the, so the point, I mean, you can disagree with those and, and have your own take on, well, this is the way we should go. Right. But th this is, this is a bit more than that. This is a very expansive vision about, well, I mean, you know, Craig said in his words, he, in his own words, he wants to, uh, what was it again? He wants to, um, uh, he wants the evangelical mode of thinking, whatever that is exactly to, to, to become the dominant one in, in Western universities. Um, and uh, sort of, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of their mission. I think that it's also interesting that he, it, not just that, but he also talks about, and this is what I think is the really dangerous part, is um, that if you don't uh, foster the, like, the mind of, of a Christian, uh, and he talked about spending years of study, now that's a kind of elitist, but again, put that to the side, um, then what you'll have is a, I can't remember the exact phrase used, a casting off or, or a... Um, something or other to the um uh, to, to to the enemy is it i think he said the enemy yeah he says the uh, enemy yeah and i wonder who the enemy is exactly uh or, or how that <laughs> how that manifests but yeah i mean this this the sounds kind of, <laughs> yeah it's not just we want to convince people of our approach or something which is one thing right but it's it, it feels a lot more um like you know how there's this um conspiracy uh, what is it again the um the great the replacement? frankfurt oh, school the, the, conspiracy yeah. theory well yeah, like that one <laughs> I mean, this feels like that, except like it actually is true, right? Like I, I'm not getting all like f like full on conspiracy theory mode, but I mean, it's not really a it's not really a conspiracy. Like they're they're just saying that, right? It's it's like explicitly. And Craig's talked about this in other contexts as well. I think maybe later in this chapter or in other things, he talks about the explicit focus of like since roughly the 70s of uh, particularly American evangelicals to have a lot more emphasis on the academy and private universities and apologetics programs and publishing and things like that. Um, so I mean. It's just sort of, I think it's a little bit weird and slightly creepy the way that it's framed and talking about the enemy and stuff like this. It, it's beyond the just sort of we want to convince people about our approach and try to you know you know ex learn more and and do better, which you know that's uh, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that, but yeah, I I find it a bit a bit weird. I'm trying to find I can't find that channel that put together the. <laughs> I wish I'd found it in time when you when you were saying who's the enemy. You know, have, you've seen that video of um, someone remixing Craig talking about the Satan with metal in the background, where he's like, oh, I, saw I don't know if Satan. I have seen that. Yeah, I, 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 I thought just... you were talking about that crazy channel that we looked at in like one of the first videos where he's like demons from Hilbert space or something. Oh no, not that one. Um, that was fun. There's there's a channel that sort of cut together lectures. I hope it's not been deleted. Um, could could together like philosophy lectures into sort of funny. So there's like a vi there's a video of J.P. Morland, for example, talking about how he's seen uh, demons or something. Um, oh, where it... it's it's going to frustrate me now if I can't find it. So I'm going to have to. But but this is this is where it's different, right? Like no, you know, one has to be careful saying no, right? But very few like uh, respectable academics at a mainstream is like non like Christian college institution will talk about the enemy opposing their, their work. Like, I mean, you know, there's some crazies who get upset that their work's not accepted, but like th this sort of language is just not, you just don't hear that. <laughs> Whereas this is pretty common sort of language from, from Christian evangelicals and might hear this sort of thing fairly commonly. It's not like really fringe stuff, you know, that that's that they're looking at things rather differently, I think. So th this is the channel, and the video is... Yeah, th this is it. Satan and the demons. Satan. Satan, the sin of Satan. Satan, Satan, uh, and the demons. Satan himself. Satan, Satan, and the demons. Satan, Satan, the cleverness, the cunning of Satan. Satan, Satan, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Satan, 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 Satan's authority over this planet. The whole I just find <laughs> so that that's who the enemy is um, in the book. <laughs> the dragon. Hmm. And the, there's a quite funny one of J.P. Morland talking about how students saw um, angels standing either side of him or in a lecture, and he's convinced that you know they were like there protecting him or something but um yeah let's play this out a little bit more yeah but the disciples would never have believed in the resurrection without really convincing evidence like sorry <laughs> it's, it's, it's 
sort of nonsense. Holy alliance against a broadly theistic and specifically Christian worldview. Christians cannot afford to be indifferent to the outcome of this struggle. For the single most important institution shaping Western culture is the university. It is at the university that our future political leaders, journalists, teachers, business executives, lawyers, and artists will be trained. It is at the university that they will formulate, or more likely, simply absorb the worldview that will shape their lives. And since these are the opinion makers and leaders who shape our culture, the worldview they imbibe at the university will be the one that shapes our culture. If the Christian worldview can be restored to a place of prominence and respect at the university, it will have a leavening effect throughout society. If we change the university, we change our culture through those who shape culture. Why is this important? Simply because the gospel is never heard in isolation. It is always heard against the background of the cultural milieu in which one lives. A person raised in a cultural milieu in which Christianity is still seen as an intellectually viable option will display an openness to the gospel that a person who is secularized will not. One may as well tell a secular person to believe in fairies or leprechauns, as in Jesus Christ. Or, to give a more realistic illustration, it is like our being approached on the street by a devotee of a Hare Krishna. So, so the point is here as well, you know, Craig, Craig basically agrees that it, it kind of doesn't matter. <coughs> this is a very sort of postmodern critique of reason almost, right? Where it's like, yeah, you, you can't just provide people with, um, you know, these kind of reasons in a vacuum, these concepts, and they'll, ju they'll just figure out by these a priori truths or something that God exists. Like, our, our modes of thinking are conditioned by the kind of culture that we're in. Um, and the concepts that we have are, are given to us by by these kind of structures and so forth. And therefore, if we if we don't um, cultivate kind of Christian connotations for these concepts and uh, and socialize people into ways of thinking about things where you know God and Jesus is kind of connoted by each of the each of these ways of thinking about things, then they're just not going to reach these conclusions if we uh, if we present them with the gospel or we present them with the arguments. We actually need to have a culture in which people are somewhat indoctrinated into Christianity in order to be able to present it as a viable, into a rationally acceptable option. Um, which, which I think is is kind of interesting. Um, I mean, I mean, I think I think you could be right if, if your goal is to convert people, right? You might have to do a lot of those. Doing those sorts of things is going to be effective in terms of converting people. But um, you know, it make it makes the project kind of it, it kind of seems to defeat what the project claims to be. When you know, in a, in a dialogical context, Craig will present it as. Well, look, you know, I've I've just got these these arguments. These are just reasons that support the conclusion. And if you disagree, like, t tell me why you disagree with them. When really the broader scope of the project is to actually kind of, um, you know, culturally condition people to be acceptable to Christianity and and things like that. Yeah, I think it's super interesting how postmodern this this sort of uh, language kind of is. Um, and I I thought the um comparison or the analogy to uh, Hare Krishna is interesting um, because it, it's almost like it's almost like what Craig is saying here is that it doesn't matter how good their arguments actually are the fact is that like in a western context they're just not going to be taken seriously because you don't have that like cultural conditioning or the the sort of background to see them as a viable option or whatever um, and so the position of the like the Christian academic is to um, to give that sort of uh, baseline plausibility um, and um, I mean, that's that's almost exactly the, the point that well, one of the points that I'm making here, right, is that if we're truth seekers, we don't want what we come to believe to be dominated by or like mostly determined by what happens to be like culturally salient. I mean, in, that's inevitable to some extent, right? But you, you, you want to fight back against that. Um, and so the fact that certain viewpoints, particularly like in the religious domain, have so much greater salience and so much greater resources available. And then you've got the, like the Hare Krishnas who like, you know, no one takes seriously to use this example, like at least in the West, you know, not no one, but like comparatively, um, like we should be really seriously thinking about that and the impact that it has on like what we take seriously, what we've read, you know, like if you've read 20, um, 20 books arguing for Christianity by some very capable philosophers who've had years of time to develop and hone these arguments and a big publishing industry and all of that behind it. Um, well, of course, that's going to be more persuasive than like one, you know, a, a few people with pamphlets in the street who maybe don't have the best English and, uh, you know, who, who don't have the same resources behind them. Like, 
it's like Craig is sort of acknowledging this, but not presenting it as an epistemic challenge or a difficulty. It's just like, well, um, given this, we need to make sure we're we're on the winning side of that eff effectively. Um, now that is kind of consistent with what Craig has said before, where it's basically, look, the arguments aren't the reasons we ultimately believe. They just, uh, they, they help us to convince other people they're nice to have. But ultimately we believe, or at least Craig believes, and I think he encourages other people to believe as well because of a, you know, witness of the spirit. Um, so thinking of it this way is effectively a power play. Like the arguments are to just help us win, essentially, yeah. uh, in, a, in a power play kind of cultural war kind of sense, not in a epistemic convincing kind of sense, um, like based on best reasons. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I think it's consistent with what he said before. I just think that that, I mean, that, that's completely the opposite of, of, of how I think we should be approaching these things if we're truth seekers. And by the way, I'm not saying that all Christian apologists have that approach, but definitely there are, look, Craig is very prominent there. I think there are others who say similar things. Well, I, I think what's the, sort of ironic about it is that there, there's this narrative that's put forward by um, apologists who endorse, are very close to Craig, endorse his, his program. Um, and the narrative is, well, we have like truth and reason on our side. We just believe things as the upshot of reasons. We, you know, whereas it's it's other people that are, are anti-intellectual and you know, so so they, they kind of. I, I'm thinking specifically of channels like Capturing Christianity or Trinity Radio when I think of this. But you know, the, these sort of apologists want to frame a narrative that's like that. Whereas the actual truth of the matter is that their sources, people like Craig actually don't view it that way you know they view it as this kind of power struggle where arguments play this weaponized role not as just them um, inquiry for the sake of truth right where where i think someone who cared about inquiry for the sake of truth would want to say well actually um we want institutions where there's people with these different biases um and different viewpoints they all get the they're kind of epistemic peers and they all get equal funding and time to make their case and then we come along and we assess each one and then we decide between them, right? We, we try and kind of control for um, power, money and um, intellectual acumen and then we see which comes out on top sort of thing. That That's what I think someone who cared about truth would, would want to see rather than like just biasing it in favor of Christianity, which which becomes transparently the the opposite of this kind of, I just believe things because the truth is on my side and reason and logic. Um, as as the narrative gets framed. A movement who invites us to believe in Krishna. Such an invitation yeah, strikes us as bizarre. Freakish. Did you want to say more? Yeah, sorry, just just jump back 30 seconds because I, I want that to play. But all I was going to say is, yeah, so this that is what some people say, like, well, I believe because of truth and reason. Uh, well, I believe because of reason and evidence, rather. That's not what really what Craig says. I mean, he may say that sometimes, but really, he's pretty open about the fact that it's about the subjective experience and that should be the most important thing. Um, so it, it is interesting that in a book about philosophical foundations, we have, I don't know exactly what Moreland thinks about this. I presume that because this is in the introduction that Moreland's at least okay with this kind of attitude. Uh, but I don't know. I haven't really read too much of his stuff, just a few papers. But the point is that it is interesting that a philosophical foundations for Christian worldview text starts out by kind of saying that, the point of this sort of the point of this whole book is not really to serve as an epistemic guide to truth. It's to basically it's to serve a social uh, effect in terms of finding a culture war so that Christianity and like well their particular version of Christianity is in a better relative position compared to say the Hare Krishna who who gives us an example here. Not to say that and just to caveat that there are other like secular philosophers as well who have different views about the purpose of philosophy but if you look at phil papers most philosophers do think that philosophy is in the business of delivering truth or understanding in, in some way like i mean it's literally like lover of truth right and and craig's here is kind of not explicitly but i think pretty clear as, as from these comments and what he said elsewhere is saying that that's not really what it's fundamentally for or at least not why he's doing it intellectually viable option will display an openness to the gospel that a person who is secularized will not one may as well tell a secular person to believe in fairies or leprechauns, as in Jesus Christ. Or, to give a more realistic illustration, it is like our being approached on the street by a devotee of the Hare Krishna movement, who invites us to believe in Krishna. Such an invitation strikes us as bizarre, freakish, perhaps even amusing. But to a person on the streets of Mumbai, such an invitation would, one expects, appear quite reasonable and be serious cause for reflection. Do evangelicals appear any less weird to persons on the streets of Bonn, London or New York than do the devotees of Krishna? 
One of the awesome tasks of Christian philosophers is to help turn the contemporary intellectual tide in such a way as to foster a socio-cultural milieu in which Christian faith can be regarded as an intellectually credible option for thinking men and women. As the great Princeton theologian J. Gresham Machen explained, God usually exerts his regenerative power in connection with certain prior conditions of the human mind, and it should be ours to create, so far as we can, with the help of God, those favorable conditions for the reception of the gospel. False ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer, and yet succeed only in winning a straggler here and there, if we permit the whole collective thought of the nation or of the world to be controlled by ideas which, by the resistless force of logic, prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. Since philosophy is foundational to every discipline of the university, philosophy is the most strategic discipline to be influenced for Christ. Malik himself realized and emphasized this. It will take a different spirit altogether to overcome this great danger of anti-intellectualism. For example, I say this different spirit so far as the spirit spirit of anti-intellectualism, such as wanting one ideological group to dominate all of the intellectual resources and bias. Yeah, the way, the way that Craig talks about anti-intellectualism here is interesting. So he's critical of anti-intellectualism in like Christian churches, but yeah, I guess, I mean, intellectualism is not necessarily well defined. Right. To me, the open and honest pursuit of truth is fundamental to what I would regard as a good form of anti-intellectualism, yeah. at least. Um, and that's really not what Craig's interested in. Now, he is interested in intellectualism in the form of, like, um, Make academic it sounding workout. plausible. <laughs> yeah, so sounding plausible, effectively, and having legitimacy and being worked out rigorously. Um, but, you know, not in pursuit of truth directly. I mean, he thinks it's true, right? But not not in the... You know what I'm saying? Uh, in defense of uh, things that you already have come to believe through other means. Um, the other point I wanted to uh, bugger. What was the other point I wanted to make about that? Um, that no, it's gone. Never mind. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Philosophy alone, the most important domain for thought and intellect, is concerned. Must see the tremendous value of spending an entire year doing nothing, but poring intensely over the Republic, or the Sophist of Plato, or two years over the Metaphysics, or the Ethics of Aristotle or three years over the city of God of Augustine. Now, in one sense, it is theology, not philosophy, that is the most important domain for thought and intellect. As the medievals rightly saw, theology is the queen of the sciences, to be studied as a crowning discipline only after one has been trained in the other disciplines. Unfortunately, the queen is currently in exile from the Western University. But her handmaid, philosophy, still has a place at court and is thus strategically positioned so as to act on behalf of her queen. The reason Malik could call philosophy, in the absence of the queen, the most important intellectual domain, is because it is the most foundational of the disciplines, since it examines the presuppositions and ramifications of every discipline at a university, including itself. Whether it be philosophy of science, philosophy of education, philosophy of law, philosophy of mathematics, or what have you, every discipline will have an associated field of philosophy foundational to that discipline. The philosophy of these respective disciplines is not theologically neutral. Adoption of presuppositions consonant with or inimical to orthodox Christian theism will have a significant leavening effect throughout that discipline that will, in turn, dispose its practitioners for or against the Christian faith. Christian philosophers, by influencing the philosophy of these various disciplines, can thus help to shape the thinking of the entire university in such a way as to dispose our future generations of leaders to the reception of the gospel. It is already happening. Over the last 40 years, a revolution has been occurring in Anglo-American philosophy. Since the late 1960s, Christian philosophers have been coming out and defending the truth of the Christian worldview with philosophically sophisticated arguments in the finest scholarly journals and professional societies. And I can, can pause this one around here and we can move on to um, the next thing, which is um, more, more of Craig, Craig's views, but this time from reasonable faith. Um, if you want, is there anything else you want to say on that one though, James? No, I think it's pretty clear where, where Craig's coming from and what the sort of impetus is behind this. So yeah, the, ne the, the next thing I just wanted to note was in, in reasonable faith, which is Craig's book. I know I said something really silly there. I know I said booky work <laughs> on page 43. So just, so he talks about. Um, faith here. What was the page I'm going to? Page 46 is where I want to go. Three, four, five, six. 
So I don't have highlights in this one, which is frustrating. So this is just, a, okay, the unbeliever. Uh, but what about the, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of an unbeliever? Since the Holy Spirit does not indwell in him, does that mean, uh, I can zoom in if you guys are struggling to read, uh, does, that, does this mean that he must rely upon arguments and evidence to convince him that Christianity is true? No, not at all. According to the scripture, God has a different ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially geared towards the needs of the unbeliever. Jesus describes the ministry in John 16, 7 to 11. It is your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor, the paraclete, uh, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convince the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness, because I go to the father and you will see me no more concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, Satan, is judged. Um, here, the Holy Spirit's ministry is threefold. He convicts the unbeliever of his own sin, of God's righteousness, and of his condemnation before God. The unbeliever, so convicted, can therefore be said to know such truths as God exists, I am guilty before God, and so forth. This, is, I mean, I would sincerely report that I don't know those things. So I think a Christian sort of just telling me that I do is a bit bizarre. Well, well these sorts of claims are just for the benefit of Christians, I think, um, yeah. to feel better about themselves, not non-believers. I don't know. I mean, if I just tell people, well, actually, you, I mean, some atheists say this, right? You, you don't really believe yeah. in God. You just like to believe right. yourself. Like, well, what's the point of saying something like that? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, this is the way it has to be. For if it weren't for the work of the Holy Spirit, no one would ever become a Christian. So actually, the reason me and James aren't convinced is God's fault, um, <laughs> according to Craig. I've never been out of, this is a bit of a, of a tangent, but I've never been able to work that out in a way that made sense to me. I mean, very open to discussing this further, but it's like, well, I mean, this is more of a, I think a Protestant view, um, particularly of like the Craigian form. I think it's a bit different from Calvinist, but it's like, well, why don't I believe? Well, uh, it's because, sorry, uh, people come to believe because God, you know, reaches out to them. It's like, well, why hasn't he reached out to me? Well, well because you rejected his, uh, his reaching out. It's like, well, well, why did I reject it? Well, because you, you like you have an evil corrupted nature. Well, like, <laughs> well, well, everyone has an evil corrupted nature. Uh, so God has to reach out to help you change your nature. Okay, well, then why haven't he reached out to me? Well, because you didn't accept it. Well, why didn't I accept it? Because you have a corrupted nature. Well, then how do I come around that? Well, God has, re you see, like, I, I don't understand how it's supposed, how do you break out of that? Like, it doesn't, I've never yeah, what's the, lo out. logically or, or chronologically, what's the first thing that has to happen for me to change my nature? Well, it's God reaching out. That's chronologically the first thing that has to happen. So it seems like God's kind of responsible there for, like, I, I don't have any I mean, that's how it seems power. to me, but, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here we have, ungenerate man cannot understand spiritual things. Da-da-da-da-da. Uh, the fact, the fact we do find people who are seeking God and are ready to believe in Christ is evidence that the Holy Spirit has been at work um, because that's unexpected if it wasn't true <laughs> that people would be willing to find God. Uh, con convicting them and drawing them to him. As Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Therefore, that, therefore, when a person refuses to come to Christ, it is never just because of lack of evidence or because of intellectual difficulties. At root, he refuses to come because he unwillingly ignores and rejects the drawing of God's spirit in his heart. No one in the final analysis really fails to become Christian because of lack of arguments. He fails to become a Christian because he loves darkness rather than light and wants nothing to do with God. But anyone who responds to the drawing of God's spirit with uh, an open mind and open heart can know with assurance that Christianity is true because God's spirit will convict him that it is. Jesus said, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yes, that's what doesn't make sense to me. Like, yeah, okay. But under the theology, everyone loves darkness more than light. Like everyone is corrupted. Yeah. So then why do some people choose the darkness when it's made manifest to them? Well, because God works in their hearts. Well, then why doesn't he work in my heart? Well, because you're corrupted. Well, then how do I get around that? Well, God has to reach out to you. Well, then you don't respond. Well, why don't I respond? It goes around again, right? I've literally had these arguments with, with Christians before. I just, I don't, I don't get it. And, it. and it's kind of, you know, again, it's kind of ironic because the framing amongst a lot of these kind of apologetic circles is going to be, you know, we... I, I, I'm rational. I am rational. I'm reasonable. Um, it's reasonable faith. It's rational. And then it's going to kind of just come down to, you know, like the feelings don't care about your facts, bro. Like, um, you know, I, we know Christianity is true because it feels that way. Um, so the, ro but the role of argument and evidence, 
But what about the second point, the role of argument and evidence in knowing Christianity be, to be true? I've already said that it is self or the self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit that gives us. So so what that means for it to be self-authenticating, and this is a sort of bizarre claim, is that when you have that feeling that you couldn't actually conceive that the cause of that feeling is something like it's not even possible that the cause of that feeling would be something other than God. And I just find that this sort of like bizarre claim because it seems so easy to conceive of it being false. I mean, that's what Christians conceive of in the case of the Mormon who claims they have a self-authenticating witness or, you know, the, the Muslim or the Harry Krishna who just feels Krishna when they chant or whatever, you know, these self-authenticating experiences, they can, it's perfectly possible, right? That the, the cause is purely psychological or even a demon or something else. Why? I, I don't get what the principled reason is that it can be that in the case of, um, their experience. But anyway, therefore, the only role left for argument and evidence to play is a subsidiary role. So this is where we're going to get into what Craig calls magisterial and ministerial reason. I think Martin Luther correctly distinguished between what he called the magisterial and ministerial uses of reason. The magisterial use of reason occurs when reason stands over and above the gospel like a magistrate and judges it on the basis of argument and evidence. Okay, the ministerial use of reason occurs when reason submits to and serves the gospel. So we're going to get into some of this sort of circularity that James was talking about here, where it's it's just not clear, you know, like re reason can't act. So, so cr the model Craig is setting up here is one wherein reason isn't actually able to question, you know, the kind of sensor, the, the sensation of the self-authenticating witness of, of the spirit. And then it just seems kind of question begging then in a way where it's like you're not allowed to use reason in this magisterial sense where it can actually question the truth. You just kind of have to presuppose almost that it that um, that Christianity is true and then use reason to kind of, you know, in like a motivated reasoning sense to just serve that conclusion that you've already reached. Um, in light of the Spirit's witness, only the ministerial use of reason is legitimate. Philosophy is rightly the handmaid of theology. Reason is a tool to, ha and th this is going to cut against, you know, that narrative of like evidentialism that, uh, or, I, I mean, obviously there's going to be Christians who disagree, right? So they might just disagree with Craig on this point, but but this is definitely in tension with Christians who say, you know, they just believe because of the facts and the evidence, bro. Reason is a tool to help us better understand and defend our faith. So reason is a weapon. As Anselm puts it, ours, ours is a faith that seeks understanding. A person who knows that Christianity is true on the basis of the witness of the spirit may also have a sound apologetic, which reinforces or confirms for him the spirit's witness, but it does not serve as the basis of his belief. If the arguments of natural theology and Christian evidences are successful, then Christian belief is warranted by such arguments and evidences for the person who grasps them. Um, okay, I don't know. Is there, is there anything else you want to say about that, James? Oh, I think I've made my points here. Oh, geez, sorry about my voice. Yeah, okay. Sorry about your voice. Um, and then this is Craig. Welcome to Defenders, Dr. William Lane Craig's weekly class at Johnson Ferry Baptist Church in Atlanta. Only, only the first, the I think it's only the first two minutes of this. Or something. Is this on know. his channel? Yeah, this is on, I maybe, don't know. If maybe they didn't have his, yeah, Dr. Craig videos. Maybe they didn't have that one million back in 2012 because that <laughs> font is just oh. <laughs> Dr. Do Dr. Craig that. speaks. Visit our website at reasonablefaith.org. You'll find articles, compelling debates, audio video downloads, an interactive forum, and many more resources. That's reasonably a couple of interesting uh, editorials that had appeared recently in uh, newspapers that I wanted to pass on with you because I thought they were so useful. Very often, people will say, well, what good is philosophy? It's just logic chopping or airy-fairy speculation. It has no good whatsoever. Well, in an article entitled Philosophy, What's the Use? by Gary Gutting, who is a prominent philosopher of science, he makes some distinctions that I think are very helpful in understanding the usefulness of philosophy. He says, if you think that philosophy is something that you have to use in order to establish the rationality of certain foundational beliefs, like belief that the external world is real, or that you exist, or that the past is real and it's not just a dream in, in your mind, then he says philosophy isn't going to be very useful. These kinds of foundational truths, he says, are widely recognized by philosophers as diverse as Alvin Plantinga and Richard Rorty as being foundational beliefs, properly basic beliefs 
that don't require any sort. Richard Rorty, the well-known foundationalist. Um. <laughs> yeah, what's he on about here? There's a very diverse range of views about that. He just basically assert it's like Craig's, what does he call it? Foundational metaphysical principle that he only seems to know about what that even is or what counts as one. Like, there's just no such thing, bro. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. Or of philosophical argument in order to be rational to hold. So he says, if that's the way you think of philosophy, it's no wonder you would think that it is not of any practical significance. But he says there are other ways in which philosophy is vitally useful. And let me quote from his article. He says, even though basic beliefs on ethics, politics, and religion do not require prior philosophical justification, they do need what we might call intellectual maintenance, which itself typically involves philosophical thinking. Uh, that is to say, in order to maintain certain beliefs that you have, even properly basic beliefs, you need to be able to answer defeaters of those beliefs that those who disagree with you may bring against them. In order to maintain your beliefs rationally, you need to be able to defeat the defeaters that are brought against you. And he gives this example. Religious believers, for example, are frequently troubled by the existence of, of horrendous evils in a world they hold was created by an all good God. Some of their trouble may be emotional, requiring pastoral guidance, but religious commitment need not exclude a commitment to coherent thought. For instance, often enough believers want to know if their belief in God makes sense given the reality of evil. The philosophy of religion is full of discussions relevant to this question. Similarly, you may be an atheist because you think all arguments for God's existence are obviously fallacious. But if you encounter, say, a sophisticated version of the cosmological argument or the design argument from fine tuning, you may need a clever philosopher to see if there's anything wrong with it. So intellectual maintenance is one of the things that philosophy can do for us, and particularly for us as Christians, as Gutting's example of the problem of evil illustrated. He goes on to say, in addition to defending our basic beliefs against objections, we frequently need to clarify what our basic beliefs mean or logically entail. So if I say, I would never kill an innocent person, does that mean that I wouldn't order the bombing of an enemy position if... So the, the thing I wanted to comment on was mostly that first point where, you know, correct... Craig is going to kind of defend a view, a good use of philosophy here as essentially justifying whatever positions you already held, right? And I, I'm not sure that that is a good use of philosophy. I think that upon, you know, critical reflection, that we shouldn't just find arguments which conclude the thing that we already believed. We should kind of probe, you know, our, our kind of intuitions or our, our pre-theoretic views of things. Uh, and then as we come to kind of ass assess these things, we might find that we actually had a kind of dodgy view. We shouldn't just amass arguments that kind of defend the position we already held. And I think there's going to be an inconsistency here on Craig's part, where in the case of the atheist, he's going to advise them towards belief revision as the upshot of the assessment of these sorts of arguments. Whereas in the case of the um, theist, he's going to advise them to just cling to their intuition. Why? Because he thinks one's true and the other isn't. Whereas I think even in thinking that one is true and the other isn't, the heuristic that one should advocate for should be one that's agnostic of any position where it's like, no, just explore what people have to say about these topics and come in, in best faith to the conclusions that you come to, right? Even though I might disagree with you, I'll be here to like hear what you have to say and we can talk about that if we do disagree. It shouldn't be um, this, you know, the right way is to come to, to my conclusion or something, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's all I want to say about that one. Like, like I don't, Craig's view of what a good use of philosophy is like differs significantly from mine and I think many others. Yeah, I don't think Craig has much of an interest in using philosophy to come to truth um, or um, to, uh, you know, like cr critically evaluate our beliefs. Uh, he, as, as shown here, he doesn't really think that uh, that's an appropriate use of philosophy and he never really does this in his books to my knowledge. It's pretty much all about uh, if you look at it, it's, it's pretty much all about defending beliefs that he holds for like pre-theoretic reasons. And this is rife throughout his um, defense of pretty much anything, whether it's his view of objective morality, his view of like causation, his view of time, uh, his view of the mind. They're all, they're all based on his pre-theoretic notions about like what he, it's obvious to him. And then everything else is sort of subservient to that. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, I, I think that that's completely back. <laughs> what do they say boss ackwards uh approach to philosophy, <laughs> yeah. But. yeah so the next thing then to talk about is th this book which is pretty interesting is kind of like a it's it's a sort of biography i i, I think i was talking to you james I, I don't know if i said it on the stream or before we started but this book is um by a guy who kind of was looking for a proof for god and he wrote this kind of biography about it his search so 
I think we'll come back to this maybe when we talk about funding, because he talks about John Templeton a bit here. Um, and there's some interesting stuff about his meeting with Richard Swinburne and so forth. But this next chapter... Uh, Okay, so, so the ending of this chapter, I think, is important before reading the next chapter. So he says, uh, so in an office across the hall, this is, you know, he's going around geographical locations into places where people do apologetics and these philosophy universities and so forth. Um, I spoke with, I, as I spoke with this person called Barrett, the philosopher, was Kelly James Clark, uh, who had been his philosophy teacher at Calvin, Calvin Theological College, taking a sabbatical in Oxford to think through the intersections of cognitive science and reformed epistemology. Also in town that week was the Notre Dame trained philosopher Michael Murray, a longtime friend of Clark's who had recently become the Templeton Foundation's vice president for philosophy and theological programs, making him Christian philosophy's man on the inside. On arrival, he inherited responsibility for Barrett's three year, 3.9 million cognitive science research grant. Of course, uh, and so we'll talk about, you know, the kind of money involved in these kind of what's motivating where the money goes and things like that a bit later. But of course, it should only stand to reason that in a scientific age, proof would put on the garb of science in an age no less industrial. Meanwhile, it burgeons into an industry. So the next chapter, he goes to talk about the proof industry, talks a bit here about C.S. Lewis is um, radio appearances, which is interesting. But the thing I'm interested in is this part. So the proof industry's trail led me to California, especially to the concrete sprawl that surrounds Los Angeles, far from the beach, uh, the Sunset Strip and Skid Row. Californian religion is the most famous for its fringes, self-centered therapies, transplanted gurus, boom and bust revivals, paparazzi devotion, sci-fi prophets. There's the guru my parents used to talk used to take me to used to take me to when I was little and the retreat center in Ojai I don't know if that's how it's pronounced where my mother goes to study Hindu scriptures but California is also a kind of R&D department for the religious mainstream Pentecostalism was born in downtown LA a, cent a century ago before spreading across the country and the world there's a crystal cathedral Philip Johnson's postmodernist glass sanctuary in Garden Grove which shares its campus with a drive-in church from the early 60s where people could attend services without leaving their cars. A bit farther down in State 5 is Saddleback Church, the 20,000 strong evangelical congregation of Rick Warren, whose purpose-driven life is one of the uh, best-selling books in history. So there's a little picture there of some of the play, you know, so you've got um, Caltech, Los Angeles, Living Waters Ministries, where he, he's going to go to these three uh, reasons to believe ministries in Biola University. Um, best-selling books in history. Megachurches like this have found the perfect solu solution to the lethargy of suburban life. Collective effervescence on Sundays with free childcare, tight-knit small group meetings through the week, and plenty of parking spaces. The Bible Belt may carry the sword of American old-time religion, but suburban California is its cutting edge, more modern than modern. My first stop was a visit to Ray Comfort at the headquarters of Living Waters Publications, a two-story white building with columns in front, just off the main drag in Bellflower. I went through the parking lot around the back where an assistant greeted me at the sliding glass door. She led me inside and sat me down at a long wooden conference table with chandeliers overhead while she revved up the old fashioned popcorn maker. Mr. Comfort arrived to greet me uh, as the kernel started popping. Though his accent betrays him as a New Zealander, Comfort fits him better around Southern California than I do. Intensely relaxed, resolutely casual, Yet he has a natural frenzy of someone who could have a successful surfing supply and leather jacket making business by the age of 20, as he did. Um, OK, so, yeah, he he's friends with Kirk Cameron, uh, the grown up born again teenage star from the sitcom Growing Pains. Together, Comfort and Cameron host their own TV show, The Way of the Master, promising 100 percent scientific proof that God exists without mentioning faith or the Bible. Uh, given his ADD on steroids, as he put it, Comfort. Uh, comfort little better than endured a sit down with me. Only when we got to tour did he seem to be enjoying himself. About 30 people work at Living Waters, all apparently well prepared for banter as he passes. There's a TV studio, a warehouse and a call center where the staff was taking orders for the 20 million or so books, tracks and DVDs they sell each year. But mostly it's a fun house full of the toys and, and contraptions comfort has built or accumulated over the years and which he uses as evangelical props, evangelistic props. I'm sorry for my reading ability, which seems to have degraded um, as we go on. Uh, a, a facsimile of the Ten Commandments, a skeleton hanging in a closet, 
um, non-Freudian, a giant stuffed ape. I've got a fertile imagination, he confessed. In his office, there was a pair of plastic bananas. Comfort is, after all, the banana man. Behold the atheist nightmare, the shtick goes, repeated in countless talks and tracks. He holds up a banana. Look, he says, how the ridges are perfectly suited to fit the human hand. There's a tab on top for easy opening, and there's nourishing fruit inside. He compares these features to those of a soda can, which obviously must have been intelligently designed. So the banana must be too. This is the scientific proof he was talking about. How how long did he make that argument? I thought he, he gave it up pretty quickly. Oh, he still makes it. That. Yeah, he still really? makes he it. Really? He still does? Yeah, yeah. He he like, made a documentary called The Banana Man. Talking even about the other creationists he's... make fun of him about this. <laughs> <laughs> he made a, a documentary maybe two, three years ago called The Banana Man. Um, uh, uh, in re in response to criticisms about this, just, just basically saying he's been misrepresented at what he that what the argument really is, um, but how it's really converted loads of people. Uh, he well, I don't another... doubt that that it's been <laughs> persuasive because it's like a it's a persuasive argument, right? Like it's one of those things that sounds good if you don't think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he can throw in another proof just for good measure. If the banana was teleological, tricosmological, it's perfectly clear that just as a building must have a builder, creation must have a creator. Simple as that. To be an atheist, you have to claim the ultimate absurdity, says Comfort, that nothing created everything. You can lead an atheist to evidence, but you can't make him think, says the title of one of his recent books. If an atheist starts to think, by definition, he's no longer an atheist. <laughs> Comfort has hooked you with the promise of promise of proofs whether you like them or not he turns to what really matters sin go through the ten commandments have you ever lied even once well you're a liar stolen anything ever so small you're a thief in the eyes of god have you ever even thought about committing adultery by the standard jesus gave in the gospels you're an adulterer and you're headed for eternal punishment you've only got one way out and it's to repent and give your heart mind and life to god in christ we can argue about God's existence forever, comfort knows, but time is short to repent. There's the legitimate addressing of the intellect, he told me, but it's up to you whether or not you want to waste your time spending hours arguing with someone, or whether you want to show them God's forgiveness. A proof is only a bait, a placeholder, a recognition of the obvious. It gets atheists' attention. Um, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. The author says, this isn't what I want to hear by now, this far into the book. Proof is a joke, a platitude, an insult, or a gimmick. Yet that's what comfort makes of it. And after talking with him, I started to worry that there's truth in what he's saying. Alvin Plantinga and Richard Swinburne can't claim to have won multitudes to faith by their proofs. Yet comfort, by his street preaching and pamphleteering, can. He puts thinking in its place and moves on to what will really make a difference. And this is interesting because it seems like what Comfort's doing here is actually perhaps what Craig should be advocating for, given his view of the nature and purpose of philosophy, right? Uh, proof is a trick. It keeps a certain self-styled in self intellectual type of person in the conversation. Let them have a proof or two, says Comfort, if that's what will make them pay attention to the fate of their souls. For that, any trick is, is justified. At the end of our tour, he introduced me to his wife. Um, and gave him a bunch of DVDs and, and thingies. Um, do you want to comfort on the Ray Comfort thing before we talk about his next visit to the reasons to do believe? Do I want to comfort on the Ray Comfort thing? I mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I think that uh, phrasing or, or representation of Christianity is about the most unattractive form. I maybe not the most, but it's it's up there. The idea that like, well you just sell it on the basis of you don't want to be punished do you well then you better shape you know you, you better you better repent right you, you better turn yourself over to god like it's it's entirely self-motivated and self-interested it's not motivated by love of god and, and what that represents and you know his his place in the cosmos or whatever i mean they may say that right but that's that wasn't the that wasn't the shtick that we got <laughs> that wasn't the like what's supposed to be the, the motivator well love um, becomes like a love bombing thing as well after you're presented this image of like you know an angry abusive dad as yeah. god sort of thing Anyway, yeah, I'm I'm really not interested in religions that are sold on like uh, fear and guilt like that. Um, anyway, so I just, but the, I, I suppose the point is that this 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 fits into the apologetics industrial complex just insofar as Living Waters uh, Living Waters Ministries. I think Ray Comfort has millions of subscribers on YouTube. Let me actually um, just have a look so I can give you the actual number. Uh, Living Waters. 
1.09 million subscribers. And if I go to um, Social Blade and look at Living Waters, we but have... I would, I would guess that a lot of Ray... This is purely speculation, so people can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would have guessed that many of Ray Comfort's audience are older uh, and many of them maybe not as YouTube, uh, as, as active on YouTube. Honestly, I'm actually not sure. So he get he gets yeah. about a hundred thousand views per episode. Let me change. I'll just change my screen so you can actually see what I'm looking at. Um, yeah, well, that's. I was going to ask about uh, viewership as well because that's probably more important. Yeah. Than... So so he, I mean, he's really good at marketing. So he gets you know like he looks like. He's Wait, what, what am I looking at? Is this uh, this is Ray Comfort's channel living? Oh, okay, because it doesn't look. Uh, I just saw Elon Musk. Oh, what Elon? Oh, jeez. Sorry, I'm not familiar with Ray. <laughs> so this is like the worst form of clickbait, right? Where it's like, yes, people are talking about Elon Musk, right? So let's make some videos about that, even though it doesn't have yeah. anything to do with anything. <laughs> like, what? Horrified me. Dot, dot, look, dot. She laughed at first <laughs> until the preacher said this, dot, dot, dot. And then there's like these arrows. Look at all these red arrows there. Oh, yeah. someone, someone knows their stuff. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, oh, this it's is so. <laughs> it's it's successful though, right? This Stop is making point. this mistake, big guy. Oh, look, like almost all of them have these red arrows in them, like the clickbait arrow. And and you never, in terms of the <laughs> videos he does where he interviews people, um, he literally he never posts, you know, like the misses as it were. He only posts the hits. But he has these. He he goes around California and he has these sorts of conversations with people. But sometimes, you know, they're pe people with like green hair or a nose person piercing or something and he's like he he clearly sort of thinks these people are demon possessed or influenced somehow like see like this guy with the punk hair it's like that's this, pretty epic hair this turned like, him from friendly from... to furious <laughs> oh sorry Th this turned him from friendly to furious in a it's the same thing so have you ever told a lie so you're a liar you know like uh <laughs> that sort of thing and then people obviously get upset when he says that sort of thing those sorts of things to people um and then it's like, yeah, you're clearly demon possessed. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's much more we want to say about that, but j just the point that there's a lot of money involved in this. So according to Social Blade, the YouTube channel alone generates um, at least ten thousand to one hundred and seventy-four thousand, and then there's obviously it, 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 that's in pounds, so in dollars that translates to I don't know, like twenty thousand dollars to four hundred thousand dollars, somewhere in that vicinity. And then there's additionally um, donations and the tracts that they sell and books that they sell. You know, Ray Comfort's got his own King James Bible version and uh, the Way of the Master TV series and things like that. Um, a recent uptick in subscribers, strangely, as well. Yeah, I had no idea he had such a popular <laughs> and uh, meme uh, YouTube channel. I might have to uh, use that for <laughs> in the future. That, that was just amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, so the next one then is reasons to believe. So about 20, 25 miles north um, and east of comfort is reasons to believe. Um, this is a slightly different approach. If you don't remove the intellectual bar barriers, says Hugh Ross, you'll never be able to address the heart issues. Ross is an astrophysicist originally from Canada who first turned, who first moved to California to do a postdoc at Caltech. My, my ability to read has just gone down the drain. <laughs> uh so hugh yeah ross yeah i that doesn't ring a bell to me does he oh you a... don't know hugh ross yeah he's he's the he, he's the guy who thinks that the color like blue in rooms is a demonic color and that ufo sightings are actually demons because of some soviet studies huh. or something some where soviet people, studies some so some soviet studies where people who engaged with the people who engaged with the occult um began to have ufo experiences and he thinks that this is like strong evidence in favor of ufos being demonic like i'm actually i, I swear i'm not straw manning him like i i don't think he's doing reasons to believe i don't think he's doing the intellectual side of christianity any kind of service by um talking about these sorts of things see, but... see this is why i focus more on craig right you know like craig's my kind of i don't know he's my kind of apologist <laughs> like it just doesn't do the the completely crazy stuff <laughs> like... yeah yeah <laughs> Oh man. Um so what was the bit I want to to read from here? Because I've not got the highlights. Um so yeah, Hugh had a specific 
Hugh had specific ready answers for how to understand Genesis in light of science. Then he was just beginning to develop what would become the reasons to believe creation model, a story of harmony between the scientific universe and the biblical God. So, so the kind of niche, I suppose, the marketing niche that he fulfills is, look, look I've got a science degree. You think science is in right. conflict with Christianity. Yeah, I'm going to. What's his degree? In? Did you say he was in astrophysics? Uh, physics. Yeah, astrophysics, physics. I think. Yeah, I think it's just a, a normal physics degree, but I could be wrong about that. Oh, yeah. Hugh, Hugh Ross studies uh, his Bible as hard as his science and at every turn <laughs> finds ways to <laughs> make them inform and enrich each other. Um or genetics similarity to animals is to him God's way of offering them to us for medical testing. Uh, God placed the gas giants Seriously? in the solar system just to protect <laughs> Earth from meteor impacts. Hugh's explanation, says Kathy, gave me so much more joy in my life and freedom. She isn't the only one. I've seen grown men stand there at the end of his talks and fight back tears trying to express what it meant to finally see the pieces coming together. I could imagine fighting back tears after listening to one of his talks based on what you said here, but I don't know <laughs> that would be the same sort of tears. <laughs> um Gosh. so they built a science faith think tank with offices in a small baby glue roofed shopping center on a busy street in glendora over the years reasons has grown and taken all taken over all all the storefronts um at the center of reasons today i think this is about 2012 this book is being written but it could be uh, or is it later with a, I, I don't know it's around that time i think uh, Hugh Ross developed his model, a, bio, a biochemist, a younger astrophysicist, and a philosopher. Supporting them, in turn, are a couple dozen people on staff and a few thousand volunteers around the world. Many of them have been trained in online courses through the Reasons Institute or the Reasons Academy for Homeschooled Teens. Supporters can join the staff aboard a cruise ship for educational vacations. Ross and his colleagues uh, regularly speak at churches, universities, and offices of high-tech companies. Pe people keep coming and keep responding and keep donating. So, I mean, like, just look at this compared to, you know, me and James just in our, like, rooms with a, a webcam or whatever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, there's so many of these people doing this sort of stuff, like, uh, I actually have got a list later, and I don't even know if Ray Comfort was on there. Um, but uh, there, there's just so many of these ministries; it's crazy. Um, so she talks. So Kathy, whose who's right, wife, talks about how people ask uncomfortable questions in church, and they want answers. Ray Comfort won't quite do it for them, so that's another part of this niche. Um, others might accept the banana, but these people don't. C.S. Lewis can help, but they need the latest science too. They want to keep their faith, but only if it's really true. Uh, I think that's doing, you, you know, I think this is like a narrative device as well in terms of what people tell themselves in the rationalization. Uh, so nowhere did I find more people like Kathy, Kathy Russell was describing than at Biola University. Uh, so mm -hmm. he goes to Biola uh, at the bottom edge of Los Angeles County, a community founded by the map maker Andrew McNally. Uh, this isn't important information. Yet Biola is the largest employer in town, and outside the gates it shows. Stop in a given strip mall cafe to take notes, and you'll hear Christian rock playing in the background. At the next table, a group of teenage girls is having a Bible study. The Biola application asks students, do you know Christ is your personal saviour? Followed by a space to put down the date of conversion, they're asked if they agree with the page-long doctrinal statement which emphasises biblical inerrancy, Christ's atonement, and the conscious, unutterable endless torment of anguish awaiting the hard-hearted sorry can i ask about this date of conversion thing because i wasn't familiar with that like specific <laughs> date thing I, wh what does that mean like how can you have a specific date i don't know um i mean like what? when when i did a, a program hosted by the northwest partnership for teaching people about the bible when i was a christian I, I also had, there was a section on the application form that had date of conversion and to write a bit about your conversion story as well. So again, yeah, I don't know the relevance of this. I don't know. But I mean, I, I came up with a date, right? I just put like an approximate month on. I Honestly, in retrospect, I don't know that there was such a thing. So I was probably just making it up. In, in... Well, plenty of Christians that I've spoken to <laughs> wouldn't be able to nominate a specific date. <laughs> like, I don't know what sort of theory of like conversion or, or whatever yeah. that they're working with there where it's, I mean, I know that there are some Christians who talk about being saved as if it's a specific event that occurs at like kind of an instant in time. Um, I, I don't know that that's the, the model that they're working with here, but it, it just seems a bit strange to me. <laughs> um, applicants get a few line to cite points of disagreement. 
as well as those on which they haven't yet formed an opinion. Such basics matter. Biola was founded in 1908 by Lyman, Lyman Stewart, the oilman who would soon finance the Fundamentals, a uh, biblical literalist text that launched the modern fundamentalism. Uh, students I met there, mainly master's students in Bio Biola's philosophy and apologetics program, like the venerable Andrew Loke, that's what kickstarted him before his mm. PhD, wanted to get their fundamentals straight too. The most determined among them tended to share a common story. And I, I, I highlighted this because I think that this is, I think that this would make for interesting sociological or psychological um, research into, you know, the phenomena of apologetics and the way, the, the role that narratives play in how people kind of rationalize the positions that they hold or because, because I think there are just these like common narrative tropes that people adopt in these communities. I don't, I don't think that there are, that people are honestly reporting these things. I think they just pick them up from the environments that they're in. Um, well, they may think that they're honestly reporting them. The question is where yeah. they come from. Right. Exactly. I mean, and, and that happens in all sorts of communities. Right? I, don't, I don't want to say that it's unique yeah. to evangelical ones, but particularly I think it's, yeah, it's sort of concerning when it's it's so important that you have one of these and like you're asked about on your application and so forth. So it's core to your identity that you have this story. And, you know, uh, one one can question exactly, you know, w where all this sort of comes from. Like like if there's a, a culture that you fit in that says that you you need to have this sort of uh, experience and it has to have a certain form. Um, well, like you're going to come up with something, aren't you? <laughs> and you're going to feel bad if you don't have that. I know that it's, it's sort of similar in Mormon sphere. It's a little different. Like you don't have a date of conversion in the same way. Uh, I think most Mormons, well, yeah, some Mormons do, but you don't, you don't like you're expected to have that, but you, sorry, you're not expected to have like a specific date, right? But you're expected to have certain experiences that you can share. So um, yeah. And I think that can, that can lead to a lot of problems when people, people's experience doesn't necessarily conform with that. And then they're like, well, what's wrong with me kind of thing. And you, you've you try, done. You try to fit whatever you had to to the mold, which is what you know what happened to me. That's that's what I was going to say. I think you've done some podcast episodes where you look into some of the psychology behind this. I think I forget which mm. episodes, but I think they were ones maybe on memory and psychological studies. So I think where you looked at like the Ash conformity experiments was that was yeah, that yeah, one yeah. of them, and another one where you were talking about like um, models of like schema representation, things like that. So pe like people confuse their experiences with like a particular schema that they've been provided with for interpreting events. And so, and so they kind of get that they, they kind of layer the schema into their recollection then later of things that happened. And yeah, that's what kind of happens with some of these narrative devices. Um, okay. So, so they, they share a common story. They grew up in evangelical homes as teenagers and began asking um, tough questions that Kathy Ross was talking about. They didn't want to believe what wasn't true, um, and they were ready to give up their Christianity if necessary. I mean, that, how many times do we hear these things? Mostly parents and pastors just told them to have more faith and to be patient, which only made it worse. Uh, but somewhere along the line, someone gave them a book like Reasonable Faith or Scaling the Secular C City, which are books by um, Craig and Moreland, both teaching in the philosophy MA program at Biola. Finally, in those pages, someone was taking the nagging questions seriously and putting forth satisfying answers. At Biola, therefore, Craig and Moreland aren't just teachers to their students. In many cases, these men saved their faith. Uh, while Biola's philosophy department takes aim at the secular academy, the apologetics program promulgate uh, the apologetics pro program promulgates Christian philosophy to the culture at large. It's headquartered off campus in an especially drab strip mall alongside Korean storefront churches, a Christian bookstore, a supply outlet for firefighters and a Chinese carryout place with suspiciously low prices. The office has no permanent sign, just a torn sheet of paper taped to the glass door that says Biola University Apologetics. I went there to see Craig Hazen, the program's director, whose office is in the back. I was led past stockpiled issues of the latest Philosophia Christi, the Evangelical Philosophical Society's journal that Hazen edits, and past the cubicles of assistants and coordinators. I walked by the office of Clay Jones, whose prepared defense computer program makes rebuttals to skeptics' arguments only a mouse click away. Uh, water was coming in from the roof at the time, so Tox has been laid in strategic places. If Hazen kept his office doors shut for too long, it would become unbearably hot inside. Fortunately, most apologetic students don't actually see this place. They take their courses on the campus or online. H uh, Hazen makes himself seem born for the job. Having my recorder in front of him switched on with a grin that squinted in his eyes and never completely left his face. He translates the department's peculiar circumstances together with the religion it promulgates into enthusiasm that's both contagious and a little suspect. 
One reason we're this funny stepchild on campus is we're budgeted so differently from everybody else, he explains. It's much more entrepreneurial. He's expected to recruit his own students, many of whom are mid-career professionals rather than traditional graduate students coming straight out of college. Some are inmates in prisons. They can work towards master's degrees or just a certificate, and they don't have to bother with as many requirements as in the philosophy program. Many students pick up the entrepreneurial book too and start apologetics ministries and websites of their own. More than one, once around ca campus, I was asked if I know HTML. The apologetics program's speciality is putting on high-profile lectures and debates at Biola at churches around the country. We're always thinking about how to do things that grab attention, says Hazen. It's been really fun for us eggheads. They've assembled an all-star cast of faculty. So, so another thing that we can talk about as well is, you know, the kind of idea of celebrity amongst apologists and the kind of hero worship that goes on, you know, how people are promoted to celebrity status if they're lucky. And there's a kind of mythology around them of almost like sainthood that develops in, you know, amongst apologetic circles. Um, the most are in reality little more than occasional appointments. Their ranks include intelligent design royalty like Philip E. Johnson and William Dembski. On, on loan from the Discovery Institute. There's also Lee Strobel, once a reporter, then a pastor at Saddleback Church, now a full-time apologist who has sold millions of, of copies of books like The Case for a Creator, The Case for Christ. It's also worth noting that he was a pastor at Saddleback Church 10 years before he wrote The Case of, for Christ and then In the Case for Christ frames it as if he's like a skeptic who's looking for answers. Um, kind of samples of- What would he have to gain from doing things like that? Like, I don't, what would, what would anyone have to gain from lying about their experience? It's, yeah, whatever. Kenneth Samples, a Biola graduate and the resident philosopher at Reasons to Believe is on the list too. These are the kinds of people the program is trying to produce more of, smart, creative Christians ready to go out into the world and stand their ground with proofs. Um, so, uh, and then, he kind, of, he kind of talks here about um, Hazen probably want, wouldn't want to hear how much he reminded me of the new atheists. By the middle of the 21st century's first decade, this cadre had hung uh, a very public effigy of God from a string of best-selling books, websites, and related enterprises. Yet they bear no small resemblance to the schemers at Biola. They're sick of faith by faith alone, and they want to believe only what is plainly, evidently, and exactly true. Um, Either religious, religion's most daring claims about the universe are correct or they aren't. The minor difference between the two camps, which makes all the difference, is where they actually come out on the big question. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on this section at all. When, when did you say this was written? 2013, I think, is that safe? I, th I think around then. Um, well, there's is a, there, is there the a, a... Oh, yeah, 2013. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, new atheism is... Well, I don't want to say dead, but like it's no one really cares about it anymore. So the major, some of the major yeah. figures are still around, but I, it's you know moved off into like uh, um, political uh, issues and um, uh, you know culture wars and stuff like that. Uh, there's some interesting YouTube videos actually about this, about uh, what happened sort of to the YouTube atheists and and some of the history there. But it's interesting how that movement sort of uh, flourished and then um, transformed into other things. Um, I, but I think one point about the uh, new atheists or let's say rationalists and others uh, of, of similar mindset and and the least sort of evangelical apologist or, or many of the evangelical apologists is that they are in a sense um products of the enlightenment like they're very rationalist focused and very um um yeah very, very concerned about like providing rigorous foundations for things and evidential and and so forth and that's that's a very specific approach to faith right which is not like particularly like Eastern um, Eastern traditions of Christianity tend to, from what I've heard, no expert there, but tend to not approach things in quite the same way. So yeah, I, I think it's interesting that um, yeah, th th there are some commonalities between the um, the way that yeah, like the uh, industrial sorry, the apologetics industrial complex and the some of the sort of skeptics and atheists, including myself, I'd put myself in that category, uh, sort of uh, sort of approach things, which is part of the reason I think that they spend so much time sort of talking to each other and not as much time being listened to by the the public at large, like relatively speaking. Because because most people, even most religious people, although apologetics has a lot of influence, even so, it's still like a small voice relative to like global Christianity. Um, and most Christians are not interested in apologetics. So, um, yeah, there's, I don't know, there, there's that little interesting synergy there between between those two sides. So I think one of the things that's interesting as well is this guy talking about how 
the you know the budgeting for the apologetics department being so different from everybody else and just how like entrepreneurial the program is um you know how focused on marketing and generating revenue and things like that it, it seems to be um which again goes into you know how is the how the apologetics industrial complex functions how there's so much because they kind of sell this problem to people that they need to be rational they need to have all these reasons to believe in their Christianity and so forth and then they essentially recruit people who pay for it to do all these credit hours through the programs um, and buy all the books and so forth and so that's how there's this kind of that's partly how at least there's this inordinate amount of money involved in apologetics it, it, things like this. Um, okay, so what was there was another point that was interesting, where he talks about going to an e an evangelical philosophical society um, meeting. Oh, he talks about a debate here that he went to between Craig and Dawkins uh, for the evangelical philosophers, the apologetics Wait, industry. When did Craig debate Dawkins? Was Apparently, there an earlier debate? Because I know that he, sorry, yeah. uh, Craig refused, no, Dawkins refused to debate Craig back in, I don't know, like 2014 or something. Maybe it was a bit earlier, like around this time. Yeah. He took, he, um, so the only time William Lane was Craig, one. The, the only time William Lane Craig has faced Dawkins in a debate was on November the 13th, 2010, during okay, so, yeah. La Ciudad de la Ideas. I, I mean, that's a good Spanish pronunciation, a three-day all-star conference in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, Dawkins had already refused to debate Craig. I'm busy, he had said, but the events organizer, the Mexican television personality, Andres Roma, uh, convinced him to take part. The question at hand, does the universe have a, pur have a purpose? Um, so it was after a boxing match between Manny Pacquiao and, Ma Manny Pacquiao and Antonio Margarito. So Apparently after that, they used the stage and that and it had like 10 million people tune in. Um, okay, but the, the, there are some interesting quotes. I didn't quotes. know about that. Yeah. The, there's an inter interesting quote from Craig later that I think you'll like, by the way. But um, for, for the evangelical philosophers, the apologetics industry uh, and the hobbyists who carry on endless arguments in online forums, Craig is the knight, champion and gladiator. He never loses his cool. At the podium, his face alternates between a beaming smile at an earnest brow brow furled thinking man's focus. He has an answer to every challenge and a quotation to support it in his notes. He stands before a fortress of seemingly incorruptible orthodoxy, and he looks good defending it. Um, so he talks about you know how Craig Craig started debating in high school even before he was born again a Christian. The neuromuscular disease he suffers from meant that he couldn't be much of an athlete but he realized that he could make a name for himself on the debate team. Competitions took, took him all over Illinois. When he went to college, uh, when he went to college, he continued debating there, four years in high school, four years in college. But it wasn't until finishing his PhD in philosophy that he realized what the training had been preparing him for. That was when Christian clubs on college campuses began inviting him to debate atheists. It was wonderful, he says. I was thrilled to be able to do it again as a means of sharing the gospel. In Craig's mind, this is his purpose, this is the purpose of his life and of all history, to ratchet up the tally of souls who've made a decision for Christ, trading an eternity of punishment for everlasting happiness and enjoyment of God. To this end, he debates. Past opponents accuse him of being a charlatan or a sophist. Some of them have told me he's an outright liar. They say he uses tricks, but really he does just about the same thing every time. Boo-hoo, poor atheist, Craig wrote, once wrote on his website. Big bad Bill Craig has debate training, and that's why they can't even mount a decent response to the same five arguments I've been putting out for 20 years. <laughs> and obviously, he's engaged with the best of his critics as well, including uh, James's book, Unreasonable. <laughs> yeah, I've, re I've read that quote before. I mean, I sort of agree with him, but um, in that... A lot of the people that Craig has faced, I, I don't think, uh, have been sufficiently prepared or um, uh, practiced in, uh, in in giving their responses. That being said, I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't been shy in in criticizing Craig on the basis not only of his arguments but also of his of his tactics. Uh, and I do think that he uses a lot of dodgy tactics, including things like um, providing quotes that sound like they support his position when they don't or um, quotes out of context, just like appealing to authorities for the sake of it, which is misleading. Um, sounding like that he's responding to an argument, whereas in fact he's, he really doesn't, um, but in a way where he can get away with it because 
uh, he he plays the time of the debate where well if the opponent doesn't have the chance to call him out on it then um, uh, then he can get away with it um, uh, among other things that that he does as well as just using inconsistent arguments that people don't call him out for because they uh, they only have an expertise in like one area but anyway I mean again from Craig's point of view I, I don't think he really cares about this because the debates are just like the arguments it's just to um, uh, another way of getting um, uh, of getting the um, of, of credibility effectively. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter if that comes from sophistry or from good argument or a combination of both. I don't think Craig's too concerned about that. Um, so the author of the book said when he's with Richard Dawkins, you know, that he's spent some time with William Lane Craig and that made Dawkins uh, irritable. Why are you publicizing him? <laughs> uh, why, why are you publicizing him? Dawkins demanded of me. Whose side are you on? Uh, what I kept noticing amongst these comb combatants in either camp, however, is that their, sim is their similarity rather than their difference. In almost all respects evident to a superficial observer compared to the general population, William Lane Craig with Richard Dawkins, Hugh Ross with Michael Shermer, Ray Comfort with, say, the flying spaghetti monster, I can't help uh, wishing when I'm with either group of gladiators that they're both wrong, uh, that there's some sort of heaven they can enjoy together apart from the rabble. For now, the closest thing is a god debate. Um, so <laughs> So he talks here about going to the an evangelical philosoph ph philosophical societies conference in 2010. Um, so I think that this is fairly interesting. So at the dinner together with Alvin Plantinga, Craig and his wife Jan, uh, he met a pastor who had been elected president of the powerful Southern Baptist Convention. So that, I guess this alludes to like how the, these different communities kind of network with one another as well. Um, Back and forth, we went between Atlanta and Marietta for two nights. Uh, and now we've got ca the Capturing Christianity conferences, right, which can do the same sorts of things. Um, apologetics conference this year with the theme, set forth your case. <laughs> the proceedings in the sanctuary were emceed by Craig himself wearing a starched white shirt which cufflinks with, with cufflinks, bright red suspenders, uh, and a darker red tie. There was an American flag pin on the lapel of his navy, navy blue blazer. Um, he he praised the church ladies who helped organize the event in an in Anselmian terms. A greater cannot be conceived. Uh, <laughs> um, so Alvin Plantinga delivered the first keynote. More than once, it was said that here stood the Christian, the the greatest Christian philosopher alive today, and the audience plied him with applause. By the end of his talk, as he got to the to the numbered propositions and symbols, people became noticeably restless. And later I heard couples laughing about, about it to each other, gesturing that it, it had gone over their heads. But all the more could they appreciate that there was a giant in their midst. So I, I, I highlighted this because I think it's interesting. I do think that this is the sort of, this is talks about the sort of role that a, um, philosophy can play, where symbols and propositions that can, can all be put forward in a way that, again, looks really plausible and deep and sophisticated and it it all goes over the head of the kind of lay person that it's supposed to convince but then you know rest assured they can appreciate you know there's a a real philosophical giant who's done this work and things like that and i think that's the kind of role that these things um actually actually do play um, well the symbols are there to reassure you that they know what they're talking about that's yeah. that's why they're there right they're not they're not there so that you can understand them or to convince anyone yeah yeah they're, re they're reassuring because even as Plantinga himself notes, right? Plantinga himself notes that this isn't that his modal ontological argument isn't convincing for people who don't already agree with the conclusion, right? Which, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the the modal, yeah, that's a particularly bizarre one. Um, so the overriding message every, every speaker harped on again and again was that there are reasons for this faith. Uh, there is evidence, no blind leaping as Craig Hazen, who was also one of the conference's chief organizers, puts it. And tell your friends. Um, Hazen assured the audience, you don't have to be Alvin Plantinga to make a nuisance of yourself in a public space. He told jokes about his graduate work at, godless, uh, at a godless secular university. So here's another one of these tropes, you know, like the sec godless secular university in the same department where, I, where the author had studied, actually, with some of the same teachers. People burst out laughing at every beat. Um, Hazen, the entrepreneur, is also a gifted performer. Uh, so, you know, you've got confident Christianity. You've got another niche here met by someone called Mary Jo Sharp. She has an apologetics degree from Biola and a ministry called Confident Christianity. Sharp told me that she had always been a tomboy and had always demanded reasons. 
She became a Christian only as an adult. My background leads me to disbelieve rather than to believe, she said. But in Christianity, she found a great knowledge tradition. Um, so she, she has a particular niche. I've never been in a... I've never been in a room with so many professors who have their name.com websites. The academic business just doesn't really pay that much. And anything you can do to sell a book here or there is really helpful, Hazen told me. Um, so, th so this is the kind of um, capitalism Christianity uh, that, that I kind of criticize apologetics for. V various modes of com communication just help to further the cause. He had made sure to use his time off stage, for example, to mention his own latest book, an apologetics novel, snaking around the bookstore with a long, slow line that ended where Plantinga sat as he signed copies of God, Freedom and Evil and Warranted Christian Belief. Um, OK, so so this is uh, we, some, some of the success stories, right, of these apologists. But I think the, the last thing from this book just to mention is so the cases where it does, where, where people don't succeed and the more kind of predatory side of these things. So um, on, on the sidewalk, I stepped out to leave one of these sessions. I was joined by a trim and cheerful man in glasses with bits of gray showing through his hair. Uh, having seen my name, name tag, he identified me as a journalist and addressed me. Um, he was a freelance apologist up in Canada. He'd undergone a training program in England and he had and he and his wife had sold everything they owned, but now he was having difficulty paying the bills. Uh, the question, so, but, so that's some money, you know, some money in those numbers for how much reasonable faith and Biola and all these places sort of make it, a, a stories like this, where people who are genuinely convinced that they need these things in their life are making like bad decisions to, to go and do these programs, to find these reasons to defend the faith. Uh, the questions turned back to me again. What do my parents think about what I do about this book I'm writing? Do they share my faith? What does my mother think? I told him about the tolerance that's so central to her kind of faith. He asked what I pray about for her, for her salvation. I pray for all our salvation, I said. What about you, he said, stopping where he stood, eyes to eyes. You don't know with certainty you're saved. He sounds like he had just heard an especially shocking piece of gossip. Uh, he, ha he had his in. He, he had me concerned. Uh, from there, his friendly friendliness got far more aggressive. He asked me to look into his eyes while he informed me of God's love. <laughs> we can all use the reminder, I know, but somehow there, there and then, I wasn't feeling it. He said in Backbeat Staccato, don't you think God in his perfect love wants you to know of your salvation and by implication, the cursedness of others? My experience of that love is imperfect, I tried to say, just like my logic, just like my reason. I tried to say thank you and wished him well, well in his, I almost said business. <laughs> but for minutes more he wouldn't let me go trying to catch me in biblical and philosophical traps so that here's the role of apologetics here trying trying to assure me of my mother's damnation and my own salvation all with furious blue-eyed love and more backbeat spoken word so the reason i wanted to highlight this is is again how this industry of apologetics sort of distorts people's um capacity to treat other people as ends in themselves as humans as uh, just to generally be nice to them, to in intellectually explore. And, and I think you see this in the branding of, you know, like Cameron's uh, blazer or uh, jumper that he sells. It says, by the way, I might talk about apologetics at any moment. I mean, that's the sort of jumper that someone like this would wear and where it makes you want to kind of run away because you're not going to have a good conversation with someone in that case. But yeah. Yeah, very interesting, uh, very interesting um, experiences there. Nothing really surprises me to be honest that there is there's another section from another book i did want to look at but instead of us just like going through books i don't know if you want to jump around and there's anything you want to present for a bit james or talk about just to... uh well where are we up to in the in the document here in the document we're just up to um section 1d where i i the book evangelicals incorporated in commercial religion um, there was a section that I wanted to look into. Yeah, let, but I don't let's know just if... go through that. Then the, okay. the things I want to present are sort of coming up and probably won't take too long. Okay. So let me... Uh, I could only find this book. I couldn't get a PDF of it. So I've only got the Kindle version, which is kind of frustrating. But um, let me go over to that. So this is this is a book someone wrote about the book industry amongst evangelicals. So where are we? We want to be in the introduction. And it is commercial religion. Here we go. 
Share screen. Hopefully people can see that. Oh, come on. Don't say, yeah, there we go. Uh, evangelicalism exemplifies what I describe as commercial religion, by which I refer primarily to forms of social organization commonly recognized as religion that take shape through the ideas, activities, and strategies that typify commercial capitalism. Oh, oh, one thing I'm going to preface with this book as well is there's a couple of criticisms of evangelical evangelicalism that it levies, such as it exemplifying whiteness, that I would disagree with. And have, like, I, I don't think whiteness is a useful term to criticize anything with, but I, I also think it has some some good criticisms in there as well. Um, commercial, so, so just so people know if I ever say the term, if I read the term whiteness, I don't really endorse that specific criticism. Though I do think that there's a criti criticism in the vicinity of, um, you know, a particular, uh, of the kind of capitalism and, and a particular kind of middle class cushy lifestyle that might be, that might be the, the target market of some of this um, evangelical book selling stuff. Well, when Com Craig talks about the importance of wrestling with these uh, fundamental texts for years, I mean, I don't know exactly if everyone is supposed to do that, but it wasn't very, uh, wasn't clearly clarified there. But I mean, it, that right I, yeah, I, reading, I can't like, help but feel there's Republic. a certain amount of detachment uh not detachment not the right word um uh, what's the word i'm looking for yeah. loss of um, um i know what you mean. being out of touch yeah, yeah that's it yeah i agree uh commercial religion involves more than the commodification of religion a phrase that both scholars and pundits have used to describe what they have seen is modern transformation of religions into commodities which people literally and metaphorically buy and sell typically portraying religions as traditions that adapt or succumb to market forces narratives of commodification often imply that religions can or should transcend the social context in which they are practiced by contrast, I understand religions as forms of social organization and authority that continually take shape through realms of social life that include commodities and their circulation. Terms like evangelicalism are abstractions that we use to refer to these forms. Recognizing the rich theological and devotional traditions that historians and theologians long have associated with the idea of evangelicalism, I argue that those traditions and associations continually have been drawn together through commercial technologies and initiatives, which have enabled consumers to cultivate shared ideas, practices and sensibilities across denominational, ecclesiastical and geographic contexts. Through bookstores, supermarket checkout aisles, television talk shows and more, a diverse spectrum of spiritual seekers have participated in evangelical markets. Although some critics argue that such expansive commercial activity has diluted, juvenilized, or otherwise corrupted what they understand as an evangelical tradition, this activity is what allowed evangelicalism to loom so large in American religious history and culture during the 20th century. While commercial activity has served as the spirit that has animated the incorporation of evangelicals, evangelicalism's social body, practices of profit making, branding, selling, financing, and marketing have served as fields of religious faith. At the heart of commercial activity is the pursuit of financial profit through devotion to the act of selling. Although humans perennially, perennially have sold goods of all kinds, Christians also have expressed persistent anxiety about the money and wealth that sales can generate. Many of the teachings attributed to Jesus in the New Testament have proven difficult for Christians to interpret and apply to their own context, and few imperatives have proven for more vexing than the injunction against serving both God and mammon, a term typically understood as money or material wealth. Although this teaching seems to explicitly condemn the parallel pursuit of God and money, Christians have spent 2,000 years asking and answering countless clarifying questions. What exactly does service to God or mammon entail? Is wealth truly antithetical to service to God? Or can one or, or can one sphere of service remain subservient to the other? Can money actually serve God? Answers to such questions have varied due to more than hermeneutical creativity or individual disingenuousness. Above all, answers have, have depended upon shifting conceptions of what constitutes service to God and service to mammon. Throughout the history of the evangelical book industry, its participants have sought to interpret and portray their commercial objectives and activities as forms of divine service. But those participants have not always agreed about how to understand or describe their effort. Consider a com conflict that took shape in 2005, pitting Rick Warren against the marketing professional Greg Stielstra. 
Before their disagreement took shape, Stielstra had served as a senior marketing director at Zondervan, one of the world's preeminent publishers of evangelical books, Bibles, and other media. Founded in 1931 in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Zondervan was purchased. Purchased? Per what even am I? Like my language processing modules are going all weird. Zondervan was purchased in 1988 by the media conglomerate News Corporation, which went on to own such media properties properties as Fox Broadcasting Company, Fox News Channel, and Wall Street Journal. Both before and after that acquisition, Zondervan published some of the best-selling titles of the 20th, 20, 20th and 21st centuries. In the 1970s, for instance, Zondervan's The Late Great Planet Earth became that decade's best-selling book, outselling uh, religious and non-religious books alike. Uh, blah, blah, blah blah, blah, blah. I don't know if any of this is actually important because I didn't do highlights, I don't think. Um, so anyway, you get you get the the picture that th this book is basically about about describing the the business motives of various companies that have sold books um, to evangelicals, the way that they've created such the way that they've tapped into certain markets, the way that they've shaped those markets through their advertising, through uh, the way that they've created certain problems and narratives in order to sell books about um, particular topics. And I mean, we can we can go into this more at certain certain points where it might be a bit more a bit more relevant. So I, I did do some highlights here because when we talk about Christian publishing, I think that this section on book people is quite useful. Um, so I'll stop that there, but I, I think that, that that's just useful to, to kind of preface or, or maybe maybe to round up some of the discussion on a, what's it called? What was the first section? Like, like a general overview of the evangelical industrial complex and, you know, how, how all the money stuff sits together behind the scenes and the universities and things like that. Um, so what do you want to do next, James? <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's uh, quite interesting. Actually, some of the some of the insights there. So, um, some of the stuff that I wanted to talk about, we've already touched on before, but maybe just flesh out a little bit. Um, and one of the themes was was Christian education and the the universities. Um, so I did a little bit of uh, googling, uh, and Wikipediaing about this. Um, so there is a, oh, I'm zoomed in here. There is a um, an organization called the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, actually. Maybe I can share here. Uh, where am I? Yeah, you don't need to say that. Yeah, so this was founded in, in 1976. One of the interesting things is that many of these institutions and, and bodies that we're looking at uh, uh, like can be traced to around the, about this time. Um, this corresponds roughly to the uh, the the Christian Renaissance in academia that uh, Craig and others talk about, which they date to like the late sixties, I think. Um, but anyway, so so this body here is, a, as I said, it's a global organization of evangelical Christian colleges and universities. I think that there's, yeah, about 180 uh, members, of which are about 150 are in the U.S. and Canada. Just to comment in in when we talk about funding a bit later, the thing about John Templeton, I think, highlights why there was this Christian Renaissance as well because a lot of that funding came from Templeton himself, but we can, mm. yeah. Yeah, um, so you can see here, I'm not gonna go through all of these that um, very largely, so most of these are private Christian colleges and universities, uh, mostly in the US, you can see here. Um, what's interesting is if you sort by um, the date that they joined, you can see that many of the more um, prestigious ones, you know, were, were already in existence at that time. Um, uh, like some of the ones I think that have been mentioned before, uh, Biola University. Um, uh, what was another one? Messiah University, uh, Wheaton College. Uh, I think there was another big one here. Anyway, um, and then, but th there's been a heap that have been, you, you can see it, the year here. Uh, this is not necessarily the year that uni was founded, but I think that th they're still, um, like, are still opening these universities um, or dramatically expanding them. Um, and it's just, I didn't, realize how, how many of them they are and in order to join this organization i think they have to have uh there's a fairly specific criteria they had i know i found it here yeah here it is um they have to be accredited comprehensive colleges so they're not just like a bible college but their missions have to be christ-centered and rooted in the historic christian faith so i i think there's some sort of 
statement of faith or something similar that they have to have to, to join this. Um, yeah, Christian mission. I don't know exactly what that, um, what that, uh, includes. Um, but you'll see that a lot of these universities have very specific, um, like statements of faith and other things that they have to, they have to, um, or that they require that their faculty and students, um, sustain. Now I went through here looking at some of the bigger um, colleges to see what their endowments are. Um, now by the standards of major public universities, um, the endowments are not necessarily enormous, but I think it is interesting to think about, um, well, like what sort of resources does this give to um, like evangelical Christianity as, as a movement when you have a university, like when you have comprehensive universities that have um, endowments of this sort. So Biola University, again, that's where, where Craig and quite a few others are. Um, their endowment is 154 million and they have nearly 500 academic staff. Um, other major ones, Harding University, 164 million, Wheaton College, 502 million, uh, Indiana West, uh, Wesleyan University, 201 million, um, John Brown University, 169 million. Uh, and, and many of these have several hundred academic staff, like Indiana Indiana Wesleyan University has about a thousand academic staff, or like Wheaton about, about 300, Harding about 300. So like these are big institutions. Um, and again, I think that unlike public universities, which generally just have a like a public interest research focus, which these universities do as well, but they also have an explicit mission of um, like, um, integrating, as we talked about before, integrating the their particular understanding of the gospel in like everything that they do and particular like statements of faith and things like that. So um, they're very well resourced. Um, in terms of in terms of statements of faith, one of the things that I found is um, many of these, well, pretty much all of these universities and think I think that they have to have it to be part of the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. Um, so they have some sort of code of conduct for their students, which includes um, pretty much always there's a, um, a prohibition on like extramarital sex and homosexual behavior. It seems that some universities even have um, a prohibition on like being publicly homosexual, although there's been, I think, pushed to sort of change that in the way that they approach these sorts of things. Um, but also something that interests me. So the other common things that were, I found listed were um, a apart from the, um, the sexual side of things was abstaining from tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs, gambling, profanity, uh, pornography, kind of obviously, and dancing, at least in some of them. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, I guess dancing is associated with like dating or sex or something. I don't, I don't really know why dancing is, is there, but, um, that's in addition to like, uh, statements of faith. And one of the, and like, so the point is you can be expelled for like violating these codes of conduct. Um, so it, it, they're like really serious about these sorts of things. And one of the things I found sort of interesting is that I just like, I didn't look up the codes of conduct directly. This was just based on like what was on Wikipedia. So maybe that what's included there is, is selective, although I, I don't entirely know. I don't have any reason to think that that's the case. So my question is like, why, why are these particular things included? Um, wh wh where has, like, what's the rationale for putting these things in the code of conduct? Like, because there's plenty of things that aren't in there in the code of conduct. Like, like, are students expected to tithe? Like, why is that not in the in the code of conduct? Like, I, maybe it is, but I, I've never heard that mentioned. Um, like, the, the point is, there's all sorts of things in, the, like, the New Testament that Jesus talks about and that Paul talks about in terms of, like, sins or, or virtues of a Christian that are just, like, not there, or at least that they don't seem to be talked about that much. Um so it just seems like weirdly culturally specific about the things that they're really worried about. Like they're really worried about the gays for some reason, even though like what, what, why the focus on that? Like, and, and pornography is like a real worry, but not, not all of these other things and like drugs as well. Like it's sex and drugs are the things that they seem really concerned about in their students. And then all of like the other things and eh, not so much maybe. So I, I just think that's weird. It seems to be more culturally determined than like, if you just read the New Testament, what would you get out of that? Um, so I think that that this is sort of uh, a point that sort of Nathan made before, and we've talked about is how culturally um, bound uh, these um, sort of institutions seem to be in a particular American version of Christianity, and sort of what that should look like, um, uh, and how like how that manifests on on uh, like a college campus. Um, now, there's a few. I think you might have put some of these links in, Nathan, about m most of these universities, well, 
a, a large number of these universities, if you look them up on Wikipedia, there's a section where it's like controversies, and then there'll be some faculty member who's like disciplined for not yeah. believing the right thing, or or for for publishing something about evolution, or or some scandal involving students who uh, like were expelled for being gay, or something like that. Like th this happens quite a lot, apparently. Not that there are or gay conversion, like with yeah, that's with another one, University. right? Uh, was there any not just gay conversion on those, Nathan? Well, I, one thing I was going to say is I did an interview with uh, I forgot Luke and I've got I think Luke Williamson, Luke Johnson. Oh, I've got his name wrong. I'm sorry, Luke, if you if you're listening into this, but he um, went to Liberty University and was put through was made to go through when he he expressed to like a Christian counselor that he was um, thinking maybe he was gay or having like homosexual feelings, and so was encouraged to go to one of these. Um, gay conversion therapy things at Liberty University, where he was then predated on by an in the closet gay guy who runs the sessions, who predated on like lots of other people in that context as well. And this is another thing with the, this controversy, con these controversies, where there seem there seems to be uh, th there's this kind of like you know being gay really really matters, and then there's this weird kind of questionable um, practice of conversion therapy that isn't like necessarily empirically attested to actually do what it's supposed to do um, or be, be efficacious or whatever. I, I can't think of words today for some reason. Um, but then there's the other problem that this environment seems to set up the the ideal environment for, for predators who actually are, you know, like gay and trying to, but trying to prey on people in non-consensual um, sort of situations. It's just, it's just really bizarre and weird that that happens. And I, you know, I did an interview with him if people want to check that out about his experiences there. Um, would now be a good time to talk about some of those other things with statements of faith where people have gone against them or do you want to talk about that in a moment? Oh yeah, sure. If you have any specific, I, I didn't have anything very specific to say about that other than that it seems a fairly common issue that this comes up. Well, there was, there was one specific, I was one I was going to just look at with um, just Pete Enns, who is, he's still a Christian, but he's a, he's a Bible scholar. Um, and I, I quite like some of his stuff. And, he did a book that I quite like called um, Inspiration and Incarnation, where he, talk, he talks in this book basically about how there are, about what inspiration means is kind of the main thesis of the book for Christians. And he talks about how there are these parallels between, um, you know, like Atrahasis and Enuma Elish and things, you know, like other ancient Near Eastern um, myths and the kind of stories like fl flood myths and things that and creation myths that can be found in the bible and he's like well how, sh how should christians understand inspiration in light of this so anyway uh, the result of him him holding some of these views and saying you know uh, saying well yeah the similarities aren't a coincidence like that that's part of the culture the cultural milieu in which the bible was written and so forth but that it went was that it went against um the statement of faith the high view of scripture as that Westminster Theological Seminary had. Th those astute viewers amongst you, by the way, will have noticed I'm using Wikipedia light mode where James uses Wikipedia dark mode. And so I apologize for this. Um, well, that's so, all right. We, we, we can't all be uh, on the right side of everything. <laughs> so yeah, ba basically they, they suspended him. Shouldn't it you be getting used to the dark, you know, Nathan, given where you're going to be going? <laughs> you know, it's not going to be light and white yeah, and nice yeah. there. <laughs> the outer darkness where I'll, I'll be knocking on the door endlessly let me in let me into the meal um so so basically we we have students who have read it and say it's liberated them we have other students who say that it's crushing their faith and removing that them from their hope we have churches that are considering it and two presbyteries have said that they will not send students to study under Professor Enns here as a result of his views the general content of inspiration and incarnation was taught by ends over his 14 year teaching career at Westminster Theological Seminary. It was only after the book's publication in 2005 that a lengthy controversy ensued in the wake of major administrative changes, most notably the election of Peter Lillibach as president in 2005. The main point of contention was whether the book was within the theological boundaries of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Westminster faculty members uh, take an oath that their teaching will be in line with that confession. Um, so basically, he, he was suspended on that basis. He had to find um, employment elsewhere, which he has done now. And then another controversy that he wrote about were some of these things to do with... Um, what was it? 
like a, like an evolution one. So this is Pete Enns writing on his blog about one of these things to do with what one of these issues to do with evolution. Um, at this place called Bryan College over e evolution, uh, the the college boards voted to clarify the college's original statement on human origins from that the origin of man was by fiat of God in the act of creation as related in the book of Genesis, that he was created in the image of God, that he sinned and thereby incurred physical and spiritual death. To this, we believe that all humanity is descended from Adam and Eve. They are historical persons created by God in a special formative act and not from previously existing life forms. Uh, I suppose one could call this clarification, though a critical mass of faculty and students see this as shifting goalposts. Those who do not sign this new statement of faith will be, according to um, the college's president, rejecting the college's, the college's offer of employment. Which, which college is this? Sorry. I, I missed, um, this is Bryan College. Bryan College. Um, let's see if it's actually in this. I assume it's probably. No, I don't see it listed here, but um, so, um, what was I going to say about that? Yeah, so those. I, I, so I think most of these colleges don't have specifically creationist statements of faith, although some of them may do. But, but what I was interested in is if you scroll up there, I don't know when the original statement was from. Um, this that one. Original yeah. statement. Yeah, I don't know how old that is, right? But see, to, that reads to me as a theological statement about the relationship between God and man, right? Um, whereas this right. second statement is entirely reactionary to a mostly 20th century debate about like the relationship between evolutionary science and yeah <laughs> uh, and and interpretation of genesis like it it it, it just feel i don't know how to express it exactly it just feels really lame and lackluster and not and, and actually much less relevant to christianity than the formal one <laughs> I, I, I yeah yeah I agree. I, it's another thing i just i just don't get it like what wh why is that so important to them that that you know that they were not previous sorry they were not from previously existing life forms as opposed to that we were created in the image of god and that you know we we sinned and occurred in death like surely that's more relevant to the message of christianity but because they're so i'm saying because they're so bound up in these sort of culture war stuff and they're they're so paranoid about students doubting because of evolution you know they're they're going to make this part of well they have made this part of their statement of faith and to, to try to squeeze it out of the university basically yeah. ba literally saying that they'll sack anyone who doesn't accept this yeah yeah that's a rejection of our offer of employment um and so, and, and Pete Enns makes the point, you know, that um, it normally takes about 18 months in a good job market to find a new teaching position. Um, it seems like the lead leadership might not have thought this one through. And then he says, on the other hand, maybe they did because, uh, so, so some, some have resigned because of this clarification and students have enacted various forms of protest. Um, the Student Government Association quoted the article we believe that the current motion will alienate faculty, uh, blah, 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 and so on. So at least there's some people behind it. They sound like a bunch of bright young people. Perhaps as telling as anything about what is happening on campus is um, the president's public comment, as reported in this article, that faculty administration relations were solid. Given what we see above, that claims like that claim sounds like a bit of a stretch to me. Still others have hired a lawyer, and in my very non-legally expert opinion, though I do watch CSI occasionally, it sounds to me like they have a case, at the very least concerning the timing of the clarification and how current fa faculty members are expected to respond. Much depends, however, on what the school's governing documents say about the, the lead time faculty are obliged uh, to get from administration. I know how hard it can be for institutions to re-examine issues that were crucial to why they were founded in the first place, but still on the issue of human origins, age of the earth, etc. I do think it is time to move past fear and protecting of theological boundaries and join an adult conversation that's been going on now for several generations. Um, and then he talks about how people from Biologos, um, you know, have good ways to reconcile this, how um, most people in some survey don't support the decision and so on uh, so so this is just to point out you know here's one example of one of these controversies controversies and here's just another example to do with religious pluralism i guess people might be more sympathetic towards this one um but this is someone who got suspended the, the well actually isn't that this is what catholics believe as well and we we haven't talked catholics do believe that muslims have the same god actually as christians um and yeah this is a very interesting case i was just looking at this uh and we haven't talked much about because what you were talking about with the um or what was it called the cccu or whatever that was to do with like even an evangelical form of christianity and we haven't talked about you know that 
the institution the institutions established by catholics which you know have long histories that go back across europe and the university system in europe which is ha has a, a long catholic history and those universities which are explicitly catholic and those high schools which are explicitly yeah so catholic. these evangelical industrial complex is like you know a century old and the the big expansion of it's really like 50 years old now the catholic education system is like 500 years old and way more international right. well outside of my knowledge sphere so yeah that's one of the reasons we're not talking about it as much but yeah some people have pointed out in chat that that's really big as well but it's also complicated because uh, yeah that you know there's some catholic like there's a lot of catholic schools where i live in melbourne for example in australia some of them are like actually catholic and some of them are just pretty nominal catholic so it, it i think that there's a lot of very variability in these things and people are commenting that some um some um like seminaries will uh, will um or uh what's the word i'm looking for uh jesuit seminaries will even have like non-believers there and it's, right. i think it's a lot of, i think it's really variable at least that's my impression but anyway um so yeah let's play play this little news report then about this one a professor at a christian college is responding with love after being suspended for expressing beliefs that christians and muslims worship the same god Dr. Larisha Hawkins had already received attention at Wheaton College for choosing to wear a hijab during the Advent season to, quote, live out my faith in solidarity with my neighbor, who is a Muslim. The college says her paid administrative leave has nothing to do with her hijab, but, quote, her recently expressed views, including that Muslims and Christians worship the same God, appear to be in conflict with the college's statement of faith. All faculty and staff at the private institution must accept that statement upon employment. Prior to her suspension, Hawkins expressed love for naysayers who questioned her faith. After her suspension, she quoted 1 Corinthians 13, 13 in saying, Faith, hope, and love, these remain, but the greatest of these is love. A number of Wheaton students have shown love for Hawkins by protesting the university's decision. Even more supporters have signed a petition on change.org. So that's just it was a another example, I suppose, of, of how these statements of faith kind of get weird. How, how tone deaf do these people at Wheaton College? When, was, when did this happen, by the way? Uh, 2015? I saw a date yeah. there. I didn't see. Oh, well, anything. someone was holding up Black Lives Matter, so it can't be that long ago. Um, 2015, yeah. Yeah, to, to, I mean, don't want to make it too, like, political, but to to, to suspend a, um, a, you know, a person a of, woman color. of color from a, a Christian college because she said or expressed the view that Christians and Muslims, like like an interfaith kind of uh, dialogue kind of claim and it, it is standing in solidarity, like, you, you basically, it's, it's like that sketch from... Um, Oh, I forgot. Oh, are we the baddies? What's that from? Um, yeah, uh, Mitchell and Webb. That yeah, Mitchell and Webb. That's the one. Yeah, it's like, are we the baddies? Like, <laughs> why? Why do you do this? Like, you just anyway. It's just weird. Also, this point about um, Christians and um, Muslims worshiping the same God. I didn't even realize this. This was controversial when I was a Mormon. I mean, I, I actually can't speak to what other Mormons think, but I'd always thought that Mormons and other Christians and Muslims all, all worship the same God. Granted, they have different beliefs about about that God, but. Um, I don't understand why some subset of, of evangelicals find this so, like, almost an abhorrent idea. Um, the the idea that, well, it can't be the same God because they don't believe in the Trinity would also rule out Jews worshipping the same God. And I would really love to hear the theological gymnastics that would justify the statement that Jews and Christians don't believe in the same God. <laughs> so uh, the argument makes no sense at all to me. And so I don't know how Wheaton College can say that this contradicts the statement of faith, unless the statement of faith explicitly says, like, we do not believe in the same God as the Muslims, which I doubt. It probably just mentions the Trinity. And apparently you can't even think that other people can believe in a God without believing in the Trinity, like that that has to change the reference. It's just bizarre. I just, again, I, so tone deaf and so focused on this minutia that I don't even know why it matters. I just, I don't get it. There's just, just a really weird culture around some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so that, that, yeah, those, those are a couple of, Oh, by the way, someone sort of mentioned this in chat and this is, this is my speculation. Um, the, 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 the administration said it had nothing to do with her wearing a hijab. And I, I sort of believe that that wasn't the, the official reason. Right. However, given the, the strong cultural, um, impetus and norms and background of many of these people. I bet it made a lot of people uncomfortable to see her wearing a hijab at that university. Um, cause it feels like counter cultural in terms of like counter Christian cultural. Right. Um, and, and I bet, I bet that that was sort of relevant. At least it, it made people feel uncomfortable and they didn't like that. Now I'm not saying that was the official reason given or anything like it wasn't right. But I, you know, I, I suspect that a lot of this is about like maintaining a particular vision of what it is like to be a Christian and what they want 
like Christianity to look like in the US. Uh, and, and wearing hijabs in solidarity with Muslims just, just feels, I suspect, again, this is just my guess, I suspect that that makes a bunch of the people there feel very uncomfortable. And so they didn't like that, even if that wasn't the official stated reason. So what was it? What's the next topic um, from our list that you want to go into? Is there one or do you want me to pick? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So uh, ah, random pain in my hands. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we talked about statements of faith. Um, yeah. So a, a little bit on non-accredited programs, of which there are many. Um, I didn't really have too much to say about this unless um, you wanted to mention uh, Trinity College. Uh, I well, I thought one, one thing I here. did want to do. Um, oh, and fake degrees from uh, Ravi Zachariah. Yeah. So, so actually, there was there was a Christian channel who recently made a video about this as well, criticizing James White. Um, Many of the and so I'll quickly play a few points from this. I won't play the whole thing. Is really really difficult, which is why we are extending this over several parts. However. In the last couple of days, a controversy in the apologetics community has emerged concerning the fake Doctor of Theology degree of James White, director of Alpha and Omega Ministries. Now, why would anyone want a fake degree? Well, real degrees are so hard and so slow and so expensive. So it is very tempting to buy a diploma that validates my own self-assessment of my abilities so I can call myself doctor. This became an issue once again when James White criticized David Pullman as someone you shouldn't listen to because Pullman works at... David Pullman, who is who you've debated, by the way, James, on uh, foundationalism. <laughs> and and yeah, I he's a really nice that, guy. And, and, this, and, and an intelligent guy as well. And I, th I think he's got more interesting to say, things to say about Christianity than James White, at least from my understanding of both of their positions. But... Um, so this this is a criticism of fake degrees coming from a Christian channel, and so like you know I I appreciate that, um, and so hopefully Christians who might be watching bad apologetics and feel like their backs are up against the wall a bit in, in the sense that we're delivering some criticisms here can actually see that the you know there's criticisms from their own side of the practice of the kind of fake degree mills and things like that um, that go on in in Christian circles. At Dillard's department store, essentially he poisoned the well by bringing up a piece of irrelevant information that tried to undercut Palmer's argument. Now, when he did this, White's own academic credentials suddenly became an issue once again. The problem is that White earned his THD, his Doctor of Theology, at a diploma mill called Columbia Evangelical Seminary. Dave Armstrong, in a Pathos.com blog, summarized White's defense of not pursuing a traditional doctorate in 10 points. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go out through each of those points that were summarized by Armstrong, showing White's reasoning and why it is so flawed. And I hope this shows why you should never get a fake degree from a diploma mill. Now so, so yeah, the, so in, the, in this video, he responds to the, the rationalizations that White provides as to why um, he was justified in getting that kind of degree. So. Um, the first point was many many of these accredited the uh, the, the accredited theological institutions are theologically liberal. Oh, uh, those liberals! Imagine studying with people that you don't always agree with. Like, what a shocking concept! Like, can you imagine that? Oh my goodness! Uh, accreditation works similarly for similarly for religious and secular schools, which ought not be so. What did he mean by that? What do you mean it ought not to be so? Oh, he means the, the yeah, government should be process special. of accreditation. Yeah, right. Yeah. They should have lower standards because everyone knows that religious institutions <laughs> can't be held to the same rigorous standards as secular education. <laughs> That's silly. Um, three, he found his own private studies to be more fruitful. Uh, he didn't want to close his ministry and uproot his family and wanted to stay close to his aging parents. That's a good reason. Uh, well, it, it's a good reason, but maybe it should just not not a good reason. Getting a I think you know, yeah. not a good reason to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. get a degree from it's, a diploma. Yeah. It's a good reason not to get a traditional degree. Not like, to get sometimes a degree. there are more important <laughs> yeah. things in yeah. life. Yeah, right. Um, expenses of a con uh, of conventional higher education were probative. Uh, he was already a published author with some influence. That is a very weird reason. 
I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I, I'm better than this, right? Um, yeah, he, right. He could design his own curriculum. This is another I'm better than this reason. Um, he could do a dissertation on the Trinity for the benefit of the person in the pew rather than an elite cadre of scholars. I get this is I, I find this motif quite interesting where it's like it's almost like that I'm with the working people type thing, right? Rather than and, and I agree I, that I, academic theology can be um it can it can be very detached, but at, at least I think it's worth engaging with those ideas and then rejecting it, right? In order to make sure that you're not rather than just saying I'm better again, I'm better than that, I'm with the working people kind of thing. Um and especially when when white, I I don't think that I think this is don't think this is entirely consistent with White's general behaviors and how he holds himself up to be you know like an academic scholar who understands the 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 high level issues as well, which he clearly doesn't because he you know like he had that debate with Craig for example where he tried to talk about the grounding problem for Molinism which he didn't understand at all. Yeah, I haven't Weiss engaged him very much, but like oh sorry, uh, engaged with his material very much, but he doesn't strike me as the sort of person who is really trying to make themselves accessible to the layperson. Like, I feel like I often find it hard to understand what he's trying to get at. Like I can get that from Frank Turek, right? He is making that kind of appeal, right? But yeah, I don't know. Uh, he says the the seminary where he got his degree from was too young to be accredited. And uh, a person's scholarship is not determined by the name of the school he or she attended, but by the quality of that person's writing, speaking and teaching. Yeah, okay, so if we take that seriously, what's the point of reasons one to nine? Yeah. Like, if, it feels super redundant. Like, if you don't, if it's not an issue, then say this, and then don't make the other nine excuses. Like, seriously, this is like catching the kid with their hand in the cookie jar. Maybe it's not exactly like that, but then asking, like, what's going on? And they just rattle out all these excuses. Like, there's <laughs> all over the place from money to they had family problems to, oh, well, it was too liberal and the, the standards are too unfair and I wanted to be a man in the street and I didn't need it anyway. Like, it's every reason you could possibly think of. Um, uh, as to why he didn't do it like seriously it's a bit pathetic like just say you couldn't be bothered and you had other things going on which i mean i assume that was legit right i um, just wanted the of course he could have done it later right i mean i don't but whatever but yeah like he had time for all this other stuff but he could never get around to you know doing a proper degree you can do these things part-time and like there's so many options but no he it, it was just impossible and there's plenty of conservative places where he could have studied but no they're all too liberal and it's just really pathetic like i don't even really like i kind of agree with this like if you're saying useful stuff and informative things that's really what counts right you sh except you shouldn't misrepresent yourself it's like he wants to say this but then at the same time well he's got he's got to have an accreditation right like i mean it might be fake right but you know <laughs> you have to have something to to to, to prop it up right so I, I feel like that that's inconsistent if you want to own this this point here then say yeah you know i don't have a traditional accreditation yeah why I think why get a degree at all <laughs> why even why get, why get a fake one, one? <laughs> <laughs> it, it completely undermines this point so that that's what really annoys me the the pathetic excuses and the inconsistency here um so then a second thing i wanted to look at on this point is so this this is the wikipedia page on um trinity <laughs> yeah, we, we just needed to see my tummy hurts <laughs> <laughs> what oh sorry somebody oh on the cookie yeah hurts. sorry yeah. I, thought, I thought you saw that on the wikipedia page i was like what? <laughs> <laughs> um so so that, yeah this is this is where where braxton of trinity radio um is president and his father before so notice this was president. established in 1969 as well yeah yeah that's um, just, um, I, I, I focus on that just because I think it's interesting to have a bit of a timeline here. You'll notice, as I said before, that many of these dates are approximately the same period. Uh, oh, and that, so they even have. Well, I don't understand exactly what this is. Like, it's not, oh, is it, it says it's located in Indiana, but is it like a single institution or do they have like. Uh, uh, conservative Evangelical Bible College located near Indiana. I guess they so they have this single location. They offer distance education programs. Right, um, right. More than in two thousand six, Trinity claimed more than seven thousand active students worldwide. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so it, that is a lot for only seventy faculty. 
Um, in terms of accreditation, then, Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary is authorized and approved to grant degrees in the state of Indiana under Article 1, Sections 2, 3, and 4 of the Indiana State Constitution and is recognized uh, as a 501c3 organization as stated in the IRS Letter of Determination, something 1970. In January 1992, Trinity achieved accreditation with National Association of blah, 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 um, a now defunct organization that is not recognized as an accreditor by the United States Department of Education or the Council F for Higher Education Accreditation. As such, its degrees and credits might not be acceptable to employers or other institutions, and use of degree, degree titles may be restricted or illegal in some jurisdictions. Students who attend institutions of higher education that are accredited through associations not recognized by the U.S. Department of Education do not qualify for Title IV funding. Um, this is something that was interesting to me about the apologetics industrial complex, right? Prior to 2002, Trinity pursued endorsements of its courses with the University of Liverpool, so that's here in the UK, but it isn't, it's not strictly the University of Liverpool, it's a seminary in the UK and Wales that itself was accredited through the University of Liverpool, which th this is what's kind of weird about this. Um, the university did endorse theological courses and students paid an additional fee for the inclusion. Also, theological programs like counselling were placed in the Faculty of Arts program, and it was noted on the University of Liverpool's website at the time. In 2002, Liverpool decided to transfer the accreditation role to a theologically oriented institution after consultation with the QAA, Quality um, Assurance Agency for Higher Education. So they flagged this as a red, they brought this up as a red flag. The QAA oversees the academic infrastructure of institutions, which includes frameworks for higher education, qualifications, code of practice, subject benchmark statements, um, and program specifications. When they did decide to transfer the candidacy, students who enrolled prior to 2002 were allowed to finish under the University of Liverpool's accreditation logo. And um, in time, the language changed from accreditation to endorsement. So this is quite interesting, right? Um, why, why did they make those decisions? Why did the University of Liverpool choose to change the language from accreditation to endorsement? In 2004, Trinity was granted candidacy status with the Higher Learning Commission of the North Central Association of Colleges and Schools. The institution provided a self-study report hosted uh, hosted a team of North Central Association evaluators for a site visit and expected a second campus visit in autumn 2006. However, Trinity resigned from candidacy status effective October 20th, 2006. This choice was made after the HLC continually went back and forth on Trinity, costing multiple thousands of dollars each year. Initially, the reason for being denied accreditation was for coursework that was too challenging, but ultimately Trinity did not have enough financial stability reserve. Uh, so then Canterbury Christchurch University was approached as a potential um, endorser of courses and programs for Trinity, which is strange that uh, like why, why in these places in the UK, the chancellor of this place is, is the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, um, the head of the Church of England. In August 2007, Trinity received support for set courses and programs by the University of Wales, again, in the UK. Validation with the university is awarded to an institution developing and delivering a program of study equivalent to the quality and standard followed by the university. The validation is made possible for Trinity to offer degrees from the University of Wales rather than from Trinity itself up to the graduate level. To be awarded validation, Trinity was required to document and satisfy all quality assurance standards as outlined by the university, which includes QAA national standards re related to the framework for higher educational qualifications, program specifications, subject benchmark, blah, 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 blah. Um, at the time of validation in 2007, there was no requirement for the university to work only with accredited institutions. However, in July 2008, the QAA advised UK institutions they should not form collaborative relationships with institutions not accredited in their home country. This prompted the university to begin to question the collaborative relationship with Trinity. Although Trinity successfully completed the validation process in order to achieve validation, in November 2008, the university cut ties with Trinity. In 2008, Trinity applied for accreditation, blah, 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 DETC, denied accreditation of Trinity, failure to demonstrate compliance with standard nine, financial responsibility, um, 
Trinity did not appeal their decision, but Trinity disagreed with their decision, noting the demonstrated confidence of Trinity's banking institution. Uh, Trinity's comments also noted that Trinity had complied with other requirements, including all academic standards, and that Trinity would continue seeking accreditation. Though Trinity is not affiliated, accredited with any regional or national accrediting agency, they have operated successfully as a school of ministry for over 50 years with students graduating and serving in a variety of areas, including teaching, preaching, missions, and counseling. Trinity clearly understands the purpose of accreditation. However, as noted by the US Department of Education and all US DOE recognized accreditors, accreditation is a voluntary process. Um, Trinity has recently entered a special relationship with Calvary University, um, formerly known as an articulation agreement, providing a program path for graduate degrees and transfer of credit at a quality regionally accredited institute that shares Trinity's core values and mission. So, I mean, it, it's just a bit weird to me that it's not accredited. I, I, I don't claim to fully understand the situation, but it, it does seem like a bit of a red flag if I was considering getting a... Um, a degree from a place like this, at least. Um, was yeah, there anything so else? Just, oh, yeah, go ahead. Just to elaborate on that point, that's obviously one example, but there are quite a lot of these uh, non accredited. Um, yeah, that seems like a good one, right? <laughs> as far as they yeah, go for non accredited. Yeah, exactly. and, and the issue is that I, I think that, I mean, it depends on the specifics, but in general, I would say that. Um, uh, so just to step back there, I mean, this is probably sort of obvious, but just to belabor the point accreditation is important because most i think pretty much all states is certainly this is true here where i live and i think it's true in the u.s as well they, they pretty carefully control um who can use terms like university and degree and things like that D degree granting institutions right i think they're called um that's fairly tightly controlled and one of the reasons for that is is essentially to protect people right um to ensure that when you're devoting all this time and money that you're actually getting something that then can be used you know for uh, that's actually recognized and, and has the uh, standards that are behind it for whatever you're studying, right? And so for Christian, I mean, there are other non-accredited uh, colleges as well. Like I know there are some um, alternative medicine ones as well. So I'm not saying this is unique to Christianity, but obviously that's what we're talking about here. Um, to encourage people to go to to attend non-accredited colleges or universities and get degrees in like apologetics or theology or whatever it is, uh, which are often quite expensive, uh, obviously take a lot of time and then have essentially no career prospects other than, I guess, if you're going into ministry or something similar. Um, I think that's potentially quite financially abusive um, and and misleading, particularly if these young people and they may not fully understand the importance of accreditation or or, or the relevance of that uh, and, and the career um, difficulties that they may face. Obviously, if someone makes that choice for themselves and is fully informed, then they should be free to do that. But I, I think that there are legitimate concerns here about um, the, the, the practice. Here. When there's you know such an impetus, um, certainly in some communities, for people to... Um, uh, to you know for particularly for like questioning uh, you know sort of um uh intellectual types uh to like the you mentioned before nathan to um to like grapple with their faith and then oh you know you'd be good into going into ministry sort of thing um then um you know if those people end up really damaging their careers and they're spending a lot of money because of going to non-accredited colleges and so forth then i think that that's yeah that that that's something to be legitimately concerned about um so this is a video the video on Rario is going to play now yeah um, yeah which is j just to do about how do why can't i talk J just to do with um the kind of pressure that's created to create this air of prestige and having degrees and qualifications in order to again set you know sound plausible and and, and so forth which is um something we've kind of talked about so far so this is a video about ravi Ravi Zacharias is an internationally renowned evangelist and a fascinating example. Can we just clarify received... when this was produced, like prior yeah, to the allegations? Was... Or so this was yeah, produced so this in is... 2016, but but the guy who produced it, um, Steve Baugman, he's the guy who um, basically he 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 was questioning Ravi Zacharias's practices and so forth. He was like the guy who kind of bust the case open, sort of thing. Um, right. Uh, uh, and raised concerns about the red flags and uh, and so forth around Ravi's practices. So I don't. I think he may have been onto Ravi as like being a bit weird in that sense at this point. Interesting. In time. Yeah. Millions of people, even when the truth is right under their noses. He's also done an interview with Josh Rasmussen in person, which is just as a side note. Um, <laughs> this guy. He is a master of stagecraft. That's like saying define God and give three examples. <laughs> 
has convinced the world that he's earned several doctorates, that he is a former visiting scholar at Cambridge University and a senior research fellow at Oxford University. The first two claims are false and the third is highly misleading. Let's take them one by one and for more details, see the text field below. Ravi Zacharias has no academic graduate degrees, but he routinely refers to himself as Dr. Zacharias and speaks in venues where the title is understood to mean that the bearer has completed a course of doctoral studies. The multiple doctorates claim has spread widely and we even see it in the author bios of publishers like Penguin Books and Random House with no mention of these degrees being merely honorary. While ethical protocols in plain old honesty require that honorary doctorates be clearly marked as such. And here are a couple of nice examples from atheists Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett. At the website of Mr. Zacharias's self-named ministry, rzim.org, the word honorary does not appear in connection with his doctoral degrees. He simply tells us that he has been honored with a conferring of six doctoral degrees. Now, Mr. Zacharias might say that the words honored with make it sufficiently clear that his degrees were honorary, but that would be wrong. I was honored with a conferral of two graduate degrees, neither of them honorary, and here's a big university telling its PhD students that if they want to be honored the way Ravi Zacharias says he was honored, they better get their dissertations defended and approved. And if we Google the term honored with a conferring of, we see that it's just not that complicated. When a degree is honorary, you use the word honorary. But Ravi Zacharias does not. In the summer of 2015, I publicly criticized him for this misleading practice. He responded with a peculiar act of splitting the ethical baby. He added the word honorary to two of his websites out of Europe, but back at headquarters, rzim.org, he left the word out, but he did reduce the number of references to himself as Dr. Zacharias from seven to three. What conceivable reason could Ravi Zacharias have for omitting the word honorary other than that he looks better without it? And wouldn't it mislead fewer people if he would just be Mr. Zacharias? Ravi Zacharias tells us in his autobiography that in 1990, he spent some time at Cambridge University where he had been invited to be a visiting scholar. This is the crown jewel in his very sparse academic resume, and he has broadcasted it widely. Sorry, can I just pause here? I want to, make a, 19... want to make a rather rude, but I think relevant comment. Why? So it, it can't be a lie that Ravi Zacharias had doctorates, right? Because it would be so easy to falsify this, right? It's like he's asking you to check it when he's when he when he puts it up there, right? like Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Like that's an invitation to check out his qualifications, right? Surely. So it must be true, right? Because people would have he wouldn't have been able to get away with saying this for years if it was yeah, just a lie, right? So clearly he what, what this guy's saying is wrong. And he actually was a doctor. I, I don't know what all this doubt is about here. It's it's pretty obvious to me. Especially just random people without the internet who like farm or whatever like they're going to be able yeah, to exactly. check it out right just easily <laughs> um another another thing i'm going to note about things like this I, I don't know if it's going to be mentioned in the video but places like ridley hall at cambridge or um what's the, the one at oxford oh it's not going to come to me the the evangelical college at oxford the the point is that oxford and cambridge are kind of weird in the sense that they're sort of comprised of like lots of little colleges and things which get kind of pieced together into the whole university as opposed to the university being this kind of like big overarching institute that it is in, in many others and the, and the the colleges themselves are, are relatively independent of one another and so these like ridley hall for example and whatever the one is called at oxford they um are relatively autonomous and they offer special degrees that are aimed at people who are going into ministry with the church of england and so forth though that though it becomes attached to the university just in the sense that you know you can get some like the you get can get some theology training and stuff from the university's religion department as part of like doing one of these degrees or it so some of the degrees are, are accredited by the university themselves but it's very different to when people go to these places and get um like a degree in order to go on and become a minister or whatever that's very different from being like i went to oxford university and studied like philosophy and theology versus like I got my um, theology, my I, I got like a, the degree I need to go and be a Church of England minister at Oxford. It's, it sounds the same. It sounds like you went through, but it's not the same process at all. It's like a very different thing. The colleges are just attached and, but it gets the same prestige and people can be misleading about these things. Um, There's a uh, technical college at Melbourne, uh, in Melbourne uh, where I live called the Melbourne Institute of Technology. They call themselves MIT for short. Right. <laughs> So if you studied there, <laughs> yeah, I went to MIT. Exactly. It's it's a it's a similar sort of thing, like where where there's this kind of 
Uh, though, though I do want to emphasize some of the degrees are actually accredited by um, Oxford or Cambridge University, but then it, it, it still is misleading because it makes it sound like you went through, you know, a lot of the prestige of going to one of these u universities is getting through like the selection process for the undergraduate degree, for example. Um, and that doesn't exist in the same sense if you, you know, if you, if you're um, put forward by the Church of England as, as like a ministry trainee, and then you you know you go to one of these colleges, you, you've not been selected in the same sense, and so it's kind of like stolen valor to be like, yeah, I went to Oxford in the same way. Um, so yeah, in ninety, Mr. Zacharias did a two to three month sabbatical at a place called Ridley Hall in the town of Cambridge, England. Ridley has close ties to Cambridge University, but it is not part of the university. He does say it is a private religious training school. While at Ridley, Mr. Zacharias attended some classes at Cambridge University, and based on this, he tells us that he was a visiting scholar at Cambridge University. This struck me as suspicious, so I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with Cambridge University. They confirmed that although Mr. Zacharias had done a sabbatical at Ridley, attending lectures and classes at the University of Cambridge while on sabbatical at Ridley Hall would not confer University of Cambridge visiting scholar status on a student. Ridley Hall is not a constituent part of the University of Cambridge and has different criteria for granting visiting scholar status. So Mr. Zacharias' most impressive academic claim is false. And in the summer of 2015, when I told him that I was going to make this information public, he removed the prestigious Cambridge University from his bio and replaced it with a more humble Ridley Hall, Cambridge. I was pretty much done investigating Ravi Zacharias. And then I saw this. You know, I lecture at Oxford University three times a year. I'm a senior research fellow there. Although I live in Atlanta, I go to Oxford and lecture there regularly. Richard Dawkins lectures out of there. This impressive claim has spread widely, and it is highly misleading, if not simply false. I contacted Oxford and learned that Mr. Zacharias has never been an employee of Oxford University. The senior research fellow position had actually been at a place called Wycliffe Hall, a religious training institute whose goal is to- That was the one I was looking for the name of before, Wycliffe Hall, where it's, you know, it is it is an Oxford college, like in this ambiguous sense, but there's lots of things that are Oxford. It, it's kind of like, so it can, can have, some of the courses it offers have accreditation through the university. Um, you know, so you can study like the you can actually do the Oxford Religion BSc out of Wycliffe Hall, but um, uh, you know, like that's your home base. But there's also other stuff that they do besides. Like they're they're an independent thing, and so they give preferential treatment to Christians and offer these like apologetic courses and things. The thing is, if you're an academic, and I, I guess well, Ravi was sort of pretending he was in in a way, but obviously he wasn't. But the thing is, if you're an academic, your prestige is based on what you publish and the prestige of the journals you publish in. I mean, you know, it, it, when you're initially being hired, they will look at where you went to school and so forth. But like it, it's publications that really count in, in the academic world. And I'm pretty sure it's not, I, I suspect it's not dramatically different in theology, like at academic theology. I presume it's pretty, it's pretty similar in that sense. So the, the point there, the point I make there is that this whole focus on like, <laughs> well, it was Oxford, but it was one of these colleges. It's accredited with Oxford. Like, but like in real academia, people don't really care about that. Um, it's about your publications uh, and whether that's right or not is a, is a subsidiary question, but it's just I, the, the point there is it's really just appealing to the, um, to people who don't really understand this yes. sort of thing. Like they know that they hear the words that it sound prestigious and that's, that's the, that's the whole reason for it. That's all. That, it's classic all snake it. oil snailsmanship type thing. To train evangelists and help people find a new love for Jesus. The Oxford University Student Handbook describes Wycliffe as an affiliated institution that is not one of the colleges that comprise Oxford University. I then learned from Wycliffe Hall that not only has Mr. Zacharias never held a formal teaching position there, but that his research fellow position was merely honorary, a fact that Mr. Zacharias did not disclose at his RZIM bio until after I told him I was investigating his credentials. Curiously, the entire senior- How did he get responses from these institutions? I'm surprised I didn't just ignore his emails. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think I wanted to give fairness to Wycliffe Hall and uh, Ridley College. I do think that they are, um, I, I think that they're relatively legitimate in terms of, I don't think that they're breaking any rules and, you know, like Freedom of Information Act, they'll be transparent about those sorts of things. Um, it's not as dodgy as like the unaccredited situation in the US. Um, and I think as part of the, them offering training to Church of England ordinands, which is like one of their their main um, objectives and goals, I think they want to keep everything above board, right? In that sense, they don't, you know, they want to stay away from anything that smells dodgy or weird because they just want to exist as training institutions for people who are going to go into the ministry. Um, so, but but I, you know, and, and there's still quest there's still questions about that, but. Um, 
I, I do think that that they have an interest in being transparent about if there's a whiff of like abuse or dodginess going on because they want to just stay away from it and be innocent. Which fellow claim has since disappeared from his website bio. What could Ravi Zacharias have possibly meant when he said that he travels three times a year to lecture at Oxford University, where he is a senior research fellow? And what are we to make of the suggestion of professional equivalence between Ravi Zacharias, an increasingly self-admitted academic lightweight, and Richard Dawkins, a renowned scientist with a real doctorate, a real job at Oxford, and a 16-page resume filled with scholarly articles published in peer-reviewed academic journals? How many scholarly articles has Ravi Zacharias published? As far as I can tell, zero. But he does remind us that as a student, he once co-wrote a paper with another student, which was submitted to a scholarly journal. Was it published? He doesn't say. Ravi yes, Zacharias he... seems to be exercising. <laughs> Sorry, a phrase like that, a scholarly journal, like no academic would say a scholarly journal. That sounds embarrassing, but I guess to a lay audience, that might sound impressive. Using his right to remain publicly silent regarding my allegations, but he has replied privately to some inquirers. A few months ago, a nationally prominent Christian pastor named Michael Anthony provided me with a letter he had received from RZIM in response to his inquiry about my claims. The letter shows that Mr. Zacharias is willing to deceive even his fellow Christian clergy in defense of his public image. I have posted the entire letter below, but let's look at a couple of points now. The letter says, to try and avoid any confusion, all official biographies of Ravi Zacharias clearly state that the doctoral degrees conferred upon him were honorary. Now that's just not true. And whoever wrote it either has not read the RZIM bio or hopes that you won't. Because as of today's date, October 7th, 2016, it still doesn't clearly state that his doctorates are honorary. And I really don't know what an official biography is, but wouldn't the author bio on the back of his own book count? And really, shouldn't he exercise a little control over how his publishers describe him in their author bios? The letter also says, so the statement that he was a visiting scholar at the university is a totally accurate statement. Ridley Hall is where he was registered. All courses were at various colleges of the university. Now that would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? If every time a Ridley Hall student attended courses at Cambridge, they became a visiting scholar at Cambridge University. This letter also completely ignores the fact that Cambridge has already said that what Ravi Zacharias did does not make him a visiting scholar at their university. And it makes us wonder why RZIM removed the claim if it was totally accurate. And one more curious thing, despite my several requests, RZIM has refused to say whether Mr. Zacharias actually enrolled in classes at Cambridge University, or whether he just audited. This would be good to know, not because formally enrolling would have made him a visiting scholar, but because merely auditing would make this letter all the more dishonest, for it sure makes it sound like he actually took accredited Cambridge University courses. Did he? Unfortunately, his Ridley Hall supervisor, Dr. Jeremy Begbie, also refused to answer this question when I asked him. Some people have come to Ravi Zacharias's defense publicly. One argument is that he made an honest mistake about Cambridge, and when after a quarter of a century it was brought to his attention, he took immediate corrective action. So we should just move on. I'm not sure this so defense deserves a reply, so I'll just deal with it in the text field below. Then there is the favorite defense lawyer move, ambiguity. The conventions around honorary degrees are ambiguous, and so are the relationships between the universities and the schools they interact or collaborate with. Mr. Zacharias, therefore, deserves the benefit of the doubt for the way he presents his credentials to the public. But at best, this argument shows that Ravi Zacharias cannot be trusted with ambiguity. He will construe it not with humility or a heart turned towards truth, but in a light most favorable to his public image. A Ridley Hall gig becomes a Cambridge University gig. An honorary research gig at Wycliffe becomes a regular lecture gig at Oxford University, and so on. A massage becomes... To his oh, wait, no, this is... Sorry. <laughs> in his autobiography, Ravi Zacharias is refreshingly honest about what's going on with his self-aggrandizing tendencies. He has a serious glory addiction. When he was a teenager, he attempted suicide, not because he was depressed or impulsive, but because success eluded him. Everyone else around me had success. All I saw was failure. I was the one among our band of friends who had the least promise of a future. A quiet exit will save my family any further shame, and it will spare me any further failure. He told a reporter for the New Indian Express, my brother and sister were too bright. One day I thought I should die and drank poison but he tells us God intervened and made him choose the right poison. He survived, got religion, and discovered the thing that would bring him the recognition he so desperately craved, the stage. He became active in Youth for Christ, led others to the Lord, and entered a preaching contest. After his performance, he tells us, my buddies gathered around wide-eyed, and when he won, my buddies I'm went sorry. crazy. Wait, wait, wait. I was not. What, a preaching contest? What the hell's a preaching contest? I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I... What? 
I, I don't have the words. Like a preaching contest. Oh my gosh. What, what do you even, right. what do you even scored on? Like who converted people who felt the most convicted? Like how good, how, what, what are the criteria for winning? A a preaching? preaching. I can't. Uh... Yeah. All right. Let's just move on. I don't have anything to say about that. <laughs> um, utterly numb and overcome with emotion. Ravi Zacharias had discovered the thrill of stardom. He took up preaching and describes the overwhelming response he received as people streamed forward and strangers gathered around to compliment him. And he describes the sheer exhilaration of performing for a large adoring audience. Preaching turned That's Ravi Zacharias <laughs> from being a nothing, a nobody, to being listened to by so many in different walks of life. The rush of being listened to by so many explains not only the ambitious speaking schedule he still maintains, but also his need to overstate his academic credentials. For without Cambridge and Oxford and a doctorate or two, Ravi Zacharias is just another slick circuit riding preacher. This addiction to glory also explains why as we speak, Ravi Zacharias is trying to raise $6 million for yet another self-named ministry, which he tells us will be the leading apologetic center in the world. Perhaps all this will remind our Christian friends of the Apostle Paul's wise caution in the book of Romans about people who serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites and by their... So I'll pause it there. Um... I don't know if there's much else to say about that one. <laughs> yeah, just that I, I wish Christians would exercise some skepticism when it comes to, well, Paul, as was just mentioned, but but other other uh, figures in the uh, in the New Testament about what they might have gotten out of, uh, you know, c preaching careers. Um, I, I don't really know why there's this assumption that, well, there's no reason someone would like uh, devote themselves to preaching unless like they just had really strong objective evidence that what they were preaching was true like because that you know the, people don't get anything out of uh being an authority in a community and t you know writing letters telling people what to do and getting on the stage and uh and and having uh, an yeah. adoring crowd like that's not a thing at all right uh yeah. i just i don't get that at all by the way i'm not i'm not saying i'm not making any specific claim about paul or anything else but the fact that many christians won't even consider that as as like a possible motivator just i think is bizarre especially when we have so many examples of that happening with particularly american evangelicals maybe we just hear about them more i don't know but there's definitely a bunch of them and just the like power and status of being like a community leader being someone important i think it is a big motivator for a lot of people um yeah like it's addictive but like getting on stage and having people respond in that way and, and admire you like even if you're not getting wealthy from it um th that could be enough for some people i think so next topic on the list is christian homeschooling um did you look much into any of this stuff yeah i just had a few quick points to make on this um so the well christian homeschooling is huge especially in the united states and like alternative uh, education um, I think partly this, like, this is a cultural thing and partly stems from a concern about, like, the secular public school system and the, you know, scary things that they teach there about, like, uh, gays and evolution and, and climate and whatever else. Uh, I just had a bit of a look through a few things. Um, so th there is a big um, publishing industry providing materials for um, for homeschooling. Uh, what, what was the site that I had linked to here? I feel like it, christianbook.com. Yeah. Uh, which is an, an enormous website, um, but including, uh, sorry, amongst what they uh, provide, there are, um, geez, they've got like 50,000 <laughs> uh, results listed here uh, for, for homeschooling. Um, so they provide materials for um, for homeschooling. So I just had a bit of a quick look, um, a, a quick look through this. And, um, you know, I haven't done any comprehensive analysis here, uh, but um I don't know. I I didn't look at that HuffPo piece, by the way, uh, Nathan. I don't know if you wanted to share that, but I I did want to just uh, mention, uh, what was it? Yeah, yeah. So something I saw from the uh, from from two books that I looked at. So one was an astronomy book, and another one was biology. So there's a there's a series here called Apologia Education Ministries. So another one of these ministries. So they uh, uh they describe themselves as offering a full range of homeschool science curriculum from elementary through to advanced high school materials founded on a biblical creationist viewpoint. So again, um, I mean, obviously there's an explicit reference to creationism there, but especially the idea that when we're teaching science, we have to explicitly affirm that we're teaching it from a biblical viewpoint um, is to me really concerning. Um, and especially because these are homeschool materials, right? So they're designed to be used in a, well, like at home or like a small group environment. So for like you can imagine kids growing up in that sort of environment who 
are just not really exposed to to other ways of thinking. Um, and anyway, so I, I think that that's concerning off the bat. And in terms of the book, so oh yeah, I I just I had the links there. So I remember that um, there uh yeah the biology book. Let me just so uh, the full text isn't available, but they do have the uh the um what's it called the contents page. Uh, and most of it seems pretty standard just looking at it, although, you know, it's hard to say, but of course the, the evolution chapter is, uh, is going to be fun when they describe themselves as creationists. I'm just trying to find that now weirdly placed near the end of the book, whereas I tend to find these evolutionary chapters are often placed near the beginning in the textbooks that I look at. But anyway, um, oh, come on, where is it? I just wanted to read you some of the headings cause I thought it was amusing. Oh, where did it go? No, no, no. I saw it before. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, throat's dying. Uh, and of course, oh yeah, here it is. Okay, so module eight evolution. So this is, uh, I think this is for like, um, yeah, like late high school, like um, advanced high school sort of level. Okay, so we've got Charles Darwin, Darwin's theory. Well, that's fine so far. Then we've got micro evolution and macro evolution. A closer look the at macro evolution. <laughs> macro evolution today. Yeah, so that's a that's a distinction you will find in all textbooks except for all the ones that are published by reputable publishers. <laughs> like you look at a mainstream book, they don't talk about that because that's not a distinction that's used in mainstream um, research because it, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and then we've got the geological column and the fossil record, a detailed look at the fossil record evidence. I wonder what that means. Uh, the Cambrian explosion, punctuated equilibrium and gradualism. So that might not, so, so those terms might not, so, so they're red flags to me. And that's just because I know that the way they argue, right? So they love the Cambrian explosion because they like to argue that that's a sign of like sudden creation when it isn't. Um, and they love punctuated equilibrium versus gradualism because punctuated equilibrium is, again, they argue it's evidence for like rapid changes and like uh, discrete like speciation events uh, as opposed to like gradual change, which they say, well, that's what Darwin believed and was wrong, well, which is sort of true to an extent. But anyway, they, they present that uh, in their own way. Uh, so then we've got structural homology, molecular biology. So they love to talk about molecular biology because that is what they focus on in terms of the machinery of the cell, they like to focus on how it's designed and well, because it looks designed, right? So, so that's uh, another aspect of that. And then finally, we've got, and I, this was funny, why do so many scientists believe in macroevolution? I wonder what they have to say about that. Obviously, this, I'm just looking at the contents page. So um, anyway, I thought that was interesting because this is just like, I was just looking to see what do they have to say about evolution in the books that are promoted. And um, yeah, it looks like your standard creationist stuff, which maybe isn't surprising, but um, I, I thought it was interesting. And um, again, it seems as far as I can tell, the rest of the book looks pretty standard. I mean, there might be bits here and there that uh, that um, I didn't notice. But uh, in a sense, I think that's maybe even more concerning, right? Because because if you're like learning from homeschool and then you, you, like you learn about genetics, you learn about ecology, you learn about cell structure, and that's all like pretty standard stuff. But then you're able, you're, you're, you, you study evolution, you learn that in a particular way. You, you might not realize that what you're getting is a very skewed and minority position honestly even among christians a minority position um so i i think it's very interesting how, how that's done now the other thing i wanted to comment on was a, an astronomy textbook which was I think was from a, aimed at a bit of a lower level and i'm trying to remember what i wanted to share about it i think it was partly because there's like um oh yeah that's right so i just found the focus interesting Right. So it's called Exploring Creation with Astronomy. So the whole series is like exploring creation through, and it's like physics, chemistry, geology. So that's the branding, right? It's exploring creation. Well, you know, okay, that's that's sort of their standpoint. But then um, looking at this book, again, I think this is more like a lower high school level or possibly elementary level book. I'm not entirely sure. But they have things like Earth, perfect design by a perfect designer, perfect distance, perfect mass, perfect rotation, perfect atmosphere, perfect tilt, perfect land, perfect magnetosphere. Like so, they're talking about different aspects of Earth, right? But through a like, oh, it was a it was design point of view. I just like seriously, um, especially and, when the magnetic core of the Earth flips and everything. Well, well, just like, <laughs> oh, yeah, talk about that. <laughs> well, but what there was something else I saw here. What else did I want to? I think that they also like that they have Bible quotes throughout some of these books as well, which I thought was a little weird. But you know, I guess that's how they do it. Um, I, I feel like there was something else I wanted to share, but I can't find it now. Let me just have a look here. Oh yeah, the Kuiper Belt and Dwarf Planets, God's creativity. What is a planet? I don't know exactly what God's creativity means. Yeah, there, God but... God made Pluto a planet <laughs> for a reason, I suppose. Like I don't know. Well, I'm, jo I'm joking be. about because it's not a planet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if only that was in the Bible, that would have been funny. Yeah, to see that. 
Um, yeah, and, you know, so the book opens with a bunch of Bible verses and talking about, you know, how it's exploring God's creation. Anyway, uh, so I guess the point there is just to see like things um, as, yeah, I mean, I guess it's that's the biblical worldview. Right? Like everything is presented through that frame. Um, it, it just kind of reminds me of not that I experienced this personally, but like, uh, you know, in, in, in communist countries, how it was like the education system was set up around dialectical materialism and you had your classes on that. And then other things were, and they had some crazy things like Lamarckianism, which they taught because they didn't like evolution either, funnily enough, uh, but for different reasons. So it just kind of reminds me of that. Like not to say that there's not ideological uh, input in, in education elsewhere, because there certainly is. Right. But this is just extremely blatant um, and, you know, extremely well-funded and so forth. So um, I thought that was interesting. Is there anything you wanted to add to, to that whole thing? Um, it might be worth just scrolling through that Huffington Post article and seeing if there's anything useful. Um, so this was 2017. Um, and I guess she, she, she's doing a look, taking a look at um, what goes on in homeschooling. So she talks about um, states with private school choice programs for the 2017-18 school year. So, I mean, this is going to be more useful to Americans who actually, like, you know, think ha have a lot more information about the different states and where they uh, and relevant to where they live and stuff like that. Um, so of the schools that participate in private school choice programs, 73% are Christian. And then here's the breakdown between... Um, non-Catholic and Catholic, basically. 2% um, are Jewish, which is interesting. 1% Muslim, 23% non-religious. I like that it's unclear which religion they adhere to. Imagine running a religious school <laughs> that you can't tell what religion is from. <laughs> yeah. Um, so taxpayers foot the bill for religious private schools, the separation of church and state, a cornerstone becomes a murky line. So how did it come to be that taxpayers are footing the bill for evangelical education. So that's a part of this story, I guess. Um, you talked a bit about what the textbooks say, but here, here are some things. So one of the textbooks says, um, radical environmentalists don't, uh, don't just appreciate nature, but they worship it. In a pursuit of preservation, environmentalists view mankind as the enemy of nature. Environmentalists advocate for laws that hinder the advance of technology. Yeah, so, so I should say that the couple of examples that I found, um, I was just looking at some generic um, science books. I wasn't, I didn't go through a large number <laughs> of examples and try to cherry pick like the worst things. Um, yeah, right. And so like, so what I was talking about, I think is like fairly standard, right? When you like find the worst, <laughs> part, that's when you get this sort of stuff. Like, so yeah. It, Nelson Mandela was a Marxist. <laughs> Nelson Mandela, yeah. the South African leader who helped dismantle apartheid, apartheid, was a Marxist agitator who helped move the country toward communist tyranny and a system of radical affirmative action. Um, Satan created psychology. What's their deal? Like, why do they hate Mandela so much? <laughs> this is what I mean. Some of this stuff is just bizarre. It's like well, because, just, well, I, because apartheid was put in place by God. God created the different yeah, races. I, yeah, and, yeah. I, I know that. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of yeah. There was a lot of that sort of argument back in the day. Yeah, it's funny, people don't talk about it very much anymore. But... Uh, Satan hatched the ideas of evolution, socialism, Marxist socialism, communism, progressive education, and modern psychology to counter America's increased religiosity. So, so this is basically postmodern neo Marxism, right? Like it's just yeah, a right. hodgepodge of stuff that they don't <laughs> like that really has nothing to do with with each other. Although, I yeah, it's interesting they put modern psychology in there as well, sounding a bit like the. Uh, the who is it that hates the or oh, psychiatry i guess but it's the come on the, the crazy ones the uh, scientologists that's the one right? oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah the yeah. crazy ones yeah I, that doesn't narrow yeah. it down bionetics you know. <laughs> <laughs> god god wants only modest women um another one the war between the states so this one's it's interesting how it, it gets linked to like geopolitics as well you know <laughs> like texas needs to secede god wants texas to secede <laughs> Sorry, can we look at the women voting one? I actually yeah, found yeah, that more okay. interesting because um, after women gained the right to vote in the 1920s and started working more outside the home, they also started behaving in increasingly anti-Christian ways. Women moved from being obedient to their husbands, as Titus 2.5 instructs, to having the audacity to start cutting their hair and wearing That, that can't skirts. be real. I don't believe that's a real passage <laughs> from a textbook. Like, see, like the last part, is, is that's just... 
that cannot be real. <laughs> Here's the citation. That cannot be Based real. Come on. Studies. Cutting that, I That's agree. That's just obviously a joke. Like, oh, cutting their hair. Like, seriously? Uh, v, what, v has been known <laughs> to cut her own fringe before. And those weeks where she does so, she is increasingly rambunctious. <laughs> but it's not even logical. Like, <laughs> women, okay, so they started to become disobedient. Okay, how so? They cut their, like, were their husbands telling them not to cut their hair? Like, what's the connection between those things? Where in the Bible does it say they have to have long hair? And if, if it does, then put that, like, it just, it doesn't even make sense. <laughs> Apart from just being horrifically misogynist. But, like, I mean, it's so bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> but you need to ask your husband before you get but your also, hair. Also, linking it to getting the vote. Like, <clears throat> what's the connection there? Like, like trying to imply that, you know, <laughs> that was yeah. a mistake. Like, it was a mistake. Um... <laughs> <laughs> like, I say that when I'm making a, a, a tasteless, edgy joke. <laughs> They're like, oh, I shouldn't have let right. women have the vote. Look what happened. Like, but but they seem to be like, actually, no, unironically, like, it's all downhill since then. <laughs> uh, the, so the, the war between the states, there were many causes of the war between the states or the civil war, according to Ace. Uh, slavery is a likely causal factor, but not the only one. States' rights and protective tariffs also played a big role. God may have also been punishing people with the war as it was preceded by a time of religious apostasy and cultism. Uh, after the war, the South suffered, but it rose from the ashes to become the Bible Belt, a part of the country that has continued to stand firm on the fundamentals of Christian faith. Um, and then black supremacy. God activists. may have been punishing, but like, seriously. <laughs> Because it's like they start off as like, yeah, okay, uh, whatever. And then God may be punishing people. It's like, if you're not paying attention, you just like miss it. Like, wait, what? Well, God you can't was... prove he wasn't, James. Well, that's the point. Like, <laughs> I mean, I suppose. Like, how would you possibly know that? Like, what a bizarre thing to put in a social studies book. Like, God might have been For all we him. know. God might like, be punishing us with this. Uh, these quotes. Name a time of history that was not a time of religious apostasy and what was the other thing? Cultism. Like, that's been happening forever. This is why I don't understand the identification with particular events. Like it's, it's just, there's no criteria for that. Well, an another thing that's interesting about this point is that during the times, uh, the, the theological arguments that were being made um, against, against the practice of slavery were viewed as like theological liberalism because people were appealing to things like moral intuitions and saying, we need to read what scripture says, you know, in, in light of our sort of moral intuitions about equal rights for people and what, you know, how we should treat people and things. And so the people who were defending slavery, the slavery apologists, they would be saying, no, look, this is just what scripture plainly says. I don't want any of your liberal, you know, wishy-washy nonsense. Um, and so it's, it's interesting when the, when the narrative, uh, when that point is still being made today in terms of, um, well, we just need to go with what the Bible plainly says. We don't want any of this liberal progressive nonsense. But actually, that's, you know, that's the position that's also pro-slavery in terms of, you know. The well, we don't talk about that either. Of course, of course, Christianity was anti-slavery because many of the early abolitionists were Christians. Of course, many yeah. of the pro-slavery, pretty much all the pro-slavery people were Christians as well. But we don't talk about that. Like it's, it's you know, remember the hits and forget the misses. Also, uh, hot take. Coronavirus was God's punishment for America electing Trump. Hey. Prove me wrong. What's that? It's it's God's punishment. The timing for is America. a bit suspicious, don't you think? It, it's God God's punishment for America not listening to Trump. <laughs> ah, you foiled me <laughs> when he was in power. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we have during the civil rights movement, some activists belong to black supremacist organizations, which were akin to white supremacist organizations like the KKK. The most prominent black supremacist of the era was Malcolm X. Um, yeah, that one is is wrong, but I think it's less egregiously wrong. Yeah, because yeah. the distinction yeah. between separatist and supremacist is a little subtle. But yeah, that that is a I mean, it, it didn't mention that he then changed his mind about that and, you know, worked with the uh, to reconciliation for a while. But, you know. Well, maybe it, it did afterwards, but I suspect it probably didn't. Um, this is just a breakdown of the different curriculums being used. Oh, I just can't. I can't get over the women. The women voting one. That's just. Um, I got to check that. Like, I just can't <laughs> believe that's real. Well, they, so they, this these were textbooks from this AC curriculum, which is apparently right. in in prominence according to some of these statistics. Wherever the hell these come from, um, ACE curriculum. Six thousand six hundred followers on Instagram. The average student who works on six subjects of the core ACE curriculum completes about 72 paces a year. I don't know what any of this American acronymisms, uh, what 
what these stand for. Um, is there anything else useful here? This is just educators complaining about it. Breakdown by religious affiliation. And then, you know, comments on things like, not only is evolution untrue scripturally, but it does not even make good science. The theory of evolution has no real scientific basis, and even Darwin himself expressed doubts as, it, as to its veracity. What citation needed for a few of Yeah, I like how they sometimes present things as quotes when they don't show where they're quoting <laughs> from. Like, what's the point of that? Also, who cares? They, I swear they some of these people cannot understand how science works because they, they think that like yeah. they seem to think that scientific theories have like prophets who like descend from on high and Darwin yeah. is the evolution prophet. And so if he had doubts about something that is of profound importance for us, like 150 years, late, more than 150 years later, I, I just, I don't get it. Like they always go on and on about Darwin. I, yeah. It doesn't matter what Darwin believed for, for the actual yeah, I, theory to be. So, so there's two things that are weird about it. One of which is when they talk about it being a theory as if that somehow denigrates his status as if like all scientific theories are theories, like, <laughs> you know, that's got nothing to do with it. I, I feel like I'm entering a whole different atheism theism discourse when we talk about this, but, but that, you know, that's um, that, that, that much it, it is just obvious to anyone who knows the basics about, about, about science. And that, and then, as you mentioned, the, the, the idea that there are the like, you know, genetic theory, oh, if Mendeleev or whatever, ha, you know, has some doubts about some particular aspects of genetic theory, well, then genetic theory refute. No, it, it doesn't matter. Like, genetic theory is very different now to, you know, what whatever Mendeleev came up with his pea plants that he was um, splicing together or whatever. Do you know, I heard that even, um, even Peter, the greatest of Jesus Apostles once expressed out about him. So, you know, I don't know. Right. <laughs> sounds yeah. a bit sus to me. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so um, let's move on from the education side of things then. Uh, I probably will want to depart soon-ish, but I did want to present a few things that I looked at because my voice is not getting better. Yeah. Uh, but I will I will share now because I wanted to talk a bit about Christian publishing because I put together a few little things for us to... Oh, oh well, where is it? Before you do that, I, can I oh, read sorry. the uh, the book people or, or a few of the, the things I've oh, Please don't read a whole book. book. Yeah. <laughs> can I read a whole book? Um, <laughs> just from 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 that book that's on evangelical publishing. Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Before we finish um, up. Where is it? Oh, come on, load. Where did it go? Oh, here we go. So he, basically, he, he talks about the origins of some of these publishing houses like... Um, Zondervan and Erdman, Erdman's and uh, and the Penguin Division and how that how they've kind of tapped into these these markets. Um, ma many American publishers became advocates of evangelicalism uh, because they made a business of it. During the nineteenth century, several practical developments uh, had primed the publishing business for what would become exponential growth with the number of titles in circulation multiplying from approximately 1,300 in 1804 to 25,000 between 1820 and 1850. Uh, practical developments included new steam power and papermaking technologies, which made printing presses and printing processes less expensive and more productive. Meanwhile, canals, railways, and more reliable postal system made the transportation of raw printing materials and final printed products cheaper and easier than ever. As these changes re reduced the unit cost of books and periodicals, books no longer seemed like luxuries that only the wealthiest could afford, so on and so forth. Um, in order to persuade consumers, publishers, and booksellers presented book... Uh, in order to persuade consumers, publishers and booksellers presented book buying and reading as primary disciplines of authentic Christian faith, lamenting that the book, uh, and this is something that we can see with um, Cameron and others, you know, when they talk about what, the way that they frame book reading and um, apologetics, lamenting that the book market's expansion had created what the historian David Nord calls as the literature of wickedness, sensation, dissipation, and error. Publishers of religious literature portrayed their products as sources of ideas, teachings, and stories that true Christians should choose for themselves. Hoping to maximize their market reach, publishers and sales agents encouraged consumers to make their selections without regard to denomination or ecclesiastical distinctions. Both a religious and commercial strategy, this ecumenical imperative depended upon and amplified the idea of, of an evangelical public. Evangelicalism served, in short, as a marketing slogan and strategy. Um, 
so then talks about a few of the specifics. Although relatively few scholars of American religion have devoted attention to the relationship between evangelicalism's social profile and its market reach, media corporations have recognized this dialogue for decades. Between the 1980s and today, many of the world's largest media conglomerates, such as Bertelsmann, Lagarde, and Amazon, have acquired or created their own religious divisions or imprints. Where for these corporations, religion typically has meant evangelicalism. This trend became pronounced uh, during pronounced beginning in 1988 when Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation acquired the Zondervan Corporation, making it a subsidiary of the publishing firm Harper and Row, renamed Harper Collins in 1990s, uh, founded in Western Michigan almost 60 years earlier. Uh, Zondervan initially had created had catered to that region's Dutch Reformed immigrant community. Blah blah blah. Um, let me see, was there anything else? So then he, he just goes on to talk about then uh, large publishing subsidiaries like uh, Penguin Ra Ra Random House, who who were Ravi Zacharias' publishers, Hachette, uh, Simon, and Schuster, all have developed their own evangelical divisions. Sondervan has exemplified and even pioneered the symbiosis of religion and business that they have put into practice. For this reason, I focus in this book especially on Zondervan and the constellation of co companies that have co-opted, competed, and merged with it. Um, Together, the, these companies have generated blah, 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 lots of stuff. There was one other thing that I thought was useful. Can I find it, though? I, I hate using the Kindle. Um, it really annoys me. It, it's like it's so bad for navigating. And, and yeah, I thought I was the only one. I find it incredibly annoying to use and uh, hard to find things. I much prefer a PDF. I don't. Like a lot of people like Kindle, but I just hate reading books on Kindle. I don't. I don't know why the interface is so bad. <laughs> I don't, maybe it's just me. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm an old commander. No, guy. no, I I don't like it, and I don't. I don't like that the page numbering is relative to the size. Yes, of the text that well. is so. It's yeah. It makes it basically <laughs> impossible to reference. Um, brands of distinction. So he talks about how how the brands have been created by publishers in this chapter, which I think is interesting. So bra brands have served as vessels of social authority, relying upon and requesting the assent of those who encounter them. Um, for centuries, evangelicals uh, have taught the world how to make and value brands. Since the Reformation era, branding strategies perennially have cultivated authority on behalf um, of the products and people around whom evangelical publics have taken shape. So I think the conclusion of this one, I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I'm just Kind of stating the conclusions of the book and, and, and how he how he substantiates those with particular examples and statistics um you'd, you'd have to read the book in order to do that he talks about how how certain boogeymen have been created so you know how people talk about that how you'll hear even fundamentalists sort of talk about progress the progressives and how they're destroying christianity well you you hear a lot of the same sort of rhetoric against like methodism methodism in, in, in 1911 methodism leaves the oh. door open to modernism uh, but beat pragmatically recognized some methodists as more friend than foe in their fight against the specter of modernism the christian reformed found potential allies especially among protestants known as fundamentalists and academic blah 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 i didn't know the uh, modernists used to be the boogeyman <laughs> i modernism, guess that Oh, sorry. So modern is, I'm just trying to think what that would have meant to them. Like, yeah. That's 1911, right. right? So that I was thinking maybe it's like the uh, Vienna school, but yeah. A bit earlier than that? I, I guess. Sure. Freud? I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I th I'm thinking of things like, like that. Freud, like, Marx, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Attempts to, attempts to understand like human psychology as a kind of science, I suppose, for, from mm. antecedent causes. Um, Things like that, I think, would have broadly come under modernism. And um, attempts to understand man, man's history is like a natural process as well, rather than a theological. I think things like this. Are... It's so funny because now it's the postmodernist of the bookie man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, so the more things change, the more they stay the same. Modernism is now having its heyday in the churches of the United States. The banner reported in, uh, in 1930, as it was rampant in the Netherlands about 50 years ago. Uh, practically all of the larger denominations and many of the smaller ones are capitulating to the spirit of liberalism. Um, so, you know, I, well, I suppose liberalism would still be used as as a term of the theological. Well, in the US where it has a bizarre meaning. Yeah. Um, these criticisms in, of, in Australia, of, the sorry. liberal party is the conservative party. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just to confuse people. 
the, these criticisms of modernism and fundamentalism, uh, the CRC consistently pursued a brand identity of its own. Its brand rested above all on the ideal of strict Calvinism, firm confessional standards and bounded communities. Uh, that is what distinguished the Christian Reformed Church in theory, if not in practice, from the Reformed Church of America. So, so um, the book basically talks about how, the, how these brand identities kind of centered around denominations and, you know, the little dramas that they create basically um, – could, could sell books refuting one another's right. ideas um because i feel like that's not m really much of a thing anymore i feel like evangelical christians these days don't talk much about maybe internally they do a bit but certainly like externally it's it's all about the um like the culture wars and the atheists and so forth well i you say that but i actually do think there's still a market for this sort of thing so you know mm. if you see you know like kirk mcgregor has this book um louise de molina right and it's like so so if you're a molinist now, now you have to know what to say, um, you know, in response to the Calvin. Yeah. So there still are these sort of... Internal... Yeah, true. Maybe it's less of a... Th I don't know. It's hard to quantify yeah. that, but that's just the sense I get compared to in the past. Like, but you know, if we compare to the... the what was it? The, the Great Awakening, the two Great Awakenings, where that was... Mm. You know, obviously there wasn't much secular, like, uh, non-belief in that culture. So that was very much into denominational things. So anyway... I'll just read the conclusion then from this chapter as the last point about this. If, uh, if, as some scholars argue, brands and branding give religions meaning, then evangelicalism is an exemplary instance of this fact. Evangelical media firms uh, consistently have amplified the significance of brand well before and after institutions like the National Association of Evangelicals or the Moral Majority developed brand identities premised upon the notion that they spoke for a national evangelical public. Even... Oh, Oh, something that would be interesting to look into. I don't know if you've looked into Hans Georg Muller's um, conception of like the general peer and public um, profilicity as people create profiles through social media. But it'd be, it'd be interesting to look at some of that stuff as well um, through through this lens. But um, evangelical media firms cultivated brands that gave consumers the opportunity to embrace distinct forms of distinct forms of trans-denominational identity through acts of purchase. Companies such as Erdman, Zondervan, Moody, and others manifested divergent evangelical sensibilities through their branding strategies and practices. Capitalizing on their brands, evangelical corporations not only have pursued uh, commercial, advant commercial advantages over their competitors, so um, the book stresses in the personal stories of some of the founders of these book brands how basically their concerns weren't like truth spreading the gospel and so forth but like you know business advantage um but also have bestowed celebrity upon countless evangelical authors so it talks about the celebrity complex of certain academics or authors that um these brands create evangelical firms have valued celebrity status because it valorizes independent authority Whereas older categories of status, such as renown, recognize people especially for serving well in esteemed social institutions and offices, the phenomenon of celebrity has directed admiration and imitation away from institutions and toward particular people for merit that they have seemed to deserve as individuals. Craig. <laughs> that well, we, well I'll, I'll show that in a moment, actually, about how many of these big um, apologetics institutions are based around an individual, which I think is particularly interesting. By the way, Bo and I are in the chat. If we're boring, why are you here? Go and do something else with your life. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't get that. Anyway, sorry, continue, Nathan. Sorry. That, uh, that apparent independence has led evangelical media firms to treat celebrity as a quality that can compel consumers to purchase products by people who possess celebrity status. Uh, but perceptions of independent authority always have depended upon successful branding, and evangelical celebrities accordingly have needed evangelical media firms to help substantiate their authority through advertisement, marketing, sales, publications, and stories um although uh, which so they, they always do right so they invite each other to their conferences and books and book launches and things like that and they say oh you know uh have you know have a look at his book he's got a new book coming out yeah again yeah. evangelicals are not uh it's not unique to them but they, they they do this an insane amount um yeah so i i totally see what what they're talking about there he just talks about the specifics of some of the cases and um, that he looked into in the chapter there so i won't uh go on about that so yeah, feel free, feel free to share whatever the next. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Might. So that is, I think that finishes up the. Wait, where did that? That was books. And oh yeah, that was the start yeah. of Christian publishing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let me just share what I wanted to uh, talk a bit about. Uh, where was it? Uh, it's weird that Chrome tabs are not a window for some reason. I guess it's part of the Chrome. <laughs> I just always find that confusing. Okay. Uh, back to dark mode, as all civilized people should be. Um, dark, dark mode. Uh, Google Docs. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, when I got a new monitor, like a larger, I think it's a 32-inch or something, 
yeah anyway um light mode just kills my eyes like i just can't, right. i can't i can't read yeah. it it just so yeah anyway um it's much softer on the eyes any uh plus you know prepares me for where, where i'm going so it's, it's handy there so what i did um i mean this is not like scientific or anything but it's maybe interesting um I went I'm to just Amazon. Nip to the toilet for a second, sorry, James. Because sure. I, I went to Amazon.com, so the US website, um, and I looked up two different uh, two different like subcategories of books. So one was Christian apologetics, um, and the other one was atheism. Um, I, I don't actually know if it was called Christian apologetics, but it was something very similar to that. Um, yeah, and then atheism as a as a subcategory. So Christian apologetics that returned six, uh, sorry that returned nine thousand results, and atheism returned four thousand results. Um, although interestingly, many of the top results that I got in terms of like recommended results, um, not listed by popularity, but just like the the ones that came up at the top, were actually critical of atheism. Whereas that wasn't true for Christian apologetics. So like the the point is that if you search for books on atheism, quite a lot of them will be books that are hostile or critical of atheism. Whereas for Christian apologetics, I think that's actually very rare, at least from my experience and uh, from from the searches I did. So the reason that's significant is because if you're trying to compare like how many books are published or how many are available on Amazon, it's a bit hard because there's many, many more that are critical of atheism than are specifically critical of Christian apologetics or, or Christianity. Of course, of course they exist, right? But remember, I'm looking at, I'm not comparing Christianity to atheism because that would just be like no contest, but I'm specifically comparing Christian apologetics and things related to that too, to like atheism as the best comparison I can make. But the comparison isn't perfect, right? Because, um, yeah, atheism is in a sense much, um, broader in that it, it it encompasses things like secularism and separation of church and state which atheists are concerned about whereas the christian apologetics might touch on those things but it's kind of narrower and more philosophical in focus um and and that's why many of the atheist books concerning atheism actually are critical of it anyway so it, it it's pretty clear to, it's pretty clear to me that there are far more books on a christian apologetics than there are um on atheism e even with that distinction that i mentioned um i searched for naturalism just to see if that was any i mean i don't think that's a good comparison because not many people call themselves naturalists but there were only 730 results and many of them didn't really seem to be that relevant um like naturalism in terms of like uh ecology and things like that came up quite a bit as well so they did there just aren't very many books that are there are a few philosophical books of course but there's just not a lot on that on that side of things which is which i hope to rec remedy actually because i'm hoping to write a well i'm working on a book on naturalism so maybe that'll be there at some point but anyway so then what i did um oh yeah sorry it was christian evangelism that's right not christian apologetics because that's i think the closest category um yeah so i looked at then so not just the number of books, but then I sorted by number of reviews, not the score. That's pretty meaningless on Amazon, I found. Almost everything gets like four plus stars. Uh, but the number of reviews, which I think is an, a good indication of popularity of the book. So I, I sorted the books under this category by um, the number of reviews. Um, and these are most of the top ones. I excluded some of them in this category that didn't seem a, 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 to be like apologetic in nature. Remember that there is a lot of books that are just kind of like, they're just general Christian evangelism or like feel good Christian books or, or other things that aren't really philosophical in nature of any or argumentative in nature. So I, I wanted to exclude those and just focus on the apologetics. Um, so, um, so, so here's, <laughs> so here's what I found. Um, the, the top one was the case for Christ with um, 8,200 reviews um, far and away. So that's Lee Strobel's book, which I find a little disappointing because I, I think I actually haven't read it, but from what I've read about it, it's not very good. Um, and then we had, yeah, Cold Case Christianity, um, The Reason for God, Tactics, uh, More Than a Carpenter, which I haven't heard of, Orthodoxy, so that's G.K. Chesterton, um, uh, another one, The Weight of Glory, which I'm not familiar with, On Guard, so that's Craig's best performing book there. I think More Than a Carpenter, well. I think, is um, Josh McDowell's conversion story about how yeah, he became a Christian right. on university campus. Yeah. It occurs to me that I don't... I think I meant to look this up, but I didn't, I don't recall seeing a, uh, what's his name? Um, C.S. Lewis on there. So I, I don't know if that's because of how it's categorized. Mm. I'm just going to check that now. Yeah, yeah. So Mere Christianity has like 12,000. So maybe it just wasn't in that same category for some reason. I don't know why that wasn't listed there. Um, but yeah, so that would actually put that at the top. And I recall thinking that, why is that not there? But anyway, um, <clears throat> So I'm not saying this is perfect, right? But this is just what I, the quick thing that I put together. So then let's compare that to the, under the atheism category. So the top one there is unsurprisingly the God delusion, similar to the case for Christ. God is not great. Uh, beyond good and evil. So that's Nietzsche. I, 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 it's questionable whether that fits yeah. into atheism exactly, but I, I sort of put it there because it's kind of uh, why there is no God. I can't remember who that was for. Letter to a Christian Nation. So that's Sam Harris, um, a couple of others. Um, I also, because, you know, uh, 
I wanted to make this comparison. So Reasonable Faith is not one of the like super top books, um, like first page, like uh, top numbers. So they'd be like a thousand plus, uh, but it's like second page of about 616. And my little book on Reasonable Faith has 25 reviews, um, just just as a point of comparison. So anyway, so what do I, what do I get out of that? Um, it's a bit hard to say. I would say that obviously this is English speaking world. Um, there's definitely, I, I think it's fair to say that there are more books about Christian apologetics than there are like about atheism, probably at least two or three times more. Um, the best read books are kind of similar in both cases, but I think there's probably just a longer tail of, of Christian books um, of like apologetics to the atheist ones. Um, and the other thing that uh, I thought is that if you look at these top books here, so like Case for Christ, Call Case Christianity, Reason for God, Tactics, I don't know as much about that one, but also uh, on guard, God's crime scene and reasonable faith. I know about all those ones. Um, they're all like philosophical, scientific, like they're trying to present a reasoned case for Christianity, generally by presenting a bunch of different arguments, right? Uh, how well they succeed in that and so forth is another question, but they're all like that kind of evidential focus. Whereas these books here, The God Delusion, God is Not Great, um, and Letter to a Christian Nation, certainly. Uh, I would say those are much more about uh, political and social issues. They do they do present some arguments against God, right? But in terms of their focus, I, I think they're not quite the same thing. Um, so, and, and that's part of part and parcel of what I was saying that the categories are not exactly comparable. Like atheism is not really the same as counter apologetics, if you see what I mean. Uh, but there isn't really a category for counter apologetics. Um, so I, I think that th so the focus is a bit different, and this actually I think plays out in the in the discourse, right? Because if you're like if you're looking at well, I want to read the best Christian arguments and then the best atheist arguments, and you come up with books like this, um, dare I say that for all the value of uh, I'm not as sure about that one, but for all the value of many of these books, they're not really going to most of these, uh, of course, excluding this one here, right? <laughs> but but most of these books are not going to give you a very like robust, uh, you know, scientifically or philosophically solid account of of why you should be an atheist, particularly not one that responds to like the best Christian apologetics, like not one that responds to these sorts of books, because they're not really designed to do that, at least again, most of the ones in the atheism category. Um, and so you know, as particularly like a Christian or someone who's like questioning, who's looking at these, I think that they're, they're going to feel like the case is a lot stronger on, on the, on, on the Christianity side. And partly that's just because I think it's the focus of the publishing that there isn't really a counter apologetics category. There are books that are counter apologetics, but it's not really a category. Right. And, and most of those books are not very widely read. Um, uh, it, certainly in comparison to, to like many of the Christian ones or even the atheist ones that are a bit a bit more general. And many of the books that are best-selling atheist books are not primarily focused on giving a reasoned case against God, though they may talk a bit about that. Um, so like The God Delusion has, I think, a few chapters on this. It's been a while since I, since I read that. But it, it talks about lots of other things as well, which are sort of not, not directly about that. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I thought that was interesting to get a, a bit of a scope that I, that it's that there's more books on apologetics and that they're more like partly because of the way I categorize it, they're more specifically focused on apologetics. Um, and so I think that for people who are like into this sort of thing, uh, if they look, if they're like reading the sort of top books here, the most pre preeminent ones, I, I think they will get it. And many people will get an impression that the the arguments are stronger, like if, particularly if that's where their starting point is. So, um, by the way, we've got. Um, Hot girls from Tinder on. Uh, yeah, I think someone. I, th I think a mod got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any any comments you want to make about that, Nathan? Before I. Um, well, one one thing I was going to say about about that was also the so the the cost to leave thing. So a lot of uh, it'll oh, often yeah, that's, be framed. Yeah, that's the next part, but you can. Well, I I thought it made more sense to kind of bring that into this part. So it it's like um, you know, it, it'll often be framed that that. It's okay to kind of become a Christian for any reason, but if you want to leave, you kind of have to have you have to have something to say about each of these arguments and each of these topics, and you have to have read certain books. So what one of the things about that is that you know these books obviously cost money, and so I, I put like I, I don't consider this to be um, you know I, I have I've tried not to because obviously this would be really easy to rig in a sense because I could just you know fill it with an insane number of books and make it like a million pounds or something. Right. Um, uh, but, but books that I actually think that Christians, that, that I would have as a Christians thought I had to read before I was able to kind of deconvert. So one for each kind of topic, and it comes to about 380 pounds in total. And obviously every year there's more and more of these books being uh, released. So, so can we trust the, the gospels? This is by Peter J. Williams at uh, Tyndale house, I think. And this is just, 
this is a more modern version of like ff bruce's can we trust the gospels which is to do with basically you know are, are they reliable are they eyewitness testimonies Should, you know can we trust what they say uh know the truth is recommended by william lane craig as a handbook of systematic theology which anyone should read before they get into um apologetics so so i thought i'd include that there i, I i've put necessary existence in there because i think when people People, this is the only one of these philosophical type books, I think, that I've really included. And that's just because a lot of people talk about how this has improved their views of ontological and contingency arguments by considering necessary existence by Alexander Proust. Um, but of course, there's a lot of these more academically geared books in philosophy of religion. And if people, if people are going to kind of get outside of this apologetic baseline, as I've kind of created this stack of books here then it i think the cost will increase massively at that point because that's when you get into you know the these specialist academic books which are about 100 pounds each and very kind of difficult to purchase by by academic publishers so you know books on like causal finitism infinity craig's academic craig's works. academic books which you basically can't buy with yeah. <laughs> legally <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is what annoys me about that is that because academic, you know, publishing through academic press often they're very expensive, and that's just part and parcel of it. But the thing is that Craig regularly references, well, reasonably regularly references those, especially his, his like he did this actually in the Sky Dive Phil yeah. Uh, yeah video references his books on philosophy of time uh, and uh, and uh, relativity, and he actually showed them there. And um, I mean, the thing is, like, not only they're very difficult to read, but they're extremely expensive and hard to get. Like, he Craig could easily, well. Eh, pretty easily have written a have written a popular level book on philosophy of time at least like you know popular uh, you know in, in quotes like my level of type book right which is aimed at a popularish audience but it's still a bit a bit advanced but he could have done that right but he hasn't right presumably because he doesn't think that it's worth the time that it won't sell very well and that it's not going to be very persuasive plus that actually that he'll they'll bring attention to problems in his argument uh, because his philosophy of time is completely nonsensical in my view and you know I talk about that in my book but the point is that Yes, there are popular books, but sometimes, like in the case of Craig, to get the real juicy stuff, you have to buy these academic books, which cost hundreds of dollars each and are hard to find at the best of times. And it's just like that that really upsets me when like, well, if you have more doubts, you can read these hundreds of dollars of books. It's like, come on, Craig. So so I also thought in the stack I'd put in something on the formation of the canon. So the canon of scripture by F.F. Bruce, because I mean, there's doubts that Christians have about, you know, the books that are in the Bible, why they're in there um what how, how we got the bible things like that so that can deal with some of those of, of course have to include a c.s lewis book on the problem yeah. of pain um, have that one in the I, I put got overall by william lane craig because often uh, some of the arguments that people kind of give sometimes a challenge to them will be like well i can be an atheist right and just believe in goodness as like a, a platonic object or something so i thought i thought god overall would be a good one to sort of um that that's craig craig's refu refutation of platonism um the case for christ obviously that was what that's one of the most popular books about the resurrection um can science explain everything so that's a book by john lennox who i have no idea what he thinks he's an authority to speak on this but um <laughs> but it's it's a book that's about basically you know that here's some stuff science can't explain the mind whatever Tide um, goes in, tide goes out. Yeah. You can't explain that. <laughs> it's sort of a ridiculous <laughs> argument. By the way, it annoys me that in the um, written title, it's everything is one word, whereas on the front of the book, it's two words, or at least it appears to <laughs> Well, there's no hyphen, right? So it's two words. That, that just really annoys me. Um, another one I put in there is the Big Book of Bible Difficulties by Norm, Norm Geisler, or Norm Geisler, I forget how it's actually pronounced. And, and the reason I put that in is because, you know, Another area of doubts is Bible contradictions or tensions between areas of the gospel. So you're either basically going to have to get this or you're going to have to ha harmonize them in some other way. You know, maybe you'll get like Lydia McGrew's book, The Mirror and the, Ma the Mask and the Mirror, whatever it's called that I didn't include, which just calls these tensions undesigned coincidences and says that they actually make an even stronger evidence that it's all real. Yeah, for those uh, for those immense in in meme culture, it's a bit like the uh, meme where it's like, no, you can't just harmonize all the contradictions in the gospel. It's like <laughs> harmonizing machine goes boo, because <laughs> that's what this is. It's a harmonizing machine. They could just harmonize everything, right? So, 
that's what these books are for. Um, evidence that demands a verdict. So that that kind of tries to cover pretty much everything. Um, five proofs for the existence of God. So that's a slightly more Catholic perspective, but looks at some some sort of traditional type arguments. Uh, the reason for God that that tries to be like a modern kind of apologetic by Tim Tim Keller, who's like, I'm in New York with all these trendy kids who think they who are looking for meaning. Um, then mere Christianity, you've got to have that included in any stack. Um, I don't Probably have my least favorite apologetic book that I've ever read, Mere Christianity. <laughs> I don't have enough faith to be an atheist just because, you know, you might want to get some Frank Chorak in your life. Wait, the case it doesn't say his. Wait, it says it's by Norman Geisler. And, and Frank Chorak, yeah. They're oh, both on okay. the cover. I didn't but, see it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, the case for the resurrection of Jesus, because without thousands of pages of Gary Habermas, um, do you really know what happened at the resurrection? <laughs> How reason can lead to God, because this is popular and all the Christians are like ranting and raving about how this changed their view of contingency arguments. Jesus and the eyewitnesses, um, because again, that's another, if you're going to defend the resurrection, you have to have read Borkham's Jesus and the Eye eyewitnesses. And then I think, uh, oh yeah, On God by Craig, Reasonable Faith by Craig, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, by, uh, edited by Craig and Morland. Is God a Moral Monster? Uh, because you've got to have, you know, you've got to be able to answer those objections to the Old Testament. So by Paul Copan, the resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright, which is a different type of resurrection apologetic. But this is actually only, I think, the fifth book of a five part series. So you could if you really wanted to go down this route, you'd be looking at buying five books, you know, like the first of which sets the background um, history, for example, for the Roman world. Yeah, those, are around. those are much more academic, as is the last one here. Yeah. And the Black Hole Companion to Natural Theology. Um, and I think that this is the kind of expectation, this, this kind of stack of books that a lot of people sort of have for what you ought to have, ought to be aware of or have engaged with before. Yeah, you most sort of, of these books have been it. recommended to me um, or, or like comparable books. A, a few of them uh, at the start I haven't heard of, but I actually think this is this is quite fair. I had my own list, um, which actually. Yeah, you feel free if you want to go with yours. yours. So from obviously your experience is different to mine. Let me just show I should have actually put it on amazon actually makes a lot of sense which i didn't even think of now it says i'm still sharing but uh, you are, to... you're sharing one tab you can just copy and paste yeah, that's, or, that's what i want to share. share can you can you share it um yeah like if you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just so uh no that's not what i wanted to share though it's uh where is it yeah here it is so um many of these were on nathan's list but this was um basically these are all books that i could just just thinking about it recall having Sorry, I could recall th that Christians having recommended these books to me about specific issues. I think the only one that uh, the only exception to that would have been, uh, no, which one was it? Oh yeah, the problem of evil. I, I remember that Christians have recommended books to me about that. Like the problem of pain would be one, but you know, I wanted to put a different one on. So that's just one that I found. But anyway, so there are a variety of books there. But so what I've got is, um, yeah, like God and genocide in the Old Testament. That's a that's a big one. Um, I took the cheapest version I could find in the on the US store here, says mostly Kindle. Philosophical Foundation for a Christian Worldview. Um the um Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, which I call the Apologetics Bible, um, Resurrection of the Son of God, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, which I've had recommended numerous times, um, uh, and then the bomb reveal one that I mentioned. So that comes to about 160 US. And that's actually quite a lightweight list because I didn't include any of the general books like Reasonable Faith or um evidence that demands a verdict and things like that which you could easily put in as well but the thing is that once you start adding those in it's like it's hard to stop like there's so many of them so i just included specific like topic uh, topic focused or like the, the more academic ones that i've had recommended before or i would i say like you, you would kind of need to to uh, to respond to these arguments so um I, but the point is and it's interesting nathan and i did this entirely independently um and obviously i was a bit more lightweight approach but like the thing is it, it's I, I would say that it's entirely reasonable to say that for someone who's grasping, grappling with doubts and is being recommended books by people uh, and feels like that they need to sort of do, do their due diligence, that they would have to spend at least hundreds of dollars on these books, at, at like at least. And that's if they're buying like the cheapest version and, and so forth. And they could easily, like, you could easily spend thousands of dollars, depending on you know how far you go with it. And of course, that's just the money cost. Then you have to actually read the things like and, uh, and, and spend that time. But it's um. And this is this is a criticism Nathan and I've made before. It's basically like 
you set the bar high enough and no one will be able to get there. Uh, you, you just have make it so there's so many books you have to read uh, and that there's always the next book that, well, okay, if you didn't like Reasonable Faith, read Philosophical... No, if you didn't like On Guard, that wasn't enough, read Reasonable Faith. If that wasn't enough, read Philosophical Foundations for Christian Worldview. If that wasn't enough, try The Black Hole Companion. If that wasn't enough, then read all of Craig's like academic Well, Joshua Rasmussen has a completely different approach yeah. to Craig. Yeah, have exactly. you tried any of his? <laughs> exactly. Like it's, it's you know, it's... Uh, what, what what um what cures your ailment like is well have you tried this one maybe that that will work for you uh not to say again that this is always the approach but uh, i definitely hear this sort of talk and uh you, you can hear it on the channel like the youtube channel sometimes and so forth it's like um and in fact cameron talks about this like it's a feature like well actually if you didn't like this argument this version of the argument like there's a completely different formulation of the same argument which i think is really cool it's like <laughs> so it just well, that was what ends. i was gonna <laughs> all right go ahead yeah the, the Capturing Christianity post, the, the top three apologetics books Christian philosophers say you should read. And, that you know, this also fits in with some of the observations that we've made about how um, Christian publishing houses kind of play into this idea of that, you know, the endless publishing of books and, se you know, selling people the need to constantly buy and read these books and, and the kind of meme that's sold by um, Christian apologetic channels that, you know, you have to have all your books behind you and you have to um, be reading these books and have things to say about these books and so on. So here's... Uh, and so here's just article. another example of that that comes to mind is Cameron's tour of whoever's library that was oh, yeah. and how much Scott he was Hand. making a big deal of how impressive the size of the library was. Like that, that that's just an oh, example. Oh my of God. Sort of <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, so o over the course of a month or so, I asked a number of Christian philosophers what three books they recommend to Christians with an interest in apologetics. In, in what? With, with an interest in apologetics read. Apologetics read? I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I didn't notice that. And <laughs> I asked a number of Christian philosophers what three books they recommend Christians with an interest in <laughs> no, I, I don't even know what he was trying to say. Well, I know what he was trying to say, but I don't know what, like, the mistake yeah. is exactly. Yeah, what, what me too. It's like broken me. It's broken me. I, I would, I would rephrase that whole second floor. I would say I asked a number of Christian philosophers which three books they would recommend to Christians with an interest or who have an interest in reading about apologetics or maybe just apologetics in fact you maybe he's trying to say apologetics reading maybe there's a yeah but you don't know, just say like you've I know said books you don't need to say reading <laughs> just say who have an interest in apologetics like that's fine okay that, that sentence that. is that's broken me. Sentence. <laughs> <laughs> i have an interest in apologetics read cameron i will read the rest of the article <laughs> read good <laughs> <laughs> the results have actually been really interesting Oh, and this is what this is part of the thing though that does annoy me about Cameron is like the the results have actually been this like fake enthusiasm. I've collaborated the results below. At the end of this post, I've listed the top three books recommended by all respondents. The list is in alphabetical order by surname, which is good. Um, though there are a couple, there are a couple exceptions here and there. <laughs> Though so I'm not there trying are to be a exceptions. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I, I was just sort of skimming through through that first part when I looked at this. Yeah, this is really uh, bad. Written, though there oh, are a couple of exceptions here and there. Notice that the most PhD on the list hold PhDs also... or something similar. Like, no, what what is or something similar here? You know, for, yeah, but, also, but also this is interesting. The 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 PhD should not have an apostrophe uh, because the PhD doesn't own the in philosophy, right? PhDs is a uh, in fact, you should probably just say most hold a PhD in philosophy because you don't even really want to pluralize PhD because presumably not many of them have more than one. But it's also this this, th this apologetic grandstanding of, you know, like what... Um, oh, well, yeah. I mean, just, yeah. that goes without saying. Of how important it is to have a degree which creates this atmosphere where people feel the need to, you know, create fake degrees and, and get unaccredited degrees and so on. Um, Sorry, the, the criticism of the grammar is sort of beside the point, but I just find it amusing how many mistakes there were in such a short passage. It's likely you'll encounter a name you haven't heard before. Um, also important, I did not restrict the answers they gave to works written by others. Oh, okay. So I, he's just saying they could have... I was wondering themselves. about that as well. Um, it's taken quite a bit of work, but all the books have been hyperlinked for your purchasing convenience. And it's like, you know, you can just see the, yeah, the publishers salivating at the mouth. Enjoy. So Ben Arbor, God of Man, the case to the no, case for the Christ Bible by is the is the book that's recommended, <laughs> which I think is extremely cringe, but whatever. Oh, I sorry, yeah, I thought I thought that was like I can't believe that that it's just the Bible. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, 
the case for Christ is number two. I mean, that's just a joke, isn't it? I mean, that is such a bad book, The Case for Christ. Uh, I think I, I'm trying to remember. I may have audio booked it back in the day, but I don't remember too much about it. The, the, the best criticism I know out there of The Case for Christ is the podcast episode by Ian Mills and L Laura Robinson, um, Christian PhDs in... Oh, I did listen to that. That was a really history. good episode. Yeah, episode number 30, where they talk about how disingenuous Strobel is, how he only talks to people, how he claims he's being an earnest skeptic, but the only people he interviews are fundamentalist evangelicals. He doesn't get any other perspectives on it, how it's not representative of scholarship in the field around the resurrection, all those sorts of things. Um, David Baggett, Reasonable Faith, William Lane Craig. Uh, Love God with All Your Mind, J.P. Morland. Not heard of that one. Making Sense of God, Tim Keller. So, But in terms of so ones we've read, should we say, I, um, so the Bible, I've read that. I've, I've read all three of these suggestions. Um, I've read two of these suggestions. I haven't heard of the J.P. Morland one. Um, where the conflict really lies. So that's about the conflict between science and religion. I've not read that one, but I'm aware of some of its content. And knowledge of God. Is there a God, Richard Swinburne? Uh, so I've not read any of those three. Uh, Modern Science and Ancient Faith, Stephen Barr. Miracles, yes, these are Luke Barnes' suggestions. The Case for Christ. Why is Luke Barnes doing suggesting the case for Christ? Fucking hell, Luke. Come on. Well, why is he suggesting C.S. Lewis? I don't think I've read Miracles, but if it's anything like the two C.S. Lewis that I have read, so The Problem of Pain and Mere Christianity, I think it's really bad. I mean, it's convincing to a lot of people, I suppose, so in that sense it's good, but he just Miracles sucks at arguing. Like, C.S. Lewis sucks at presenting a coherent, concise rational argument like i gotta put it out there like he just is crap at that Mir miracles is the one where c.s lewis gives the argument from reason so we, we review oh uh, yeah we've talked about yeah so we, we have we did look through parts of that yeah uh, okay yeah so that's further evidence that it's not a good book <laughs> is that yeah it, it is, i mean i think it is an interesting puzzle when approached in good faith like what c.s lewis is trying to get at with that argument from reason thing but yeah it's kind of uh, it, it, the way the way he presents it just isn't in a way that any naturalist who's who, who's actually thought about the subject is going to agree to all the premises there. It's, and, and it and it it's misrepresenting potentially complex topic topic to like a lay audience as well, which is is uh, a frustrating thing. Kelly James Clark, um, reason for the hope within five views on apologetics, which does have a have Kelly James Clark in it and dialogues concern. So the dialogues concerning yeah, my natural boy. religion by Hume. Yeah, I like that. I like oh, that. There's yeah. actually. Wait, what was it? The exact can we go? What was the exact question that he um that that uh, Cameron asked them? I don't know if he says the exact question. Well, like uh, he, he, I asked a number of Christian philosophers which three books they would recommend to Christians who have an yeah okay. So it's not specifically apologetics books. It's just yeah. What would you recommend to Christians who have an interest in apologetics? And so I think which it's makes really it good even... that you include a book by some skeptic. Like yeah. imagine the uh, the audacity. <laughs> I mean, Which it's makes it even weirder, the case for Christ. It's possible that Cameron did not word it exactly that way in, in the emails, of course. But, I mean, that's the way he's presented it here. So that's how he yeah, responds yeah. to it. So, yeah, got on you, Kelly James Clark, for including a skeptic there. So it, we're seeing a lot of the same. Um, so some different ones. Is there a good God? Well, view on the evidence. going back. Yeah. A view on the evidences of Christian. I think this is the one that makes the arguments... Uh, this is the one that makes an argument that um, Lydia McGrew has tried to the, the undesigned coincidences one. I think that that's what this book is um, about eyewitnesses and so forth. Philosophical foundations for a Christian worldview, mere Christianity, the reason for God. Uh, William Lane Craig, one on God, William Lane Craig. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I should think that's kind of good. Like if you think that you've written the best book on something, like right, right. say that, like I, I actually, that yeah, kind of makes sense to me. Uh, the case for Christ. I can't believe it. The case for yeah, Christ. That kind of surprised me. I don't know what Jesus under fire is. Yeah, I, that's weird. That I've not heard of that one, but oh, there we go. Dustin Cromit, um, The Existence of God, The Resurrection of God Incarnate, Richard, so two Richard Swinburne's, and Horrendous Evils and the Goodness of God by Marilyn McCord Adams. Uh, that, I think those are good suggestions, actually. For, um, oh, Gruthius. I've got his uh, big book on apologetics. Actually, do I have it here? Oh, no, I think I packed it away. Uh, on God again. Uh, Chesterton, Orthodoxy. All old ones. Tim McGrew, A View of the Evidences of Christianity. Yeah, so so this, this is what, I, what I'm saying about the undesigned coincidences. Yeah, this is definitely... Oh, I didn't mean to click on him. Whoops. Um, yeah, and then and then 
undesigned coincidences <laughs> um and mere christianity Tyler's i actually find it surprising that there's so little overlap between the lists actually if you look at the bottom cameron gives the top three and like apart from case for christ nothing had more than three votes i think so mm. not votes you know callum uh, miller that's interesting. um i don't know him he's um do you remember when we reviewed um six plus hours against the resurrection and we had max baker heitch and callum miller where callum miller's like yeah the evidence is overwhelming and max ah, was that like, guy yes, yes maybe we should just be a little bit more uh yeah, <laughs> chilled. yeah. The, the two whose voices i couldn't tell apart right yeah yeah <laughs> glenn peoples um jesus and the eyewitnesses josh rasmussen randall rouser peter van invergen Oh, he gave more. He gave five. Well, yeah, he said uh, apparently his answer was a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> In that he can't count to three. <laughs> no, Who's Dr. Like... Anonymous? What does that mean? Yeah, that's what... maybe these are Cameron's recommendations. I know. Or maybe that's Ravi Zacharias. <laughs> 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 Sorry. So, okay, top three was On, on Guard. Um, Is There a God by Swinburne, which I think we'll do a future bad apologetics on. Yeah, I need uh, to read Swinburne. It's on the list. It's on the list. The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel was number one. What the hell? So there's the, I guess, again, here, there's a lot to read. And if you don't, you know, yeah. if one doesn't suit, there's there's plenty more to, to look at. So, um, yeah, I think that that's interesting to see what that role sort of, uh, sorry, the role that that plays uh, in, in the apologetics discourse. Now, I want to, I think I'm going to present this last thing that I, um, that I looked into and then and then head off. Uh, sure, you can see my <laughs> cough is getting worse. Yeah, uh, where are we? So, yes, okay. So I just looked in. Is that Eastwell Ministries? Apologetics Ministries. It doesn't look right for. Some Hang reason. on, where where are you? <laughs> ministries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I think it is right. Yeah, it is yeah. right. Yeah, it's, you know how that weird thing where it just doesn't look. Yeah, right for some I know what you mean. I I, I, had that I, I read it and I'm like, white. does that say mini series? And then, I, no, I had no, it once ministry. with the word white, where I, I couldn't <laughs> tell. I, I was like, I, I wrote them all out next to each other. W-H-I-T-E, W-Y-T-E, and uh, W-I-G-H-T. And I was just I was just staring at them, like trying to figure out which one it was. And I, was, I think this was in an exam once, actually. Um, oh, dear. So there's a, this is from Cross Examined, uh, where I, sorry, they have a, a pretty good list of the major Obviously, this is English language uh, apologetics ministries. Um, yeah. And I just sort of made a list of these here. Um, most of these will be familiar to listeners, but I, I just think it's interesting to sort of have a bit of a look through them. Also, on this website here, the, the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, which was mentioned earlier, I had a look and I found financials for a few of them. Um, some of them have already been mentioned. So like reasonable faith, approximately 1 million in donations. Um, but the, the, the point that I wanted to make one of the points that I wanted to make here is how many of these are associated with a specific person, like often in the name or even if not in the name uh, on the base, like reasonable faith is based on William Lane Craig's work. So Jane Warner Wallace, he does cold, ca cold case Christianity uh, stand to reason. I don't actually know who's that associated with. Uh, oh, stand to reason. Is it, it red pen. It's the red pen logic guy. Um, Greg. Oh, I don't that, oh that Let me, oh, too, so, different. so I'm not sure about that one. Um, I'll find, I'll find uh, it. Um, what's his I'll just name? Sorry, yeah, I don't know what this link was here. But um, yeah, so John Lennox has his own site. Frank Turek has cross-examined. Sorry? Greg Kukul. Right. As is in Genesis, well, we know about that one. They have about $100 million in annual revenue. So they were on that, that website as well. Now, I think a lot of that may come from their, uh, what was the thing that they have? The, um, what, the ARC? The ARC, yeah, yeah. Because it, it it breaks it down by like donations and then other revenue. Most of these groups that I looked at, it's just overwhelmingly donations, which makes sense, right? But for for um, answers to Genesis, actually the majority was other revenue, um, and based on that, it actually looked like that their other revenue and like exp other expenses were like I I don't know that the mark the arc is making them a lot of money let me put it that way from looking at the financials because they had a lot of expenses as well. But I guess you, you don't know what those are on. But anyway, um, so but they're big like um as i said including 30 million dollars just in donations so like excluding other revenues uh which is actually pretty insane uh because what why is that insane to me i think it's because i maybe it's just what i look at like because answers in genesis is 
not discussed very much within the apologetic space that I look at. I don't Um, think they interface much with atheists. I think it, yeah, that's probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, So I don't know. The fact that they've got so much money just is is interesting to me. And obviously that's associated with um, our wonderful national export from Australia. Uh, What's his, what's his, what's his name? Uh, Uh, Ken Ham. Ken Ham. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. So that's basically his, his baby there. Um, Tim Keller, Tim Keller, Ed Fazer, um, Paul Copan, uh, Norm uh, Geisler, uh, Tim McGrew, who at Historical Apologetics, and Hank Hanegraaff as well at equip.org. Uh, are there major ones there that, that are that I think those are, those are most of the big ones, um, like the ministry sort of things. Um, yeah. And at a, at a quick, like, it, it's hard to know how, what sort of donations these get because it varies a fair bit, but I think it's reasonable to say that many of them are going to be like a, a, roughly the one million or maybe a few hundred thousand kind of level for maybe some of the smaller ones. So, the point is that there's like a lot of these ministries and they have a lot of resources available. And then you, you put that against, well, who's doing the, like the counter apologetics <laughs> ministries. It's like, well, probably the, 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 the closest example that I can think of would be, um, and it was mentioned in this document, uh, Richard Carrier, because he has his own kind of, I don't know, like skeptical ministry thing in the courses that he offers. And I have no idea how much, how much money he makes. I suspect I it's probably maybe Bart Ehrman as well. He has, he's doing courses. That's now. a fair point, but uh, Bart yeah. Ehrman, um, yeah, I, I guess it's a little different focus, but yeah, that would that would be fair. Is Bart is Bart Ehrman an atheist, like, or is he? He he is agnostic, so yeah, I suppose. Yeah, okay. But 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 sort he, I think, yeah, I think I think he has subscription to his website blog posts might cost money or something. I, maybe I'm wrong about that. And uh, but at least now I know he's he's aiming at doing online courses. Yeah. Okay. So but, maybe you put him in that Christians category as could well. Take them as well. You know, like they're not they're, they're supposed to just be new testament courses not like yeah it, that's it, it feels a little bit different but yeah maybe you put him in that category as well um so and then there's i guess the austin atheist group uh american atheists although they're a, a bit i think they're more fo- policy focused actually than yeah outreach. abortion and things like that yeah yeah uh and then there's like uh james randy but they don't really do anything about religion they're just sort of skeptical so th- the point is that it's i think c- pretty clear that it's not like a lot of it's just left to like schmoes on YouTube uh, to respond to this sort of stuff, uh, you know, like Nathan and myself. So it's, yeah, I, I just think it's interesting to to look at that. Um, I also, I mean, there's the YouTube channels as well. I couldn't actually be bothered going through and doing analytics uh, for the YouTube channels and comparing the main uh, uh, Christian and, and sort of atheist channels. And actually one of the difficulties there is there are a lot of old atheist channels. Well, that's maybe not the right word. Right. There are a lot of like new atheism channels. So like they were active in of. the late 2000s, early 2010s that aren't very active these days. So it's a little bit hard to know how to, because I don't think they interact with much of the counter apologetics very much. So I'm not quite sure where they fit in this space. So like the internet atheist is probably the, is that his name? No, th- sorry, not the internet atheist, the amazing. Amazing. Atheist. Yeah. yeah. He's probably the best well-known of these figures. And I think he's still sort of active, but I don't think he talks about, I think he talks more about like policy and, and culture sort of stuff these days. Or someone um, like Thunderfoot who just makes videos, I think now. That's about, another like, example. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, yeah. He'd be another one. Yeah. So there are quite a few people in this early sort of wave, like I guess about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago now, who either are not active anymore or have kind of like uh, diverged into um other focuses so it's a little bit hard to know how to count those so i decided i couldn't be bothered to diving down that but there's there's this more of more recent uh wave of christian apologetics channels which is like caption christianity and inspiring philosophy uh and uh those are two that come to mind what, what are some of the others um capturing what's um Christian? is that capturing christianity Sorry. yeah yeah of course i see yeah. that oh yeah braxton's channel trinity radio it's smaller um, yeah yeah so there's, there's a number of these that are relatively recent um and um yeah, so I think that oh, and apparently, uh, apparently, uh, Banana Guy is doing really well on YouTube as well, which I had no idea about. This, right. So, yeah, it, there's that's there's that space as well. Um, and uh, now I, I don't know if you put this to talk about doubts. I don't know anything about this. This is Jonathan McClatchy's. Yeah, this is this is Jonathan McClatchy's creation, as far as I'm aware. And um, basically, you sign up on the website, and it, I, I think it's just. You know, it, it 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 just sends an email to to Jonathan or someone else, whoever runs the thing, and but but the idea is that network to it. You know, all, a bunch of these apologists then can like agree to have like an hour long conversation with you about your doubts if you sign up for um, one of these conversations. I actually did have a conversation with Jonathan um, through this website when I was deconverting, and he just basically. I, I mean, I think the video is up on YouTube, but he just basically ranted at me for about an hour about like. It, just listing historical facts and undesigned coincidences that I 
hadn't like come across before and it it just wasn't useful for me whatsoever or didn't engage with I, I mean I'm not saying it couldn't be right but um again there's nothing like this the other way around in terms of are you thinking of leaving atheism well before you do here's Matt Dillahunty's phone number um you know yeah well because atheists don't or naturalists or whoever don't agonize about or like or very rarely do they agonize about all someone's considering Christianity. That, that's another thing where I think it's just, there's an asymmetry. Like, it's just not not the same. People don't agonize about doubt and worry about, oh, he's exploring religion. we, we got to do something. We have to have an intervention. Like, it's just not a thing. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you can find one example where that happens. But, you know, like, it's not it's not the same. Um, a, a couple of other main YouTube channels. So there's Frank Turek has his cross-examiners. Then there's Reasonable Faith, uh, which is active. But Sean McDowell, that was another one that I had on the tip of my tongue. Um, it's a big one as well. Oh, and Unbelievable. Yeah, which is right, like more yeah. of a radio thing, but they're pretty active on YouTube. Yes, yeah, so that would be another one. Um, anyway, so there's there's quite a uh, quite a lot of um, activity on YouTube, and I, I would I didn't do the metrics on this, but I I think that those channels, like taken collectively, get more activity than a lot of the counter apologetics focused atheist channels. Although Rationality Rules does really well, he's one of the bigger ones. Um, but th yeah, that. They don't necessarily. I think Rationality Rules actually focuses quite a bit on that. Some of the other channels, like I think Genetically Modified Skeptic, talks about some other issues as well that are a bit broader. So it's hard to get a fair comparison, I think. But anyway, um, so that's another avenue here. Now, the last thing that I wanted to mention was uh, a bit more about the financials because this this group here, the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, um, was actually quite a useful source of information there because they do have uh, available information about at least some of these organizations. Um, now, in terms of who is, um, like, which organizations are part of this, they, they represent evangelical Christian organizations and churches, um, which qualify for tax-exempt nonprofit status. So that's actually one point that pretty much all of these institutions that we've been talking about qualify for tax-exempt status. So no taxes. Uh, as to whether that's going to be the case for atheists or free-thinking groups, uh, that's going to be dependent on uh, on the, the jurisdiction. I, I can really only speak to the case in Victoria, where I live, and... Um, the requirements for tax deductibility, like basically if, if you're, if you're the standard that they have here is that if you're, if one of your goals is promotion of religion, like it's, it's automatic. You can, I mean, you have to establish you're part of a religion, right? But, but promotion of religion itself is sufficient, right? So uh, any apologetics group would be, w would get that through essentially. Now, if you're a, a skeptic or like um, rationalist type group, you, you don't have that, right? So there are other there are other potential avenues you could take. So promotion of like science is one, but then there's restrictions to that, right? Um, and then there's other possible groups that you like an educational focus. But the point is that it's harder, at least, at least where I live. I think this may be the case in the US as well, but I don't know. It's harder for skeptic or um, rationalist type groups to get tax deductible status because they don't get that automatic promotion of religion. So therefore it's, it's tax deductible. So whether they can is going to depend on the specifics of the environment. But I think that that's relevant to know as well. Also, um, not mentioned here, but I remember I wanted to mention this before because of regarding Christian colleges, because of the fact that they are religious institutions. I, I don't know if this is a federal thing or a state thing. Based on what I read, I think, I guess it's a federal thing. But it, at least in many places in the U.S., and maybe it's everywhere in the U.S., because of their religious affiliation, they're exempt from anti-discrimination laws. And so they can expel students right, for being yes. gay and, you know, for having views that they don't like and so forth. So normally you wouldn't be able to do that, right? Um, and no secular institution would be able to expel students because they were religious, right? But you can do that in reverse from a religious institution. So I think that there's clear, like, legal double standards here, which I really just like. But so it's it's not a level playing field in that respect. Um, but regarding the financials of these groups, um, so that it, it is not all of these are like apologetics groups, although I think they're all evangelical in, in, well, yeah, it says right there, they're all evangelical in purpose. So there's some churches here, uh, there'd be seminaries as well as, uh, like evangel, uh, sorry, apologetic ministries. Um, the total annual revenues as of 2015 of these organizations, most of which again in the, are in the U S was $25 billion. So. If I had to put a number on, like, how big is the apologetics industrial complex, at least in the English language, right? Like, what, what's the total, like, revenue uh, in, in terms of donations and 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 um, book sales and college degrees that relate to it and so forth? It's hard to say. I would say that this $25 billion is, I, I mean, that's not all organizations, right? Although many of the big ones do seem to be part of that. But but the $25 billion is going to count stuff that probably shouldn't be counted as uh, as apologetics per se. Um but I would, I, I mean, if I had to guess uh, an order of magnitude, I would say like $10 billion. Um, I don't think that's unreasonable, which includes like the the colleges, the the, the publishing industry, the the ministries themselves, um, you know, because like, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the Answers in Genesis alone has $100 million in revenue. 
uh, and, and many of these organizations um, that I looked up, where were they? It was back here, was it? Now I can't find it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's the colleges. I don't know if colleges are actually part of that group. I, I suspect that they're probably not, but now why, why can't I find this list that I just had here? That's the books. Where, where are the... Many of the organizations on this list that I can't find uh, were not actually on that website. Which well, list are you looking for in the section? List of, list of, oh, it's right here. It's like literally, yeah. <laughs> literally right here. Yeah, yeah. So I looked up, I think, pretty much all of these groups. Uh, and uh, I, I gave the numbers for the ones that I could find. So so many of them aren't even on there. I mean, some of these are probably a bit smaller, but uh, like I don't think Ed Faser has a, like an organization per se, but uh, some of these definitely do. Well, he's uh, part of a group. Catholic university, the same as, well, yeah. uh, you know, Alexander Proust. They, they both teach at Catholic universities. So that's another, I mean, we've looked mostly at evangelicals, but that's another side of this. And the, and the salaries that come with tenured positions and things as well in these institutions. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's that whole side of it as well. But anyway, I, I just, you know, I, I like to quantify things. And so I was like, if I had to put a number on it, what would it be? I think $10 billion is actually quite reasonable and and, and conservative uh, because there's probably a lot that's not included there. But but that gives you some baseline. Now, what would the, what would the like, counter-apologetics, atheism promotion uh, industrial complex be? <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, but it's going to be a heck of a lot less than that. Um, yeah, I, I'd be surprised if it's like... I'd be surprised if it's a hundred million dollars and it's probably a lot like, like who's doing this? Like it's, it's not many it, people. Maybe arguably a book like the, the God delusion has been so widely purchased that that could have quite a lot of money behind it. But other than something like that, True. I can't really think of. Remember though, that it, it's important to be, to be consistent with, with standards. Like, cause I wouldn't include in apologetics, any Christian evangel like book that's evangelizing. Uh, I'm just trying to focus on the ones yeah. that are like yeah, apologetic. I, I and so, yeah. God Delusion is kind of like borderline there. Um, but also, yeah, like, so God Delusion, some of those big books would be the main ones, but that's like, um, how much revenue would have they made collectively per year? This is $25 yeah. billion dollars per year. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, yeah, you're right. So there's some books that have done well um, that, you know, we could put it initially put in the category, but I just think it's interesting that it, it, it's, it's not even comparable, like in terms of, uh, if you try to compare like with like, there is so much more money and institutional uh, um, organizational clout and, and uh, ability in the apologetics category than anything in the counter apologetic category. Even if you put like professional philosophers of religion in there, actually, we didn't even much talk about that, but um, there aren't that many atheists publishing in philosophy of religion journals against this stuff. There are a few, but not very many. Um, and uh, so adding those doesn't even really change it very much. So um yeah, I think this is interesting and should inform our judgments about the the state of the discourse. And um, I think just like if if you saw in politics, one side had like a hundred times as much money than the other, that should cause you to be suspicious about like how fair the, the discourse was. Likewise, in apologetics and counter apologetics, the fact that one side has like a hundred times as much money as the other side uh, should also lead you to think, well, uh, maybe I need to make more of an effort. I mean, this is probably not true of people in this stream, right? But I'm thinking particularly in Christians who are like, well, I read the best Christians, the best atheists, right? It's like, well, or did you though? Like, and I just think that there's not a, a, a um, there's just not a conceptualization of the importance of this point about like follow the money, what we started with, right? Um, of course, this by itself, I mean, this should go without saying, this by itself has no direct bearing on the status of any of the arguments, right? Like, th that should go without saying. We've done like, 20 plus streams on talking about the arguments um following the money is also important when you're assessing the the, the broader um the, the like the broader movement the broader situation and also individually if you're trying to think like well how fair a shake have i given these different uh like these different positions um if you just kind of like don't make as if you don't make a concerted effort the better funded side will, will probably you, you'll probably find it easier and like more persuasive um just because that like they've got better material like you just look up stuff on youtube but they've got the better more persuasive you know um pithy videos like I can't put up as good videos as reasonable faith does in terms of the quality and so forth. I don't have a million dollars in revenue. Like, so these things matter is, is the point there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, I think what I wanted to finish out on. Um, is there anything, Nathan, you wanted to just say in response to what I just said before I, before no, I, I say my goodbyes? No, it's uh, all, all good points there. there. There are a couple more things that I think that I will talk about after you're gone. Just yeah, yeah, to yeah. Round there was the a bit episode. that we haven't got to that I, I did want you to cover, but I'm going to bow out. <laughs> um, I hope you've not got, been made more ill by doing this uh, episode. I hope it's not exacerbated your symptoms. <laughs> well, I think only reading those quotes from the <laughs> social science curriculum, like about women's rights and slavery and so on, I think that those did, but yeah. mostly not. <laughs> yeah. I, 
I think something to say about this episode, though, as well, I, I guess while you're still here, is that, that there's so much more we could... Like, this this episode could almost have been boundless in the sense that there's so yeah. much more that we could have talked about or could have gone into and quantified. And so we're, we're only really, I think, scratching the surface with even, you know, a very long stream where we just kind of touch on a bunch of these different topics and point to a bunch of things to say, you know, here's some considerations to do with the kind of power dynamics that are in play and underpin um, apologetics. Yeah, I'm actually surp somehow surprised at just how how much uh, just money and uh, there there is in these. Um, but yeah, anyway, food for thought. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, the car streams are still experimental, but I, I'm I, glad at least some people are uh, are benefiting from those. Um, but yeah, it's uh, getting the slick polish videos of reasonable faith, even with their incorrectly labeled axes and things is, uh, <laughs> that, that costs money all right thanks everyone hopefully you found this interesting uh i don't know what the next ba is going to be but we'll we'll talk yeah we'll out. we'll sort it out um and go over to james photo's channel and subscribe of course if you haven't already yeah and buy like 500 copies of unreasonable faith so i can i can catch up <laughs> <laughs> <Great. Exactly. laughs> reasonable faith. yeah all right and leave see a you guys review. see you james bye okay so it's just me what are we gonna do? Watch the so so. There's 90 people watching now, which is actually a little bit up than it was 10 minutes ago. But um, we're just gonna watch the numbers. <laughs> okay. So in terms of the things I wanted to look at then um, after this, so what one of them is going to be to do with Christian philosophy of religion and funding differences. So before we do that, um, something to look into is. The Templeton Foundation and John Templeton. So, is this? But I'm trying. I'm trying to just find the right, the right section. So there was this. Going back to the one of the books that I was reading at the start. God in proof. And I'm going to interview the the author of this book at some point. By the way, so. And this is all about Richard Swinburne and, and, and his apologetics at the start. I want to get to the bit where it talks about um, uh, where is it? Where it talks about the Templeton Foundation. John Templeton and his I don't know, is this the right bit? Okay. Where is it? <laughs> I'll just read a bit and see if it's the if it, if it's the right place and if it's not that's too bad. Um This is actually a little bit frustrating. I'm sure I'm sure I put something in the text with my highlighter to sort of here we go each time I pass St Anne's uh, I couldn't help so this is in Oxford I couldn't help but look across the road and see the entrance to Green Templeton College the name Templeton was very much on my mind it's hard to think of one Sir John without the other John Pokinghorn who's um he's an Anglican physicist and theologian who talks about science and and religion and John Templeton were friends and allies. Poginghorn once won a Templeton Prize, and the John Templeton Foundation was funding the conference, just as it had funded planting a send-off. The handful of other journalists uh, there covering it had all been on Templeton Cambridge Journalism Fellowships. Many of the presenters had been getting Templeton grants for decades. Thinkers' thoughts are their own, but the money has to come, and was definitely coming from somewhere. So... I, and I think even Unbelievable and Premier Christian Radio are also brought to you by the Templeton uh, Religious Trust. A lot of these people who you'll see, you know, like Ryan Mullins, who who does the Open Theism stuff. I mean, their 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 kind of projects and so forth are funded by like, the Te Templeton uh, Religious Trust. Um, Eugen Nagasawa, who's at Birmingham University, he's got that book Maximal God on ontological arguments and he's doing a lot he, he's started like a philosophy of religion program there he's doing a lot of philosophy of religion PhDs a lot of the funding for the projects that they you know Templeton Religious Trust again John Mark Templeton knew well the conventional wisdom that Richard Swinburne spent his career fighting 
the idea that history is supposed to go like this. Science advances, modernity follows. God retreats, repeat, until religion is gone. It's a story credited to those Enlightenment thinkers, from Descartes to Kant, who challenged the religion of their day in the name of reason, even if they thought true religion was what they were saving. For those who want religion to have a future, this story is at best a fallacy, at worst a tragedy, but for Templeton, it was an opportunity. At a bargain price, he was liable to say, you've got to look for where the public is most frightened and pessimistic. When potential value far exceeds the asking price, a lot can be done with a little. This was a maxim that served him well, making him one of the most successful investors of the 20th century. In his second career as philanthropist, uh, through his annual Bigger Than the Nobel Templeton Prize and the multi-billion dollar John Templeton Foundation, he used it in an attempt to hijack how we think about the meaning of life. Templeton's life was a paragon of the American dream. He was born in 1912 in Winchester, Tennessee, less than 100 miles from the scene of the Scopes trial, to a family to, to a family fairly well off for a poor corner of the world. The upbuilding aphorisms of Benjamin Franklin instilled in him the value of single-minded hard work, thrift and tireless enthusiasm. Uh, from his mother, meanwhile, he acquired an eclectic spirituality, particularly through the then fashionable Unity School movement, which emphasized positive thinking and healing through prayer. Uh, Unity considered itself progressive and even loosely speaking scientific, a practical application of Christianity to modern life. Uh, Templeton was and would always remain a loyal Presbyterian. Uh, Calvinist industriousness and habitual optimism proved a mighty combination. Beyond any expectation as thinkable in Winchester, he made his way to Yale and from there to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, success wasn't long in coming. His first big play as a stock picker is now legendary. In the fall of 1939, as Germany was invading Poland, Templeton bought $100 of stock in every company, company on the market, selling for no more than a dollar per share. He knew that war would have the biggest effect on those at the bottom of the barrel, and it did. A few years later, the military economy had quadrupled his investment. Templeton moved on from war profiteering to become an architect of globalization. With a string of firms bearing his name, expanding corporate ownership through mutual funds and pioneering the hunt for investment bargains abroad. Those who knew Templeton as a businessman talk about his, eccent his eccentricity eccentricities fondly in hallowed tones. Broad meetings always began with board meetings, not broad meetings. Gosh, uh, board meetings always began with a prayer. He was famously frugal with his time, keeping a tireless to the minute schedule and streamlining every task and appointment. Later in life, he became a prodigious faxer, though he never took to email. A woman who had been his receptionist at Templeton Foundation once whispered to me, he loved everyone. Um, okay, so yeah, he, he was knighted. Well, he became a British, British citizen. Once he was a British citizen, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth for um, philanthropy, for founding the Green Templeton College at Oxford. Um, growing older and wealth ever multiplying, Templeton began to turn his attention away from business. All my life, I was trying to help people get wealthy and with a little success, but I never noticed it made them any happier. Uh, real wealth is not in money, it's in spiritual growth. Just as thorough research always guided his investment decisions, Templeton believed that religion should follow where the evidence leads. He liked to rhapsodize about science's amazing progress in virtually every area of knowledge over the past century, except religion, he would say, which remains stagnant. It is no small wonder, then, that some people believe religion is gradually becoming obsolete. Templeton wrote in his manifesto, the humble approach, scientists discover God. For him, this made religion the perfect investment. He bought in with his foundation, hoping to discover over 100 fold more about realities which can be called spiritual. So, so, that, so the aim of the foundation is to discover more about realities which can be called spiritual. So it, it isn't to debunk, debunk these claims or to address them. And so that's why we see a kind of asymmetry in the type of funding offered by the foundation. It, a, an asymmetry in the funding offered by philosophy of religion, because Templeton Foundation is like the big one, right? As its character says, in the bombast that is typical of his prose, what he envisioned wasn't simply a louder, timelier enunciation of familiar doctrines, but a posture called humility theology, emphasizing how little believers know about the divine and how much they need to question and test their beliefs as scientists do. He thought that science could get religions out of their rut. Um, but yeah, he loved repeating the sayings of far-flung sages, from Buddha to Norman Vincent Peale, from Socrates to Mary Baker Eddy. Spirituality in Templeton's usage is so much properly 
is not so much properly theological or even especially Christian than it is well-meaning self-help with a metaphysical bent. Uneasy with conventional meanings for God and religion, he speculated in a 1990 document, maybe God is providing new revelations in ways which go beyond any religion. He even seems to have thought that if religion were more sophisticated, the line between belief and unbelief might disappear. In a Spinoza's term, he once mused, could even atheists who deny the reality of a personal God begin to worship fundamental reality or unlimited mind or unlimited love. Uh, John Templeton died in 2008 at the age of 95. By then, in just over two decades, his foundation had already transformed the ways and means of religion-related research. The number of medical schools with spirituality in their curriculums went from a tiny minority to a solid majority. Researchers who before could expect little more than paltry grants for a sabbatical started overseeing multi-million dollar projects that brought together physics physicists, philosophers, neuroscientists, and theologians to study topics such as godly love and eschatology from a cosmic perspective. The National Science Foundation won't fund a cosmologist to think about what the structure of the universe tells us about God or a biologist to study traces of divine purpose on evolution, but Templeton will. Uh, the foundation shows off its roster of, of eminent grantees with full page ads in major magazines about big questions, like does the universe have a purpose? Does science make God obsolete? Templeton money is convincing people in and out of the academy that the existence of God can be a respectable question for science after all. Those in the money's way can hardly believe their luck. It's such a privilege to be alive and working in this field during this era, said William Lane Craig, when I asked him about Templeton. I saw the founding of the SCP and the Society of Christian Philosophers, the founding of the EPS, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, the beginning of the renaissance of Christian philosophy, and then this incredible renaissance of work between science and religion that Sir John Templeton spearheaded. And Craig is one of the many eager to show how science properly construed and Templeton funded can do the genre of bidding. Um, so yeah, that, that's a bit about the background of Templeton, his aims and goals, and the Templeton Foundation, which funds, ba basically, if you want to do a PhD in philosophy of religion, your options are self-fund or get like a Templeton grant. Now, that there's a few other options out there, but they're, they're broadly, you know, they're, they're the major two. And I think this shows the kind of biased skew in terms of the funding that there is that produces this selection effect for um, research, which is looking in a very particular direction and not looking to address you know some of the, some of the claims that maybe christian uh, apologetic spent um philosophers might be kind of going in with their research programs in march 2003 templeton foundation sponsored a meeting at stanford university called universe or multiverse so that's to do with obviously the fine-tuning argument and 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 the different High, uh, and the multiverse being postulated as an explanation of the fine-tuning argument that naturalists can accept. Um, so Robin Collins, who James and I have talked about before uh, when we in our fine-tuning episode, was there, as was the Don Page and another evangelical Christian. Um, there were also a couple of atheists there invited. can't remember if there's anything useful in this section it, with regards to the point I'm trying to make here. And then we talked we talked about um, the, Calif the, the industry in California. So that hopefully gives you some idea of the asymmetry that's available in philosophy of religion funding if you're going to do a sort of spirituality religion sympathetic project versus if you're if you're looking to do a um critical sort of project especially you know if, if so, so there's basically you know no money in the game for tearing these things down for, for addressing these arguments okay what was the other thing i wanted to have a look at from the document so we did how much does it leave to co co cost to leave the faith um Expertise versus selection effects. This was the Cruz's survey. And I didn't have a... Okay. This is the thing by Helen, Justin, Vine, Justin Weinberg. Daily news. Why are so many philosophers of religion theists? 
72%, 72, oh my gosh, I, I just can't read at this point or talk. 72.8% of the 3,226 philosophers who took the Phil Paper survey in 2009 said that they accept or lean towards atheism. Among philosophers of religion, though, 72.3% accept or lean towards theism. What explains this difference? Adriano Mania Menino considers the question in a post at the group uh, Crucial Considerations of these figures. On the face of it, there are two hypotheses which could explain the data, one of them worrying for atheists, the other less so. Um, expert knowledge. Philosophers of religion possess expert knowledge on the arguments for and against God's existence. The arguments for God's existence are just overall more convincing and render God's existence more probable than not. Explanation two, selection bias. People often become philosophers of religion because they are religious or at least have a high credence in God's existence. Theists often become philosophers of religion, not the other way around. He then makes use of the results of the data from the study by Helen de Cruz. So this is the one that I was looking for. Let me see if I can. Study by Helen de Cruz. Um, she's actually at, she's not at VU University, Amsterdam. She's at uh, St. Louis University now. Of why philosophers of religion went into that field and how their beliefs concerning theism and atheism changed over time. He ends up concluding that the evidence is best explained by selection bias hypothesis. Ugh, why is that? Okay. Um, what's the link? Helen de Cruz. Or maybe I'll just go. I'll just go in there anyway. Go into the website. <laughs> Helen de Cruz, results of my qualitative study. Of re okay, it's, ju it's just been the blog has been moved to a different domain. So I'll, I'll go over to that in a second. Uh, the theists to atheist slash agnostics ratio is even higher before exposure to philosophy of religion. This confirms the impression we get from considering philosophers' motivations for doing philosophy of religion. Most philosophers of religion were already theists when they started, so there is a strong selection bias at work. Uh, moreover, there are more philosophers of religion updating their beliefs towards atheism and agnosticism than towards theism. So we can reject the hypothesis that although there is a strong selection bias, expert knowledge favoring theism is still reflected in in the fact that philosophers of religion convert more often to theism than to atheism slash agnosticism while acquiring expertise in the field. The numbers show that the ratio of theists to atheists slash agnostics declines when ex with exposure to philosophy of religion. So that's only a short post, and I'm going to look at Helen de Cruz's post here. One way of dismissing Helen de Cruz, by the way, would be to say, well, she's obviously got this kind of anti... Um, she's got this anti-Christian bias. Helen de Cruz is a Christian. Um, she's just a very, a very good one, a very good scholar who doesn't let her bias get in the way. She And she actually agrees that apologetics exists in order to reduce uh, cognitive dissonance of um, believers as well. Okay, so let's take a look at this blog post that I've now managed to resuscitate. Results of my qualitative study of religious attitudes and motivations of philosophers of religion. Um, Cross-posted on Prosblogian. My last blog post for this year will be a preliminary report on the qualitative survey I launched last month. In this open survey, I asked professional philosophers of religion, including graduate students, about their motivations and personal belief attitudes and how their work relates to these beliefs. I'm very grateful to all who participated, so share a sample size 151. This study was motivated by an emerging dichotomy in how philosophy of religion is perceived. On the one hand, there's a narrative that philosophy of religion, especially Christian analytic philosophy of religion, is, ri is rising in prominence and is a vibrant field. So this is, you know, Craig's story since the decline of logical positivism. And that as a result of it, atheism is in retreat in philosophy. On the other hand, some authors contend that this branch of philosophy is plagued by biases, conflict of interest, partisanship, and a lack of vitality. Um, see notably Keith Parsons' decision to quit philosophy of religion. The Phil Paper survey, which provides quite uh, blah, blah, blah. So this is the 2009 one, not the most recent one. 72.3% uh, 
philosophies of religion, 72.3% lean towards theism. 11.7% of philosophy faculty members who do not specialize in philosophy of religion are theists. So that, that's quite a stark distinction. This intriguing finding calls for further exploration. What is the range of theistic slash non-theistic positions philosophers of religion hold? What's the relationship between their religious belief and their philosophical work? So some quick measures on the survey, 151 participants uh, of these, 134 filled out the survey completely, 17 did it partially, 83% uh, man, but most men in philosophy of religion, um, predominantly from the USA, the Anglosphere, a few from other places, the religious beliefs of philosophers of religion. Uh, so, so about 50% were Christian theists of respondents. Um, several respondents affirmed explicitly that they endorsed the Nicene Creed. A majority of Christians in the sample identified with specific denominations, so Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox Anglican. Non-Christian theists uh, were decidedly the mi minority, four Jews and one Muslim. Um, then the next frequent set, so 15% were atheists. Substantial percentage of respondents had beliefs that fell outside of theism, atheism, agnosticism. 17.6% could not be easily categorized. Uh, uncomfortable calling themselves either. So this is one quote. When I was a teenager, I was an atheist because it was easiest way, the easiest way to annoy very religious people around me. In college, I became fascinated with the possibilities of religion. Religion seemed to represent to me new ways of imagining the world. As I studied philosophy further, my interest in those possibilities became more technical, more nuanced. I could not call myself an atheist now, primarily, primarily because my thinking about the baggage connected to that word leads me to believe that it does not accurately describe my condition. What are the motivations for people specifying in philosophy of religion? Faith seeking understanding. Several respondents indicated that they liked the cerebral critical nature of philosophy of religion, and this helps them deepen their faith. Here are some representative excerpts of those responses. I'm a Catholic and philosophy of religion helps me in deepening my faith by way of paradoxically putting the faith itself into question and even criticizing it. I'm a cerebral religious person and thinking carefully about my faith is a plus, not a negative. I particularly enjoy working on philosophical aspects of moral and religious diversity. Perhaps I'm getting a better understanding of other faiths and denominations when I do this. Some participants got into fill of religion uh, as a result of their religious experiences. Um, a religious turn in my life prompted my interest. I needed to make sense of something astounding happening in my life. Interestingly, for some atheist respondents, the motif of faith seeking understanding still resonates, uh, resounds even. In this case, it is a loss of faith seeking understanding, <laughs> a loss of faith seeking understanding. Perhaps unsurprisingly, many atheists and agnostics indicated a religious background and former religious belief. Uh, when I was a child, I was a very committed believer and participant in Christianity. I gradually lost my faith. And the finishing element was a section on philosophy of religion when I took an intro to philosophy course in my first year at uni. The shock was huge, believe it or not. I was somewhat suicidal. I felt I no longer had any meaning in my life. I think ever since then, I've been trying to understand what happened to me and wondering whether I really needed to abandon my faith. I also find philosophy of religion intellectually fascinating. That's interesting. Um, proselytism and witness. Several people who self-identify as theists indicate that pros proselytism and witness plays a key role in why they do philosophy of religion. It is the most cited reason for engaging in philosophy of religion after faith. So first, faith-seeking understanding is the first most cited reason for engaging in philosophy of religion, and the second is pro proselytism. I was and am a Christian. I believed that philosophy could provide tools for giving much needed arguments for the existence of God and for Christian doctrines, which I would publish. Mail Emeritus Professor, UK Research University. One full professor at a US community college does not have a fill of religion as his main area of study, but still makes a point work in this field, makes, makes a point 
work in this field regularly. Makes a point too, I, I don't know. Uh, since I am known by my colleagues as a Christian, I make it a point to publish regularly, attend conferences, etc. It's a witness to them of the integrity of the spiritual and academic interplay. Uh, my religious commitment helps to motivate some of the work that I do. Uh, in the case of one French high school teacher, this even means foregoing academic opportunities so as to be a more effective witness. I did not choose to work this subject, epistemology of religion, it chose me. In fact, I am less and less interested in having a university career. I believe there is not much Christian work to be done there. Uh, into our high schools, that's where uh, Christian is needed. So I did not choose my subject according to job opportunities, but only according to the most fundamental question I could find about my faith. Um, another reason given here is interest in religion as an experimental and cultural phenomenon. Although most contemporary philosophy of religion in the analytic tradition is quite cerebral, uh, several practitioners of this discipline noted that experimental, note, noted the experimental and cultural dimensions of religion as a motivating factor for engaging in their research. Uh, it is more my experience than my beliefs that drive drive me, even though I do not believe in any religion or gods, I do know that religion is an essential part of our culture. I'm interested in the phenomenology of religious belief simply because it has been so important in shaping our society and in particular art, literature, etc. And even people who are not religious do live in, do live, we live in a society. Even people who are not religious do live in a society that is importantly religious in many ways. So that's from a female grad student. I'm fascinated by the out of the ordinary experiences people have, and so on. How does philosophy influence personal beliefs of philosophers of religion? Belief revision. An interesting theme that emerged was philosophical training and engagement led to belief revision. The direction of this revision was most frequently in the direction from theism to atheism. In line with recent work in cognitive science of religion that indicates that analytic reasoning and active reflection discourage, discourage religious belief. That's interesting. Let me see what that is. The Origins of Religious Belief um, by Noranzian and Gervais. Uh, what, I don't know what year this is. I think, yeah. 2013. That is The Origins of Religious Disbelief 2013 by Cell Press. Several authors stated that they held unreflective religious beliefs before they studied philosophy, which they sub subsequently began to question and abandon as a result. I was a theist when I began university. It was during reading Hume's dialogues in my second year that I began the road to atheism. I believed that Hume successfully undermined every rational reason I had for my personal belief in God. I have to admit that I initially felt very confused, lost, ashamed, and angry when I realized that I no longer could count myself as a believer. But at the same time, I had an overriding curiosity to understand how it was that I became such an ardent believer to begin with. I realized early on that it could not simply be cultural. The intuitive pull of many religious beliefs seemed too strong to merely have been a product of my upbringing. My work in philosophy of religion has led me to reject most of the religious beliefs I was taught as a child. It was also resulted in my... Re I, I, can't, I can't do accents and talk because I can't talk. It has also resulted in my rejecting scientific naturalism. Professor at a public university. Gender and country not disclosed. Um, one male associate professor at a U.S. liberal arts college says that his growing disenchantment with arguments for theism was the final push for him to become an atheist. I recall specifically the straw that broke the camel's back that made me finally admit that I was an atheist was reading the arguments in a book called Redacted. I wonder what that was. The theist in the debate was redacted and his arguments were so bad and he so obviously willfully ignored the arguments of his opponent that I finally said, I can't be on his side anymore. Um, specifically, I recall the atheist saying, by this argument, I'm not saying X, which is clearly false, but instead I am saying Y. And Redacted's main response to the argument was, my atheist opponent says X, which is obviously false. This is not what convinced me that atheism is true. I was already convinced of that, but this is what made it okay in my eyes to finally admit I was an atheist. I found the arguments on the of the other big wiggies in philosophy, at least when they're arguing about religion, to be just as intellectually bankrupt and ad hoc. Please, could I have some water? Yeah. <laughs> Another 
participant, a male professor in the US teaching oriented school journeyed from Christianity to some qualified form of agnosticism. Only a few participants went from religious non-belief to belief as a result of philosophical argument. For example, this male assistant professor at a US research-oriented university. In the beginning of my studies in philosophy of religion, I was an atheist. I investigated many, many arguments for and against the existence of God. I discovered that my initial impression of the arguments was overly simplistic. I realized that there are many nuances and extreme caution is called for in navigating many lines of thought and counterthoughts. In the end, or the next beginning, the arguments for God seemed to win out. And so I began to lean toward belief in God. As I progress further in philosophy, I seem to find many reasons to think God exists. And the reasons against God seemed less persuasive. Of course, I'm aware of the problems of polarization. So I try to keep testing various arguments and listening to those. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is tempering influence. Most participants did not note a grand revision in their religious views as a result of philosophical reasoning, but they nevertheless said it had had a tempering influence. Philosophy has led them to revise beliefs uh, they held dogmatically before. Belief polarization. Oh, thank you. She even gave me a Baraka. Making sure that I have the vitamins I need to survive. in this cruel world. A minority of participants note that exposure to philosophy has further strengthened positions they held before on the basis of faith or upbringing, a phenomena known as attitude or belief polarization. Okay, so then there's several criticisms of the discipline. Many respondents spontaneously offered criticisms of their discipline in the comment section or in the request for additional personal observations or anecdotes. While most of these were atheists or agnostics, they were also theists. Um, features often criticized were the apologetic nature of philosophy of religion, its perceived lack of real world relevance, and its lack of attention to traditions outside of Orthodox Christianity. Philosophy of religion is too much focused on issues of what is true and what is false from a doctrinal standpoint. And my latest thinking is that such issues aren't primary. The mainstream of philosophy of religion betrays its bias towards the analysis and assessment of religious beliefs as opposed to other religious phenomena. And this may well be due to the high profile of Christianity and Protestant Christianity at that. In locations where the philosophical subfield has developed, this bias is unfortunate given the increased contact today among people identifying with various cultural and religious ways of life. The field may be hindered in this effort so long as it employs models of religiosity that have been derived from philosophical debates within Western Christianity. Uh, the rigor and analytical skills in this branch of philosophy has kept its Christian philosophers isolated and distant from the social, ethical, and political changes taking place in other branches of political philo philosophy. Insularity has allowed the field to protect and to encourage narrow-mindedness and overconfidence in the thinking of the best known and best funded philosophers of religion in the world. These are some really good, really good criticisms. I wish I knew who these people were and could interview them. I would not be the first to say that philosophy of religion, especially analytic theology, is simply not philosophy. It's Christian apologetics. And it often is poorer philosophically because of that. A Christian bias pervades everything. And once one becomes a non-Christian, the irrational faith-based assumptions of the in intuitions start to stand out. Philosophy of religion is increasingly out of touch with the actual practice of religion in Europe and the Americas. It needs to be revitalized by making contact with the rich religious pluralism now evolving in Europe and the Americas. We need to see articles by analytic philosophers on Mormonism, Santeria, Umbanda, Wicca, goddess religion, and religious naturalism, new pantheistic movements, and so on. Uh, I have received referees' reports on articles submitted to leading journals of the philosophy of religion that appeared to me to exhibit unjustified hostility to my submission because of the atheistic or skeptical content. Sometimes there's scarcely any argument, just in effect, this is outrageous, don't publish it. In closing, this is just a small tranche from the, from the wealth of responses I received. I hope to include in a full report a detailed analysis of how religious upbringing and environmental uh, and environment play a role in the beliefs of philosophers, how their advisors and colleagues react when they decided to specialize in it, um, and the status of women in the field. Thanks again, and Happy New Year! <laughs> 
so yeah that was um quite good actually okay so where are we uh what was this data on graduates and placements what's this Oh yeah, I didn't have time to look at that, but that was data on graduates and placements from uh, Phil Papers. Uh, journals, major journals, uh, religious studies, which is into faith, faith and philosophy, which, which is published by the Society of Christian Philosophers, the SCP, um, International Journal for the Psychology of Religion, Minor Journals, Sophia, European Journal, uh, Philosophia Christi, Special Issues, Philo, which is a now defunct naturalist journal, Philo, uh, non Christian philosophers of religion in the field. What's really fascinating about this subfield is that almost every non theist writing in the field has published a critique of the field or question its value slash methods. Off the top of my head, it's hard to think of any um, other field in philosophy where that's the case. Draper's legendary article and exchange with Dean Zimmerman look at that so this is let me share it so you can see uh diagnosing bias in philosophy of religion do i have can i access this through my let me see if i can find it somewhere where i can access it diagnosing bias in philosophy of religion oh it's on jstor here we go. Hopefully I can access this through my institution. Let's go. Login. Can I access it? I can access it, accept and download. I have it. Here you go, guys. The things I do for you. <laughs> People don't need sniggering, <laughs> mocking laughs in the background they do, as they listen to my... It's like a live studio audience. <laughs> 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 I'm providing a service. So this is Paul Draper, uh, Diagnosing Bias in Philosophy of Religion. Work in Philosophy of Religion exhibits at least four symptoms of poor health. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> it is too partisan, too polemical, too narrow in its focus, and too often evaluated using criteria that are theological or religious instead of philosophical. Our diagnosis is that because of the emotional and psychosocial aspects of religion, many philosophers of religion suffer from cognitive biases and group influence. We support this diagnosis in two ways. First, we examine work in psychology on cognitive biases and their effective triggers. This work supports the view that while cognitive biases are no doubt a problem in all inquiry and in all areas of philosophy, they are particularly damaging to inquiry in philosophy of religion. Second, we examine work in social and evolutionary psychology on religious sociality and its attendant emotions. This work establishes that the coalitional features of religion are correlated with group bias, and we contend that this bias is also harmful to inquiry in philosophy of religion. We close by offering both a prognosis and recommendation of this treatment. Okay, so what's the business of philosophy? Uh, to part with self-conceit, for it is impossible for anyone to begin to learn what he thinks that he already knows. That's Epictetus, by the way, is a quote. Symptoms. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, by the way, so don't worry about that. Just see. I probably maybe I'll just go to the conclusion. The juicy bits. <laughs> um, prognosis and treatment. I would diagnose philosophy of religion with stave five stagnation, stage five, not stave, um, octave six. Um. Are you okay? No. But what are you going to do about it? 
even though I'm not. You can replace James. You can join from StreamYard on your laptop. Um, blah blah blah. That's all this. This is all this bit. It just says blah blah blah. Um, a bit more blah blah blah. God, blah blah blah. God's existence. Something else. Jail and chat. A third recommendation is to make a conscious effort to allow, as Jail Schellenberg puts it, the voice of authority to grow dim. Um. Our fourth recommendation, which is hardest of all to follow, is to make a conscious decision to accept genuine risk. True inquiry requires risk. Um, okay. Maybe the juicy bit. I, I mean, I'll read that at some point on my own, and maybe I'll, I'll um, digest the points for people in, in a separate video. What? <laughs> Okay, there's a okay, there's a, there's an overview by Paul Draper here, so I can actually use that overview um, to give you guys a summary. What is philosophy of religion, Paul Draper? The academic study of religion is a tricky business because religions make claims about reality that are cherished by their members. You have something to say? I'm just watching your screen. You just keep laughing intermittently. What, what was funny? I don't know. It was just <laughs> funny. <laughs> Thus, both philosophy of religion, which is a subdiscipline of philosophy, and the relatively new discipline of religious studies face an important question about their aims. Do those aims include addressing the truth question? The question of whether any of the claims about reality that religions make are true. On the on the one hand, can you can you put your phone on silent mode, please? No. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to sell my printer, but they're trying to. You're trying to sell it. what? I will sell it here on stream. <laughs> your printer. If does anyone want to? If you want to buy a printer, get in the chat and let me know. It's a good printer, HP, high demand. As you can hear from all the buzzing in the background, and um, there's lots of lots of people inquiring. It's going to be gone soon. Get it get it while you can. Um, yeah. You do need to collect it from Glasgow, um, by the way. Do those aims. I, I will also shake your hand for £10 if you're in Glasgow. Do those aims include addressing the truth question? On the one hand, inquiry in religious studies has generally avoided this question, especially in the United States, where great effort has been made to distinguish the secular and scientific disciplines of religious studies, which is properly taught in public universities, from the sectarian discipline of theology, which is taught only in private religious institutions, and which, at least historically, sought not just to identify, clarify, and systematize beliefs of a particular religious community, dogmatics, but also just to justify them, apologetics. Philosophy of religion can't completely ignore the truth question and still be philosophy. This is not to say that the truth question is the only question philosoph philosophers of religion should address, but it is one such question, and thus it's worth asking how this one part of philosophy of religion is best approached. Uh, I offer four recommendations. My first recommendation is for philosophers of religion to distance themselves in every way possible from apologetics, whether theistic or atheistic. I'm not a demarcationist. Uh, on most issues about the boundaries between philosophy and other disciplines, but apologetics is a special case. Apologists may make use of philosophy, but they serve a religious or secular community in a way that is antithetical to objective philosophical inquiry. Of course, there once was a time when philosophy was considered to be the handmaiden of theology, but that time is long since past, and it would be a mistake to try to turn the clocks back. Genuine philosophy today is superior to apologetics, precisely because it does not face the paradox of apologetics. Briefly, this paradox arises because apologists, unlike philosophers engaged in genuine inquiry, seek to justify their religious beliefs, as opposed to seeking to have beliefs that are justified. This implies that their inquiry, if it can be called that, is inevitably biased, and biased inquiry cannot ground justification, unless, of course, conclusive evidence is discovered. But we know how often that happens in philosophy. Therefore, paradoxically, one cannot obtain justification for one's religious beliefs by seeking it directly. To obtain justification, one must directly seek not justification, but truth. My next two recommendations attempt to mitigate the powerful psychological forces that inevitably influence most 
mostly at the non-conscious level, inquiry about one's religious and non-religious beliefs. To reduce the influence of various cognitive biases on philosophical inquiry about religion, I recommend that philosophers of religion use argument construction, less often as a method for making cases for the positions they hold, and more often as a method of testing those positions. This would require, this would require of course, making a serious effort to construct arguments against one's prior religious beliefs. I also recommend that philosophers of religion make conscious effort to allow, as J.L. Schellenberg puts it, the voice of authority to grow dim in our ears. All too often, viable arguments and positions never occur to these thinkers because dominant traditional forms of religion overly influence these thinkers. This is true even in the case of philosophers who are not members of any traditional religious community. Finally, my fourth recommendation is to make every effort to accept genuine risk. True inquiry requires risk, which is why philosophical inquiry is aided by doubt. In experimental science, balanced inquiry is either, though still far from easy, to achieve. Even if a scientist is sure of some cherished hypothesis, testing that hypothesis by experiment is in many cases inherently risky. Apologetics, by comparison, is very safe, insofar as pursuing it is unlikely to result in apologists rejecting any of the central doctrines of the religious communities they serve. Philosophy should be riskier. Philosophers of religion must be prepared to abandon cherished beliefs, but with that risk comes greater opportunities for growth and discovery, and for freeing oneself from service to inflexible orthodoxy. This point is nicely illustrated by the life and work, work of Ruf Ruf yeah. <laughs> I'm speaking in tongues. <laughs> This point is nicely illustrated by the life and work of Rudolf Otto, who was raised an evangelical Lutheran and hoped initially that his university studies would provide him with the means of defending conservative orthodoxy to which he was committed. This is not, however, what happened. Instead, Otto says, the earth disappeared. The earth disappeared from under my feet. That was the result of my studies in Erlangen. I went there not so much to quest for truth, Why is he so nasally? He's never met this guy. but more to vindicate belief. I left the result to seek nothing but the truth, even at the risk of finding it in Christ. Although Otto remained throughout his career a theologian by title, he was an exemplary philosopher of religion in many ways. He is famous, of course, because he... Um, he wrote one of the greatest works in the history of um, philosophy of religion, namely, Die Idee das Heilige. Um, <laughs> the idea of the holy. I don't even know if that's what it is in German. I just let my brain like translate it incorrectly. It is abundantly clear that had Otto not rejected apologetics in favor of a more philosophical approach to religious inquiry, he would not and could not have written this masterpiece. I realize, of course, that some philosophers who are sectarian theists might be unwilling to accept my recommendations. They might regard accepting them as in some way disloyal to their religious community or to their God. Yet, in some sense, such an at attitude evinces a lack of faith. If there really is a God, and if such a God wants us to engage in inquiry concerning ultimate reality, then surely such a God would want that inquiry to be balanced. The results of balanced inquiry, however, are unpredictable. For this reason, it is arguable that a theistic philosopher who decides to follow my advice to imitate Otto must have greater faith, greater trust in God, the one who decides to pursue the paradoxical path of the apologist. I like that uh, blog post. Nice one, Draper. Um, I am available as a voice actor for voice acting work. Um, okay. So that was one of the exchange with Dean Zimmerman. <laughs> Dean Zimmerman, not Dean Zim. Um, an article on why reformed epistemology is not philosophy. Um, here's another thing. So here's John Schellenberg on why reformed epistemology is not. Uh, how big is this? Not very big. Let me see what it says. Hang on. How to how to use Chrome screen reader? Hang on. 
Let me see. Control Alt Z. Control Alt Z. What the hell? <laughs> I was like, open my graphics Is card. It a PDF, no, it's not a PDF. Built in screen reader. Chromevox. I just want to use Chromevox. Um, Google Chrome screen reader. Oh, it's this one. If I add it to Chrome now, will it just work? And I bet it'll sound all. Um, I bet it'll sound all messed up. Okay, adding to Chrome. Come on. Oh, wow. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> Can you guys hear that? Can you hear it for you? Are you listening to me? Can you guys hear that? Oh Jesus! I just want it to stop now. If you guys, I don't know if you guys can hear what's happening. No, we can't hear it. Oh my God! This is—it's just saying alert, alert, screen reader, <laughs> new item, one or four. Um, I just—I—I just—just off. Stop it, screen reader. Okay, no, you guys couldn't hear it. That was just horrendous and and bizarre. Um, and I hate it. And I hope I never go blind or whatever and need a screen reader um okay john schellenberg is professor of philosophy at mount saint vincent it, it just started reading everything like um whatever i was clicked on like random stuff it was horrible and then it kept saying alert stressful john schellenberg is a professor of philosophy at mount saint vincent university uh, we invited him to answer the question is there a future for philosophy of religion as part of our philosophers of religion uh, on Philosopher of Religion series. Philosophy of Religion is going through a period of turmoil in which it is deciding what it wants to be when it grows up. I suggest that we may ease a number of current tensions and find a way forward by noting how a Philosopher of Religion's direction of thought might be characterized by either of two importantly different aims. The first is the aim of understanding and rationally evaluating religious practice. The second is the aim of investigating the philosophical potential for religious ideas. Um, let's call the first aim, the aim, philosophy to religion aim, and the second, or, or you could just call them the first and the second. There's no point to do that of doing this in my opinion, but anyway, PR and RP, um, you can tell this has been written by someone who likes analytic philosophy by the, the doing of useless things like that. Um, Becoming, you know, just add an extra layer. Now you need like a, a little key by the side, which translates between these acronyms and which of the first and second definitions it means. Instead of just saying the first and second. Okay. Um, so becoming more, consider the seeming tension between an emphasis on making natural theology successful and the suggestion of reformed epistemology that such success is dispensable. When this disagreement is discussed with awareness of the present distinction, we will come to think of reformed epistemologists as having a PR, a PR concern. Uh, nothing in philosophy requires that the religious practice of intellectually responsible adult theists be infused with the relative relevant arguments. They are saying, Perhaps they should be saying without using the word epistemology, which suggests an RP interest. Um, if you don't see blah blah blah, I'm just trying to see if this if this consider the tension between those who think of religious practice propositionally and doxastically, and those willing to explore non doxastic or non propositional form. I propose blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, th this is not that useful to the point that I was trying to make. Something that is more useful to the point I was trying to make um, is whether, okay, whether um, reformed epistemology belongs at all in the secular academy, and Gregory Dawes, who I've interviewed before, argues no. Now, I'm going to find, um, I'm going to find the paper wherein he says that. Uh, it's in my meta folder. The presumption of naturalism. Pardon? Where in? What? Where in? What do you mean, where in? It's funny. 
I've ever heard anyone say it. Really? In person. Like, you're right in paper, but you don't say it. I do say it. I just no, did I say know. it. I know you say it. Wearing. I'm allowed to say wearing if I want to say wearing. I'm not stopping you. I'm trying to stop me. <laughs> um. Okay, here we are. So this, this is um, Religious Studies, Faith, and the Presumption of Naturalism. So j just to read the abstract, in a recent defense of what he calls study by religion, Robert Einstein suggests that alleged divine revelations present uh, public forms of knowledge, uh, which should not be excluded from the academy, but at least according to two major Christian thinkers, namely Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin, revelation is received by an act of faith which rests on evidence that is person relative and therefore not open to public scrutiny if religious studies is to remain a public discipline whose arguments may be evaluated by believers and non-believers alike it should maintain its defeasible but not yet defeated presumption of naturalism um uh, i'm going through puberty again um 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 so th this is just talking about you know the the it, within reformed epistemology there's this thing called the aquinas calvin module in the brain that supposedly gives people self-authenticated knowledge of of god through the census divinitatis um and that that knowledge is you know it, it, it it's purely subjective God, God just causes that knowledge in people who claim to have it, and Reformed epistemologists claim they do have it, and so they have a defeater, defeater that defeats all defeaters in the form of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so it doesn't really matter, you know, they, they, they can just be justified in believing God exists, whether or not they have good reasons. But there was a section 20-something... The problem with the externalist perspective on the evidential grounds of faith from the point of view of the modern skeptic is that it assumes the truth of that which it is trying to prove. Um, for Calvin, the self-authenticating character of the scripture can be known only by those who have already to some degree accepted its authority, who are prepared to read it as um, a word from God addressed to them. David Friedrich Strauss, Strauss described Calvin's doctrine as the Achilles heel to the Protestant system. How do we know that what we experience within us is indeed the testimony of the Holy Spirit? Calvin's answer against the enthusiasts of his day is that we know it is the testimony of, of the Spirit if it, if it accords with Scripture. But how do we know the authority of Scripture by way of the inner testimony of the Spirit? Um Alvin Plantiger, who insists that religious faith may be regarded as properly basic in the se sense that it is not the result of argument or an appeal to evidence. It simply arises within the individual when she is placed in the appropriate circumstances. Plantinga willingly concedes that the skeptic, it w to the skeptic it will seem to suffer from a fatal circularity. Um, but he's not writing for the skeptic. He's writing for those for whom the Christian belief is already given. Uh, the circularity would only be a problem if the warrant of the basis of a person's belief, but that is precisely what it is not. Since religious belief is basic, it requires no such foundation. Plantinga's project requires blah, blah, blah. If Plantinga is right in arguing that faith does not require evidence or argument, then there is no point in my arguing Cal that Calvin's sense of certainty proves nothing. It does not need to prove anything, but in its admission that Calvin's argument, Plantinga's warrant, have no force for the non-believer, his work merely highlights that the principal claim I am making that faith presents a person relative and not an intersubjectively accessible form of alleged knowledge. So Dawes' argument is going to be that this basically doesn't belong in the secular academy because the aim of the secular academy is to um, assess what's true. The only way that, this, that it can do that is on the presumption of na naturalism, which is by um, assessing intersubjective truth claims. But this being a necess an essentially subjective truth claim that someone has had this self-authenticating um, testimony simply precludes it from belonging in the academy. Um, that's going to be the kind of form of the argument. The person relative character is the grounds on which faith claims are thought to be true and the unreliability of such a procedure as a means of accessing reality. The problem with basing an academic discipline on faith claims 
is that faith does not represent an intersubjectively accessible form of knowledge, the grounds for which are available to believers and non-believers alike. Faced with this situation, what does the scholar of religions do? On the one side, there is ensign study by religion option, which, at least in its traditional form, involves appealing to forms of assurance that cannot be intersubjectively examined. On the other side, there is the option actually adopted by founders of religious studies in the 19th century, namely to make religion the object of study rather than the interpretive lens through which we study. If we wish our discipline to be a public form of inquiry, utilising forms of evidence and argument that may be scrutinised by believers and non-believers alike, the second op it's the second option that we should reaffirm. The rest of this paper will be devoted to examining a particular expression of this option. Uh, Okay. So he says, to defeat this presumption, one would need to show that there existed a form of intersubjectively accessible evidence or argument in favor of the truth of the... 40... Okay. What does he say? Even if one accepts such radically anti-foundationalist views of knowledge, they offer no grounds for abandoning the presumption of naturalism. Okay, I've... so 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 Dawes is just arguing in this paper basically that you know projects like reformed epistemology don't really belong in the in the philosophy of religion, which fits in with the broader topic that I've been talking about in this section, which is the state of philosophy of religion as a field um what were some other things i wanted to talk about before we wrap up then so we've done that we've done that we have not done this okay hobby lobby smuggling scandal so so another topic which we haven't touched upon is Christianity and other religions are historical. Insofar as they make historical claims, they are interested in um, finding artifacts which substantiate their historical claims in, in cultivating museums and so forth. Um, so the Hobby Lobby is, well, well, we'll talk about it. So, so the, there's this, the, there are scandals though, but where basically ne nefarious practices have been engaged in by people with money who are trying to essentially, you know, purchase or, or get their hands on certain artifacts in order to then in their museums and so forth, or ha have certain sources to talk about where they cultivate like a particular narrative about, about history that may not be true. So the Hobby Lobby smuggling scandal, scandal started in 2009, when representative of the Hobby Lobby uh, chain of craft stores received a large number of clay tablets originating in the ancient Near East. The artifacts were intended for the Museum of the Bible, funded by um, the evangelical Christian Green family, which owns the Oklahoma-based chain. Uh, several shipments of the artifacts were seized by U.S. Customs. Purchase and provenance in December 2010. Hobby Lobby purchased 1.6 million worth of Iraqi artifacts. The artifacts were largely cuneiform tablets. Um, many of the artifacts lacked any supporting evidence of their history or ownership, raising the possibility that the artifacts had possibly been looted or sold on the black market. The company became subject uh, to investigations by the US government for these actions. Archaeologists say some of the items may have come from the National Museum of Iraq, which had been looted after the American invasion of Iraq. Iraq. Uh, Hobby Lobby made mass purchases with few pieces of vague paperwork. So, you know, th this sort of thing happens and it isn't good. In October 2018, the Museum of the Bible revealed that five of its six Dead Sea Scrolls fragments are counterfeit. Um, in March 2020, independent art fraud investigators hired by the museum revealed that all 16 fragments are counterfeit made from ancient leather and modern inks. And the museum removed the display of another disputed artifact, a miniature Bible, which a NASA astronaut had purportedly carried to the moon, um, stolen items. In October 2019, officials from the British Egypt Exploration Society, a nonprofit organization that manages the Papyri Project, alleged that the Oxford academic 
Dirk Obink engaged in the theft and sale of at least 11 ancient Bible fragments to the Green family, the Hobby Lobby owners who operate uh, a Bible museum and charitable organization in Washington. This is, this is the same Bible mu museum of the Bible, by the way, that Jordan Peterson went to before, which, which um, persuaded Peterson that the first book was the Bible and um, which he then went on Joe Rogan's podcast and said with such enthusiasm. And I mean that literally the, the first book was the Bible. Um, the museum said it will return the fragments uh, to the Egypt Exploration Society in Oxford University. This is from the Oxyrhynchus uh, collection. In March 2020, Nat Geo reported that the museum was reevaluating the provenance of all the material in its collection with the intent of returning stolen objects. Um, this return includes the Gilgamesh Dream Tablet containing part of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, in January 2021, 8,000 clay tablets were transferred to the Iraq Museum. In July 2021, the United States Department of Justice announced it had seized the Gilgamesh tablet from the Hobby Lobby for repatriation to Iraq. In August 2021, Iraq reclaimed 17,000 looted artifacts previously held by the Museum of the Bible. So, so there's a lot of, you know, obviously money involved and just dodgy stuff going on. Um, I would also want to fo forward people to uh, Davis's video on Davis did a, a very good video on Josh McDowell. Um, he did a short a short documentary. It refers basically. to the and maybe I'll play a little bit of this just to, just to give people an idea. Who is Josh McDowell? If you are an evangelical Christian anywhere near as old as I am, this is a familiar name to you. If you are younger, then I won't be surprised to see that you have a passing familiarity with this guy through hundreds of hours of McDowell's talks on YouTube, Vimeo, or any number of other internet audio and video streaming platforms. McDowell is probably best known for his publication of two books, widely regarded as among the most popular Christian books of the 20th century. Evidence that demands a verdict, historical evidences for the Christian faith from 1972, and more than a carpenter from 1977. In fact, evidence that demands a verdict was named by the landmark periodical Christianity Today in 2006 as one of the top 50 most influential evangelical books since World War II. It has seen hundreds of printings, has sold millions of copies, and has been revised and extensively updated five times. The most recent edition published in 2017 is 880 pages and was co-written by McDowell's son, Sean McDowell an assistant professor in the Christian apologetics program at Biola University and an increasingly visible social media presence. The junior McDowell claimed on his own website in 2018 that the book was named by World Magazine, one of the top 40 books of the 20th century. The list published by World Magazine appeared in 1999, and while evidence that demands a verdict was not in the top 40, it was ranked among the top 100 books of the 20th century. So without quibbling too much, this is clearly an enormously popular Christian literary classic, and Josh McDowell is a giant in the realm of Christian apologetics. While I have known about McDowell for virtually my entire life, he re-entered my orbit only recently and in an unexpected way. You see, I started college in 1994 with designs on going into Christian ministry. Maybe I would be a pastor or go to work in a youth organization like McDowell's Campus Crusade for Christ, otherwise known as crew.org. But over time, things changed. I developed a deep fascination with the biblical text and history and with the languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. I went on to graduate school and then earned my PhD and became a specialist in the Dead Sea Scrolls and early Jewish manuscripts. I'm Kip Davis, and I'm here to explore the lore of Josh McDowell. Over the years of my academic journey, McDowell had faded into the background, but then his apologetic intersected my own work on modern forgeries of Dead Sea Scrolls and private collections. Those mostly owned by evangelical institutions such as Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and Museum of the Bible. In 2014, I was made aware of a video lecture by McDowell that was making the rounds in scholarly circles and not for contributions to fields with interests in material culture and scribal practices, but rather because of the destructive, honestly shocking cavalier handling of ancient artifacts this Christian apologist promoted as part of his own confessional agenda. For some time now, McDowell has argued very strongly for the historical reliability of the Bible, 
and the efficacy of Christianity from the numbers of ancient manuscript copies of biblical texts. He is famous for performing what he calls a bibliographical test of the manuscript evidence, which he describes like this. Why the bibliographical test? Now, what does that mean? That's a big word. It refers to the manuscripts. Now, what's a manuscript? Most people say the original copy. No, it's a handwritten document. It's that which was done by hand is called a manuscript, manuscript. Manuscripts came before the introduction of the um, printing press in the 1500s, where before then everything had to be done by hand. Now, can you imagine copying the Old Testament? Come on, there's a million consonants. Now, don't take your afternoon and count them, just trust me. There's a million consonants. Can you imagine how long it'd take you to count them, let alone copy them? Can you imagine how many mistakes you would make? Just normal mistakes. So here you have the original. Now, the original of any book manuscript is called the autographa, autographa, autographa. Now, two things will lead to being copied. One, they need more copies. There's not one is not enough for the world. Okay. Anyway, in so in this documentary, Kip points out a bunch of things about um, practices in handling manuscripts, standards of scholarship, um, and he talks about McDowell's conversion story, which he which he uses as an apologetic device. So in that book that James talked about, for example, More Than a Carpenter, um, I think that that contains the story and, and the story's also in Evidence That Demands a Verdict, if I'm recalling correctly from when I read the book two or three years ago. Um, and McDowell presents, you know, at many of these talks, the story about what happened to him. And Kip basically as assesses that story um, kind of shows that it, it's mostly made up over time. McDowell's kind of fabricated it over time. Um, and so so this is another aspect of the apologetics industrial com complex, which is the um, emphasis that it puts on con life-changing conversion experiences, God's action in people's lives, um, in apologists' lives by converting them and giving them these profound personal stories and uh, that that creates an expectation then to have one of these stories which then leads to people inventing the stories um so i, I mean if you're interested in that i recommend going and watching the documentary for yourself now svez has told me that 39 38 is where hobby lobby things happen so i'm gonna play so that biblical out. manuscript finds and transactions has something to do with this. You see, as far back as the late 90s, a Norwegian manuscript collector named Martin Skøen was aggressively tracking down fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls that he could add to his already extensive collection of other impressive artifacts. By 2008, when McDowell's first public talk featuring his conversion story appeared on YouTube, there were some 25 supposed Dead Sea Scrolls fragments in private collections and circulating between exhibitions in the United States. In 2009, the Green family, owners of American crap retail giant Hobby Lobby, began buying ancient manuscripts of a wide variety, culminating over four years in over 40,000 artifacts that would come to form the core of the collection housed in the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. These acquisitions were made under the direction of Scott Carroll, a biblical scholar who had assembled and curated another private collection of biblical manuscripts for Robert Van Campen and who had become notorious for his practice of dismounting Egyptian funerary masks, as described by McDowell. That same year, the private evangelical school, Azusa Pacific University in Southern California, what, purchased and um, exhibited five fragments, also supposedly. So the school that's purchasing um, those is Josh, the Josh Rasmussen, the philosopher, the, the school that he teaches at. So this is a Christian university. They have a statement of faith. And again, this shows, you know, within the apologetics industrial complex, how, um, you know, weird, weird practices of, of purchasing um, from shady disreputable um people and and of handl handling these things in a weird way and how as well it is a kind of confirmation bias a desire for things to be true leads to kind of supporting these things putting money into the wrong people um and how, how all this stuff just hangs together kind of like a big conspiracy theory supposedly from the dead sea scrolls the following year now disgraced president of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, Paige Patterson, and his wife, Dorothy, solicited millions of dollars from donors to acquire eight fragments. One of these contained text from a passage in Leviticus 21 that condemns homosexuality. A representative from the seminary claimed that this was an especially expensive fragment precisely because the particular passage is a timeless truth from God's word to the global culture today. Then, this happened. The demand for such a copy mark goes far beyond what is demanded for any other ancient literature. However, in the last few months, several very early fragments of the New Testament have been discovered. 
These will be published by an international scholarly publishing house in a book one year from now. By way of background, prior to this book, I mentioned that we knew of as many as a dozen second century manuscripts from the New Testament in the, in the, that were in the second century. Once the book is published, the numbers will change dramatically. As many as 18 New Testament manuscripts from the second century. Among the finds was also a fragment of Luke that is from the early second century. It thus rivals P52, that fragment that I showed you, the manuscript traditionally considered to be the oldest New Testament manuscript known to exist. And yet this new Luke fragment is not the oldest New Testament manuscript. The oldest manuscript of the New Testament is now a fragment from Mark's Gospel that is from the first century. How accurate is the dating? Well, my source is a papyrologist who worked on this manuscript, a man whose reputation is unimpeachable. Many consider him to be the best papyrologist on the planet. His reputation is on the line with his dating, and he knows it, but he is certain that this manuscript was from the first century. This is Dirk Obik. Just like the other new discoveries that we are preparing for uh, publication, strongly confirms what most scholars have already said is the original text. Professor Wallace's announcement of a first century copy of Mark's Gospel was a sensation. And for the next six years, scholars waited with an eagerness, teetering on desperation for the publication of this astonishing fragment, which was believed to have been purchased by the Greens and now part of the Museum of the Bible's enormous collection. This was the same fragment that McDowell had claimed to discover in his 2013 talk. In the meantime, McDowell had been spotted at an event at Baylor University in Waco, Texas in early 2012, where Scott Carroll was performing a dismounting to reveal a cache of ancient classical and Christian manuscripts. This particular exhibition, it turns out, was itself a hoax at which no new discoveries were actually made. McDowell himself had entered the antiquities market and by that time had purchased a medieval Torah scroll that he used as a prop in his public talks. In 2013, he organized and hosted an event called Discover the Evidence, which featured both Carol and Wallace and my own friend and mentor, Professor Peter Flint. Carol dismounted McDowell's own recently acquired Egyptian funerary mask, hunting for New Testament manuscripts. I was nervous. I mean, really nervous. It was December 6, 2013. Our ministry had organized an unprecedented event called Discover the Evidence. It brought together apologists, highly specialized scholars in ancient language, and speakers in the field of discovery, translating, and preserving ancient biblical manuscripts. Our ministry had just acquired some ancient Egyptian artifacts, and under the leadership of Dr. Scott Carroll, an ancient manuscript specialist, he was about to carefully dismantle them. Some of these artifacts were from 1500 to 2200 years old. So the hope was that hidden beneath them, we would find papyri fragments of ancient New Testament manuscripts. The moment of truth had finally arrived. Dr. Carroll was ready to announce his preliminary findings. Would God answer my prayers? Would we be allowed to obtain just one New Testament manuscript? The text is from Galatians, one, two, three, four, five, six lines. God had answered my prayer. He had allowed our ministry to be the stewards of his ancient word. And when all the identification analysis was finished, God had granted us six ancient New Testament passages and one Old Testament manuscript fragment, seven treasures in all. We have the writings of Mark 15, John 14, Matthew 6 and 7, and 1 John 2, possibly the earliest papyri passage in any language in existence today. We have a passage from Galatians 4, which appears to be one of the earliest known papyri, and the Old Testament passage is from Jeremiah 33, which is the earliest known Coptic language papyrus in existence today. They are not being placed in a museum because I will be taking them with me when I speak. I want to personally share them with you and your kids. I want your children to know that there's reliable evidence for Christ and his word. In 2016, investigative journalist Ariel Sabar penned an explosive expose of the so-called Gospel of Jesus Wife fragment that Harvard professor Karen King had published, a fragment that turned out to be a modern forgery. By 2017, more than a dozen of the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments from the Scoian Collection and the Museum of the Bible had come under fierce scrutiny by a growing number of scholars who were convinced that they were fakes. Questions were mounting over the legitimacy of claims about the first century Mark fragment, which, as it turns out, was actually a third century fragment. In the Oxyrhynchus papyri fragment, which, as it turns out, was actually a third So this, The Atlantic, A Biblical Mystery at Oxford, this is the um, blog post. Uh, that is the one um, that contains... I think the full story about what happened and how deep it goes and the weirdness and the money involved and so on. But yeah, let's... Um... Third century fragment in the Oxyrhynchus papyri collection of the Egypt Exploration Society. Its editor, Dirk Obink, had unscrupulously attempted to sell it to the Museum of the Bible in November 2011. By the time... McDowell wrote his newly updated testimony in the 2017 edition of Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Had he decided to start downplaying the manuscript influence in his own discovery narrative? He still featured it in his public talks. But these sort of... Oh yeah, so, so I think... Was it that... I forget the, the thrust of 
in, in the documentary here, but I think that Josh McDowell in his conversion story added the detail that he had discovered one of these manuscripts and that was part of um, his conversion experience that he, and, and he, fab he added that into his testimony. Sorts of assertions never made it to print. The especially fluid nature of McDowell's story raises all sorts of questions about its accuracy. Did he ever actually intend to write a book as a college freshman to disprove Christianity? Did he commit two years of research to this enterprise, if not to studying biblical manuscripts? Was this jet-set 19-year-old actually engaged in a transatlantic expedition to complete his research project? Well, I think it's abundantly clear that elements of McDowell's story are at best greatly embellished, at worst, completely fabricated. The answer to these questions is not a straightforward no. I so <laughs> I'll leave I that there, that. and you guys can uh, check, you know, go and check out Kip Davis's channel um, for more. I'm just having a having a look to see. There's still people commenting on on, on this. Um, interesting. But yeah, this this is um, a great documentary, and obviously Kip has. A bunch of other cool things to check out on his channel as well. So I think that that's about it for the Apologetics Industrial Complex um, episode. Is there anything else that I want to go into? I'm just checking. So we talked about this stuff. We talked about Christian education. We talked about non-accreditation, Christian homeschooling. Christian publishing, uh, how much it costs to leave the faith, uh, different apologetics ministries. James talked about that before he went. Philosophy of religion, I did a bit of talk about that. Journals, changing minds in the field. Um, a bit of biblical studies. I suppose a few things that, I could, a few notable mentions could also be things like the... Um, the number like Gary Habermas's and Michael A. Cohen has both their different when they talk about the numbers of New Testament scholars who believe things and but don't make any of that information publicly available, um, and, and and how kind of dodgy all that stuff is. Um, yeah, creationism and ID. We did we didn't talk that much as well about Catholic apologetics. I mean, this. So, so yeah, we have focused mostly on Protestants, and it would be good to talk more about some Catholic apologetic ministries like Word on Fire, Catholic Answers, Strange Notions, Brandon Vo Vogt or Voigt, however you, uh, Bishop Barron, Pints with Aquinas, Scott Hahn. That is um, a big industry as well, and has different sources of funding. Um, is there an atheist industrial complex? Partially, but I don't have time to answer that question so yeah that's basically it i think i hope that it has been useful for those of you who are watching i hope that um maybe maybe you've learned something useful i think i think that Looking at apologetics from this angle makes the enterprise look increase look very human and transparent as well. Um, so, you know, it, it it begins to look very much so like it isn't sort of divinely that that God isn't at work in in all of this apologetics. It's just kind of people doing goofy tribal stuff. Um, yeah, in terms of future apologetics episodes, we, we will probably do one at some point on, um, the Shroud of Turin, the Burial Cloth of Jesus. Um, we have not yet done one and yeah, we ha haven't really talked about the moving goalposts of Gary Habermas's magnum opus, the 3000 page book on the resurrection, which is mostly recycled material, but in a different order. Um, the stream wherein Nathan says, wherein thank you V. 
thank you for your support. I will say um, to people, you can go, go and subscribe to James's channel. Some of the things that we talked about as well, about psychological biases and things, if you want to find out about that, listen to James's um, Science of Everything podcast. He has some episodes on these things, which are really, really good. And I'm also going to promote my own patron. So if you appreciate the work that we do, you can financial. James has a Science of Everything patron as well. And you can, so you can support him there and you can support me by becoming a patron. Um, or you can make a one-off PayPal donation as well. And you can leave thanks on the this video and specifically on YouTube as well. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it for the apologetics industrial complex. I hope that puts some meat on the bone so people can talk about this a bit more in um, the context of these philosoph philosophy of religion discussions. You know, like the, the term, the apologetics industrial complex and how, how it kind of works. And I'll see you all for, I mean, maybe I'll, maybe I'll stream later or something if I'm bored. But in a couple of days, I'm interviewing Daniel Speaks, who's a Christian on the problem of evil. So I guess I'll see you guys then. Hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to like the video before you go and also leave a comment letting me know what you thought. Bye, guys.